Yo Atlas speaking and welcome to part 6 of what if I was reborn in Naruto as a civilian orphan trained and became the wind calamity. The playlist is above and with that being said let the tale begin. Chapter 224 Fujin's eyes widened and a stunned expression could be seen on his face as he saw the hyena's actions. After looking at each other, every hyena nodded and looked at Fujin with a fierce expression. However, at the very next moment, every single hyena escaped in different directions as fast as they could move at the same time. Merely in a couple of seconds, they escaped Fujin's range of sight and soon after they escaped Fujin's chakra field, leaving him standing alone with the remains of a dead hyena. After a few seconds of disbelief, Fujin sighed and muttered, such shameless beasts. Despite what he said, he couldn't help but think that they would have been the perfect summons for him. He looked at the dead hyena and thought, it looks like there are only these sixteen hyenas here. The mountain shouldn't have any more hyenas. Even if they do, considering that I have killed one of them, I don't think I'd be able to sign a contract. He sealed the dead body of the hyena in a scroll while thinking, in my previous life, I recall reading a lot of fantasy books that stated that eating the meat of strong beasts was very helpful for developing a stronger physique and improving aptitude or energy. I wonder if it also applies here. I know eating Karama's meat can provide a lot of benefits. I wonder if the same also applies to summoning animals. It'd be very helpful if my flesh became as sturdy as his and my lightning affinity improved. He made a hand sign and cancelled his jutsu and returned to his basement. He left his house and went to a store from where he had previously bought recipes. The shopkeeper looked at him and politely asked, How can I help you? Fujin asked, Do you have a recipe for cooking hyenas? The old shopkeeper looked at Fujin with a weird expression. Fujin ignored it and asked, Do you? The shopkeeper replied, Wait a few minutes. He began searching through his records and finally found what Fujin was looking for. After searching for the book, he returned and handed it to Fujin and said, Surprisingly, I do have one. It also involves details of how to properly clean it. Fujin thanked the old man and paid for the book before leaving. He cleaned and prepared the hyena's flesh for a few hours before cooking some of it and storing the rest in the fridge. As he ate, he noticed, hmm, there is not much difference in taste as compared with goat meat. Fujin spent the next few days resting and eating the hyena's meat. However, he was disappointed as he didn't notice any change after three days. He thought, what a bummer. I haven't felt any improvement in my physique or the power of my lightning jutsus. I guess only the flesh of tailed beasts will provide benefits. Though it makes sense I suppose. I doubt I am the first one to eat an animal that can use chakra and an element. If it did provide any benefits, this would have been common knowledge and every clan would be procuring such meat to strengthen themselves. I'm sure summoning animals would have already gone extinct by now due to everyone's greed. Having had enough rest, Fujin prepared himself for another attempt to get a summon. He ate a soldier pill and used the summoning jutsu. He disappeared from his basement. Unlike his previous three attempts where Fujin appeared a bit high in the air, this time he felt something around him. He felt a massive pressure on him and his clothes and body got wet instantly. Fujin opened his eyes to see that he was underwater. In front of him was a giant wall or an underwater mountain. Multiple small and colorful fishes were swimming around him. Fujin immediately held his breath and cursed in his mind, shit. He spread his chakra field to see how deep he was in the water. His chakra field spread to its max limit. Fujin's eyes widened in terror as he looked at the wall in front of him. He realized, this isn't a hill. It's a fucking whale. A fucking 200 meter long whale. Despite his chakra field spreading for 1.3 kilometers in all directions, Fujin's chakra field didn't escape the water. Realizing how bad his situation was, he immediately weaved hand signs. As he did, he noticed another giant whale swimming towards him. The small fish that were around Fujin immediately began running away. However, the giant whale opened its mouth and a strong suction force was felt by Fujin. The water, the fish and even Fujin himself were sucked towards the whale's massive mouth. At the last moment, 
Fujin disappeared and returned to his basement. He dropped to his knees and began breathing heavily as water fell from his clothes and body on the floor. After taking a few deep breaths, he sat down and muttered, so freaking scary. He took deep breaths and calmed himself down and analyzed, no wonder so few have summons. If encounters like this one are common, then unless the summoner is a formidable ninja, surviving will be very difficult. If I had appeared there half a minute later, then I'd be sucked into the whale's mouth right when I appeared there. Fujin immediately began doubting himself. He thought, should I still try to get a summon by myself? At the current rate, the risks of trying to get a summon seemed to far outweigh the benefits of getting it. After all, this time I was sent to such depths inside the ocean. What if I am sent inside a volcano or something very poisonous? Fujin began weighing his options. Despite the risks, getting a summon would be incredibly helpful for him. Especially as his chakra kept growing. He wondered, should I instead try to get a summoning contract from existing summoners? But whom? Snakes and toads will be very difficult to get as I have no contact with Jiraiya or any snake summoner. The only two who I know decently well are Renjiro and Haruzen. But Renjiro's sloth isn't very powerful. More importantly, he hasn't given any indication to pass me the summoning contract. As for Haruzen, it is even more unlikely. If I could become Tsunade's student, then I could get her summons. But even that is quite improbable. Not to mention, she won't be in the village for many years. Fujin analyzed his options but didn't find anything promising. He sighed and decided, there is no option. I have to keep trying it until I am successful. However, I have to take more precautions. It'd be a waste of a life if I get attacked as soon as I go there and can't do anything to resist. He began planning how to defend himself properly. After forming a good enough plan, he went to the ninja weapon shop. After searching for a bit, he bought two metallic bracelets, two metal anklets, one metal torque, one metal headband and four flexible bands that were reinforced with metal. He returned home and began inscribing barrier seals on each of the items he bought. When he was satisfied, he created a shadow clone. The clone began equipping the items. He put the bracelets on each of his wrists, just behind the bracers. The anklets went above his ankles while the flexible bands were put on his thighs and biceps. The remaining two went around his neck and forehead. The clone looked at Fujin and nodded. In the next second, Fujin shot a vacuum bullet at the clone. The clone instantly made the confrontation hand seal. A barrier appeared around him. The bullet hit the barrier. The barrier stood sturdy, however, the impact of the bullet sent him backwards for a few meters. Fujin nodded satisfactorily and asked, Did you feel any pain? The clone shook his head and said, No, but if the attack is very strong, then the momentum will be passed on to you. So be prepared for that. Fujin nodded and dispersed the clone. The bands fell on the ground. Fujin put it on and used the summoning jutsu once again. As soon as he appeared in the summoning area, Fujin made the confrontation hand seal. A barrier appeared around him. He immediately followed it up with the hand signs of ending the summoning jutsu and observed his surroundings. If he felt something was wrong, he would return instantly. Fujin watched in confusion as his chakra field spread through the area. The first thing he noticed was the small hill in front of him. The bottom of the hill had an entrance like a cavern entrance. Two imposing, jag protrusions hung in front of him, like menacing fangs, as if daring him to enter. Suddenly, a strong wind was exhaled from the cave entrance on Fujin's barrier pushing him backwards by a few meters. His eyes widened in surprise and shock once again as his chakra field covered the hill in front of him. He couldn't help but gulp his saliva and mutter, This world is freakishly scary. Chapter 225 Fujin nervously observed the beast in front of him while maintaining his hand seal. He was prepared to disappear in the blink of an eye. As he was looking up, an eyelid opened and stared right at Fujin. The beast saw Fujin and thought, I sensed a chakra field engulfing me. Looks like it was this human. The beast observed Fujin and wondered, 
why is he riling up his chakra and maintaining a barrier? He didn't get up and spoke in a rough and jagged voice, a human? We haven't had one visit us in a while. Why are you here, little one? Fujin sighed in relief, finally someone who talks and is reasonable. Though the beast's voice was painful to hear, Fujin didn't mind as he finally could have a conversation with an animal. However, he didn't let his guard down and replied, I am here to sign a summoning contract. The beast observed him and said, I see. But why are you maintaining a barrier? Fujin let out a sigh and answered, I have been using summoning jutsu blindly to find the right summon for me. Unfortunately, I had some very bad experiences. The beast was surprised to hear the reason. Suddenly, he began laughing out loud in amusement. The sound of his laughter echoed through the mountains with a deafening roar, as if a thousand thunderbolts were crashing down upon the earth at once. Sweat gathered on Fujin's forehead as his barrier trembled. He cursed, shit, without the barrier, I might have gone deaf. His excitement about the thought of signing a summoning contract with such a strong beast quelled down as he began worrying about his life instead. After laughing, the beast stood up. Fujin watched in awe as he saw his majestic body. He was a behemoth of a beast, standing at an astonishing height of almost twenty meters tall. His muscles bulged under a coat of thick, matted fur that bristled in the wind. His sharp, powerful claws were the size of long swords, capable of rending through flesh and bone with ease. But it was the beast's jaws that were truly terrifying, gaping open to reveal teeth that were larger than Fujin's whole body. Each tooth was razor-sharp and curved, like a scythe made of ivory. The ground shook beneath its massive paws as it stood up. This was a predator unlike any other, a true apex predator. Fujin gulped once again as he recognized the beast, a saber-tooth. The beast said, Drop your barrier and introduce yourself, little one. Don't worry, I won't eat you. You won't even fit the gap between my teeth. He let out a cackling laughter. Fujin agreed with his analysis. Though his barrier was strong, he had doubts about whether it could withstand an assault from the behemoth in front of him. He deactivated the barrier and stopped maintaining the hand sign and his chakra for escaping back. However, he was still alert and prepared to activate the barrier immediately despite doubting its reliability. He said, I am Suzuki Fujin from Kanaha Dakur. The saber-tooth observed Fujin and said, Good name. It suits you well. I am Ryu, the son of Tatsu. Your strongest affinity is wind nature manipulation, right? Fujin was surprised. He wondered, how did he sense that? Was it just my name or does he have the ability to sense chakra affinity? He nodded and said, yes, it is my strongest affinity. Ryu said, good. Having a strong wind affinity is one of the necessary conditions to be able to sign a contract with us. Fujin thought, lucky me, my other elements are lacking a lot right now. Ryu added, of course, that isn't the only criterion. Climb on my head, I'll carry you to our sage. She will determine whether you can sign a contract or not. Fujin's attention was immediately drawn to the word sage. He thought with excitement, great, they should be able to use Sinjutsu. He nodded and used wind instantaneous body jutsu to appear on top of Ryu's head. Ryu said, hold on tight. Fujin held on tight to his fur as he expected Ryu to run at high speeds. However, Ryu didn't move. Fujin heard some noise behind him and turned his head to check it. The sight he saw left his eyes wide open and jaw hanging. Ryu's fur moved and two gigantic pairs of wings appeared on his back. The wings fully spread displaying the immense wingspan which was easily four times his height. Ryu flapped his wings and the gigantic creature lifted off in the air. Fujin gulped his saliva as he thought, since when did Sabretooth gain wings? As Ryu took off into the sky, Fujin felt a sense of awe and wonder as he looked out at the stunning scenery before him. The mountains stretched out as far as the eye could see, their peaks piercing the clouds above. Below them, a vast forest spread out, with streams and rivers snaking their way through it like veins. For once, Fujin let go of his worries and relaxed. Seeing how strong Ryu was, 
he knew that he didn't need to play tricks to attack Fujin. A childlike curiosity appeared in Fujin's eyes as he took in the breathtaking view, feeling incredibly blessed and content. Though Fujin had traveled in airplanes in his previous life, the feeling was completely different. In fact, it wasn't even comparable. Ryu's wings beat rhythmically, sending a gentle breeze through Fujin's hair and filling his lungs with fresh air. As Ryu climbed higher, Fujin could see the snow-capped summits of the highest peaks in the distance, their peaks wreathed in wispy clouds that glowed pink and orange in the light of the setting sun. The sky above was a riot of colors, from the deep purples and blues of the horizon to the golden hues of the clouds that drifted lazily overhead. It was a scene of such majesty and beauty that Fujin felt humbled and grateful to be alive to witness it. As Ryu cruised through the skies, Fujin felt a sense of complete relaxation and tranquility. Fujin basked in the peacefulness of the moment and lost himself in thoughts as he began reflecting on his life. He recalled his recent troubles before beginning to reflect on his entire journey in this majestic world. He recalled the schemes he employed, the people he killed, the fun he had and the hard work he put in. Soon, he began thinking about his previous life. With the newfound clarity and tranquility, Fujin couldn't help but realize, in my previous life, I always dreamed about having superpowers. I dreamt of going on epic adventures. Now that I have superpowers that I could only dream of in my previous life and have an entire new world to explore, why am I so stressed? A smile appeared on Fujin's face as he closed his eyes. Memories of his past and worries about his future faded away, replaced with a sense of contentment and joy. He felt a deep connection to everything around him as though he was becoming one with the natural world. Fujin entered into a special state. His mind was so calm and stable that he could feel the world's energy around him in this state. He lost all sense of time as he enjoyed the comfort of this energy. Ryu, who was enjoying showing off to Fujin, suddenly focused all attention on him. A look of surprise appeared on his giant face as he thought, what the hell? Ryu sensed that Fujin had entered into a special state. He analyzed, what a surprise. I had sensed that he has a very potent affinity to wind. That is why I decided to bring him to our sacred land. This journey was meant to display my might and relax him a bit from his agitated state but I never imagined that he would be able to connect with nature so easily. Looks like we will have a new summer after 125 years. Ryu didn't want to disturb Fujin and wake him up from the special state he was in. He maintained a constant speed as he headed towards the tallest mountain. As he moved, he thought in relief and excitement, Great-grandmother, it looks like our pride's ability might finally advance once again after 500 years. He quelled his excitement, though it will be a long time before he can learn that skill. His chakra reserves are too poor. Even the quality of his chakra is lacking. We will need to improve it first and only then can he have some hope in learning it. As Ryu kept cruising, he moved above the clouds. In front of him was a mountain peak. Fujin finally opened his eyes. He saw the snow-covered peak and was awed by its beauty. Ryu noticed that Fujin had woken up and said, Welcome to Mount Matiki. Chapter 226 Fujin observed Mount Matiki carefully. He could feel that the chakra around the mountain felt different as compared to Kanoha and other villages. Ryu asked, So, how are you feeling? Fujin replied, I am feeling great. I have never felt better. Ryu said, Of course. What you just experienced was a special state. And the chakra you feel is nature's chakra. I believe you humans also refer to it as Sinjutsu. Fujin was surprised. He thought, that was nature's chakra? He fell into a thought as he realized, no wonder I felt so comfortable and my mood was so tranquil. Ryu noticed that Fujin was in thought and said, you only sense nature's chakra and didn't absorb it. In the future, don't try to absorb nature's chakra or even try to feel it yourself. It can be very dangerous. Especially as you aren't ready to handle it yet. Fuji nodded. He knew how dangerous nature's chakra was. He replied, thanks for the warning. I won't try it without guidance. 
Fujin wanted to ask a few questions, but something caught his eye. He looked ahead to see four saber-tooths flying in the sky while playing around. However, compared to Ryu, they were much smaller with heights in the range of three to four meters. They noticed Ryu and quickly flew towards him. However, their attention soon fell on Fujin as this was the first time they ever saw a human. Fujin too was observing them. They were about to land on Ryu when he said, Run along kiddos. I'll be busy. The four saber-tooths immediately flew away. Ryu said, Don't mind them. You are the first human they saw. So expect a lot of curiosity-filled gazes if you manage to sign the contract. Fujin chuckled, All right. Ryu flew to the very top of the peak. However, instead of a pointy peak, there was a shallow crater surrounded by the rocks. It looked quite similar to the opening of a volcano, except that the crater wasn't very deep and instead of lava, it was covered in snow. Ryu landed in the crater in front of another saber-tooth. This one wasn't as big as Ryu but was still about three-fourths of his size. And it looked a bit older. The saber-tooth noticed Fujin and asked in a gentle voice, Which guest have you brought here, Ryu? Fujin was surprised by her voice. Unlike Ryu, it was much more gentle and pleasing to the ears. Ryu said, This is Fujin. He came here to sign a summoning contract. Fujin, get off and introduce yourself. Fujin nodded and jumped down from his head. He landed between the two saber-tooths. He bowed slightly and respectfully said, I am Suzuki Fujin from Kana Adakur. I used the summoning jutsu to find a summon and appeared in front of Ryu. The saber-tooth observed Fujin carefully. Ryu said, Fujin, she is the leader of our pride. And the sage of Mount Mutiki and all winged saber-tooths. Fujin had already expected it to be so. The sage looked into Ryu's eyes before looking at Fujin and said, Ryu has a habit of being too dramatic. I am Gayu Murasaki. Everyone in this pride is my descendant. Fujin memorized her name. She continued, did Ryu inform you about the conditions of signing a summoning contract with us? Fujin replied, He informed me about needing a strong affinity to win nature. But I don't know about other criteria. Murasaki said, All right. Before I inform you about the criteria, do you have any questions you want answered? Fujin replied, Yes, quite a few. Is it fine to ask them all? Murasaki said, Sure, ask. Fujin asked, When I used the summoning jutsu, why did I arrive so far away from Mount Matiki? Murasaki replied, The summoning jutsu you humans use isn't to find a group of summons but instead a specific summon. In your case, that was Ryu. That is why you appeared in front of him instead of the mountain. Since most summons live in their sacred lands, I believe that you have the misconception that you appear in sacred lands. That information surprised Fujin. He analyzed, I never thought of it that way. But I guess it makes sense. Though I don't remember well, I think Jiraiya did fall in front of Gamabunta who became his main summon. Fujin looked at Murasaki and asked the most important question, Can you teach me Sinjutsu? Murasaki didn't answer and instead stared at Fujin for a minute. She finally said, This question is a bit complicated to answer. Fujin furrowed his eyebrows and asked, what do you mean? Murasaki replied, We do have the ability to harness and use nature's energy. However, this technique is only for us winged saber-tooths. A human can't learn it. Fujin thought even toad sage mode was a technique for toads. But humans could still learn it. Why can't their method be learned? Murasaki broke Fujin's thoughts by saying, This is one of the criteria for accepting a summoner. We only accept summoners who we believe could learn Senjutsu. Though you won't be able to use our technique, we will use it as a reference to help you learn Senjutsu. Fujin was confused. He couldn't help but ask, Why? Murasaki replied, You human body can't handle our methods. Fujin said, No, not that. Why would you go through so much effort to make a summoner learn Senjutsu? Murasaki stayed silent for a few seconds before saying, I can't tell you the reason but it has become a tradition here. However, 
I can't give you any sureties in learning Sinjutsu. After all, in the past 500 years, we have trained many humans. Unfortunately, no one managed to learn Sinjutsu. Fujin became silent on hearing it and fell into thought. He was very conflicted. He sighed in his mind, what a mess. Looks like learning Sinjutsu from here will be very difficult. Murasaki and Ryu noticed Fujin thinking and didn't disturb him. Fujin analyzed and reached the conclusion, I guess this isn't bad though. Other than the Toads teaching Jiraiya, Minato and Naruto Sinjutsu, I am not sure if any other summons teach Sinjutsu. Though Kabuto did get it, I don't recall exactly how he convinced the snakes to teach him. And Hashirama's sage mode didn't have any explanation. So if these guys are serious about training me to learn Sinjutsu, that will probably be my best chance. Of course, their help is definitely not unconditional or selfless. I am sure they have their own goals for wanting to train their summoners to use Sinjutsu. Besides, using summoning Jutsu blindly is too risky. I'd have to sign a contract even if they didn't know Sinjutsu. Fujin said, All right, I will be in your care. However, I have one more question. Am I allowed to sign more summoning contracts? This time Fujin heard Ryu's jagged voice from behind and he sounded offended, Kid, why do you want to sign other contracts when you have us? Fujin looked back and calmly said, When I learn about the summoning jutsu, I plan to sign at least three summoning contracts. One for fighting on land, one for fighting in the air and one for scouting and spying. But, since you have the ability to fly, I don't need to find another summon to fly. Of course, it was just some plans I made when I was a kid. If you have conditions of not signing other contracts, then I won't. Ryu calmed down on hearing Fujin's answer. He replied with a deadpan tone, You are still just a kid. His reply made Fujin feel awkward. Murasaki answered, I don't care if you sign other summoning contracts. But you can't sign a contract with a group that can use nature chakra. Even if you tried to sign one, they won't agree if you have already signed a summoning contract with us. Also, though your plan seems good, don't try it until your strength grows considerably. With your current strength, there are many summons that can kill you with ease. So it will be pointless and risky. Fuji nodded. He didn't need to be told again how risky it was as his memories were still very fresh. Miraski continued, instead of trying to form another summoning contract, I would recommend raising wild animals and signing them as your contract. That way you won't be under any restrictions and can raise them to do what you want. Fujin was intrigued by the idea. He thought, I never thought of this option. But, to be honest, raising animals will be a lot of work. Especially when I am out on missions. However, I do have a lot of space around my home and I have a lot of money that I don't have any use for. I need to see if I can employ someone to do the work for me. Fujin looked at Murasaki and said, That's all the questions I had, Lady Murasaki. Ryu watched awkwardly at Fujin as he called her a lady. He wondered, This lady is over 800 years old. I wonder when was the last time anyone called her lady. Murasaki said, You can call me Granny. As for your criteria for signing a contract, there are just two. She looked at Ryu and said, The one in front of whom you appear should agree to accept you as a summoner. She looked back at Fujin and said, And you should show talent to be able to learn Sinjutsu in the future. Fujin thought, as I thought. They gained something from teaching me Sinjutsu. Ryu said, I agree. And Fujin has passed the second criterion as well. Fujin looked at Ryu in surprise. Ryu said, the flight to this place was a test to see how in tune you can become with nature. My goal is to calm you down and make you experience peace and tranquility by showing you that scenery. As you manage to sense nature chakra, you have passed the criteria. Fujin was left speechless. He thought, first I needed a good wind affinity. And then I needed to feel nature's chakra which I coincidentally managed to do. I guess good luck does follow bad luck. Fujin replied with a smile, that's great. When do we sign the contract? Chapter 227, Fujin signed the contract right away with his blood. 
Ryu carried him away from the peak and flew down the mountain. As they were flying, Fujin asked, Ryu, are there others like you guys who can use Senjutsu but can't pass it on to humans? Ryu replied, of course, there are numerous. The number of species that can use Senjutsu is at least a couple of dozen. And there are numerous wild beasts who manage to learn it on their own. Some of them are very wild and dangerous. Even I wouldn't want to face them in a single combat. Fujin was surprised to learn that. After all, he didn't see any such creature make a move during the Fourth Great Ninja War. But soon he realized, now that I think about it, none of the summons made any major moves during that war. The Toads had a larger participation in the fight against Pain rather than against Abito and Madara. Weird considering that they were endangered during the latter rather than the former. Ryu continued, as far as I am aware, only the places you humans consider as the three sacred places have techniques to pass down their methods of harnessing nature energy to humans. Others don't have them or are not interested in passing them down. A giant cave appeared before them. Ryu stepped into the cave and roared loudly. Surprisingly, his roar had no effect on Fujin. Fujin was impressed. What control over his voice? Fujin got off Ryu's head. Ryu looked at him and said seriously, though we don't have any specified rules, there are a few things you have to follow. Fujin nodded. Ryu said, first, none of the winged saber tooths you summon should die. While we will give our all to help you, we will undo the summoning and return if we face extreme danger and think death is inevitable. This is especially true for the young ones who still need to grow. After escaping, we will use reverse summoning jutsu to save you unless you specifically ask us not to. Fujin nodded and said, that is reasonable. I have no issues with that. Fujin's main priority was always his own safety. So it was perfectly understandable for him when others have similar priorities. Ryu said, another thing, though you can summon me, don't try it until your chakra reserves get much larger. You will need to have at least five times the chakra you currently have to summon me safely. In the meantime, Ryu gazed outside the cave. Fujin followed his gaze and saw three winged saber tooths flying towards them. They entered the cave as Ryu completed his sentence, in the meantime, you can summon my sons. Ryu looked at them and said, this is Fujin. He has become the new summoner of our pride. Introduce yourself. The three winged saber tooths stared at Fujin. Though they were smaller than Ryu, they were much bigger than Fujin. The smallest one was almost twice as tall as Fujin, while the largest one was half the size of Ryu. The biggest one said, I am Kurigane. You can summon me when you are in an intense fight. He observed Fujin and said, Though I would recommend at least doubling your chakra before trying to summon me. The second one said, I am Kaido. I like going on adventures and flying for a long time. You can summon me when you want to travel long distances. The smallest one said, I am Goro. Feel free to summon me whenever you want to. Fujin nodded and slightly bowed and said, I will be in your care. Goro said with a smirk, Don't worry, I like to protect the ones weaker than me. He immediately ran away after saying that as his two brothers stared at him in annoyance. Ryu sighed as Kurigane explained, he is quite mischievous. You will have to get used to him. Fujin said, it's fine. Kurigane and Kaido also left. Ryu said, everyone here is an expert in using wind attacks. The nature energy we use amplifies it even further. You can later try to create combination attacks with them. If you aren't compatible with them, you can even summon others from the pride. Fujin nodded and said, all right. Ryu stared at Fujin and said, Now, time to discuss the important matter. Fujin looked into Ryu's eyes. He could feel that Ryu was trying to look into every secret he had. Ryu said, I was initially not sure about accepting you and wanted to leave the decision to Granny. I changed my mind after sensing how in tune with nature you became. The reason I was doubtful is that your potential isn't very high. Fujin furrowed his eyebrows and asked, What do you mean? Ryu said, From what I can see, your body and chakras should be stronger than most humans that are your age. However, you have only managed to do so with extreme hard work. 
Isn't that right? Fujin was uncomfortable at how easily Ryu gained information regarding his chakra and abilities. Fujin nodded, that is true. Ryu said, every being has a limit to which they can grow. For some, it is higher, while for others it is much lower. What you have done through intense training is bring forth all your potential in order to gain power quickly. Due to this, you will soon reach your limit and your chakra reserves will stop increasing. In fact, the speed of the growth of your chakra reserves should have already slowed. Fujin frowned. He thought, I have monitored my chakra ever since I became a sensor. My chakra grew by two to three times every year during the last two years in the academy. And it exploded under Rinjiro's training due to Senju Taijutsu style training and grew by about 4.5 times in a year. Though I noticed that my chakra growth has slowed and it will grow by less than two times this year, I speculated that it was just due to no longer having any gains from training Senju Taijutsu style. If his words are right, doesn't it mean that my growth will drastically slow down? Ryu guessed Fujin's thoughts and said, You don't need to worry about this. After all, you can't control your potential and limits. Fujin argued, But can't we exceed our limits and grow beyond them? In the fourth great ninja war, the strongest ninja was probably the one with the least potential. So though Fujin didn't like what Ryu said, he wasn't discouraged as Guy's example was in front of him. Ryu was impressed by Fujin's reply. He thought, Many will be demotivated on learning that their progress will be halted and might deny that their potential is limited. But he directly thought about breaking through the limits. Ryu replied, It's true, it can be surpassed. However, you will just reach your new limits and stop there unless you can keep breaking your limits. Just breaking limits is rare. But to break it consecutively is almost impossible. Of course, there are still beings who have managed to do it and become immensely powerful, but they are very rare. Anyways, we are getting off topic. We can discuss this later when you reach it. What I wanted to say is that your chakra growth will slow down in a couple of years. And when the growth becomes too slow, you will come here and receive my training. Fujin thought, I see. He wasn't trying to demotivate me. Fujin asked in a confused tone, why do we have to wait till then? Ryu answered, because your current chakra isn't strong enough. The techniques I plan on teaching you are very chakra intensive and will put an intense strain on your physique. So you will need at least three to four times your current chakra and a much stronger physique before I can safely teach you. That is why I will not be training you right now. As for the limit that I mentioned, you don't need to worry much about it. Though your potential isn't very high, your wind affinity is very potent. And we have methods and the resources to make it even stronger. As for chakra reserves, though it is difficult, even they can be artificially boosted. However, it is very troublesome to do so and the methods that we have are more effective on someone whose growth has come to a halt. In addition, there are various restrictions and limits on those methods, but we will talk about it when you reach the limit. Of course, if you manage to keep breaking past your limits, then I can begin your training after you reach the necessary levels of chakra reserves and physique. Fujin consumed all the information Ryu just stated. He was beyond surprised. He analyzed, he can do that. Increasing wind affinity is understandable if they have access to wind elemental crystals. But how can they increase chakra reserves? At the same time, his mood became a bit grim, since they are willing to invest so many resources into me, what exactly do they gain from training me in Sinjutsu? Fujin didn't let his mood reflect on his face. Instead, he showed an excited expression and said, All right, that sounds great. Thanks a lot in advance, Ryu. Ryu said, That is all for now. Return to your place and don't attempt to sense nature chakra without my presence. Fujin replied, don't worry. I won't risk my life pointlessly. Ryu nodded. Fujin weaved hand signs and returned to his basement. He looked around himself and let out a sigh, finally. I don't need to experience any more crazy situations like those. Fujin was very happy with the summon he signed. However, a thought appeared in his mind, should I keep my summon a secret? Chapter 228 
Fujin analyzed the pros and cons of keeping his summon a secret. Finally, he decided, the winged Sabertooths will be my main summon. There isn't much point in keeping them a secret as it will get out eventually. Of course, I should keep this card hidden until I can but there is no need to keep it hidden from the ones I can trust. Instead, I should probably take the initiative to mention this to Haruzen. While it is good news that they want to teach me Sinjutsu, they definitely have some ulterior motives. Though my gut tells me that their ultimate motives won't be harmful to me and even if it is, they won't do anything to me until I learn Sinjutsu, it would be better to get some information from Haruzen. If it is harmful, then he could warn me and help me terminate the contract or help me scheme against them. If it is beneficial, then Haruzen might look more favorably towards me as these Sabertooths are quite strong and could increase Kanoha's strength considerably. Also, I could use Ryu's dialogue and add some false news to maybe get a few elemental crystals from Haruzen. For instance, instead of telling him about their methods and resources to strengthen me, I could tell him that they will teach me Sinjutsu only if I reach the required strength. Fujin made a few plans until he was satisfied and went to sleep after eating dinner. Meanwhile, at the peak of Mount Mutiki, Ryu appeared in front of Murasaki. Murasaki looked at him and said, I am surprised that you agreed so readily. Is the boy that impressive? Ryu replied, You didn't see him connect to nature, great-grandmother. It was almost instinctual to him. He didn't even need fifteen minutes to sense nature energy and managed to maintain that state for two hours. I had to keep flying around the mountain for over an hour to not disturb him. Among the summoners we contracted in the last four hundred years, he is our best shot. Murasaki sighed and asked, Are you still hoping that the prophecy your grandfather had comes true? Ryu didn't answer her question and instead said, Five hundred years ago, you mastered nature energy and helped our pride advance to the next level. However, we haven't made any progress since then. Grandfather and Grand Uncle Genji believe that we will advance to the next level with the help of a human who could learn our Sinjutsu. I'd rather believe it instead of wasting away hundreds of years pointlessly. Murasaki looked at Ryu, however, he didn't budge. She sighed and said, Do whatever you want. Ryu nodded and left. Murasaki saw him leading the mountain as her memory surfaced, for children, seven grandchildren and nineteen great-grandchildren of mine have died as a result of that prophecy. Some sacrificed themselves to protect the human they chose while some were killed by the betrayal of the very human they raised and one ingrate even invaded our sacred lands. I hope you don't join them, Ryu. She closed her eyes and went back to meditating. A very strong chakra could be seen around her. A chakra that brightened the peak of Mount Matiki and would have been visible from a long distance if the peak wasn't hidden above the clouds. A slash in, would love to hear your thoughts and ideas on a power beyond Sinjutsu. But don't involve anything related to tailed beasts or Atsutsuki. The next day, Fujin was standing outside a building. It was Kanoha's hospital. He entered it and approached the lady sitting in the reception. She looked at Fujin and greeted him with a smile, Fujin Kuen, who are you here to visit? Or are you injured? Fujin smiled back at her. He had been a rather common face in the hospital. He especially became well known when Renjiro brought his injured and unconscious body to the hospital on his shoulder multiple times in a single month. He replied, I am fine and haven't come to visit anyone on Kami San. I have come here to register for medical ninja training. Akemi was surprised. She asked, You want to become a medical ninja? Fujim replied, No, I just want to learn the basic healing jutsu so that I can help my teammates if we don't have a medical ninja with us. Akemi replied, Oh. All right. Wait a minute. Akemi wasn't surprised by Fujim's request. Quite a few ninjas would show up for learning the mystical palm jutsu without bothering to learn the remaining knowledge needed to become a medical ninja. Kanoha had a system in place for ninjas like these. Though they would prefer for more ninjas to become a proper and capable medical ninja, very few had the interest, talent and patience to become one. After all, it would require years or even a decade to become a good medical ninja. So Haruzen, with Tsunade's assistance, had created a proper plan to teach such ninjas. 
A lot of clans and civilian ninjas benefited immensely from this program. The former Uchiha clan had benefited the most from this system. Their Sharingans could easily copy the mystical palm jutsu. They just needed some guidance to master that jutsu and could provide a better healing option on the front lines where medical ninjas wouldn't be available. Similarly, the Hyuga clan also benefited from this system. Their Byakugan and fine chakra control assisted in being much superior to others who learned this jutsu. So some Hyugas learned this jutsu and became the perfect support for any squad with their scouting and healing capabilities while being perfectly capable of defending themselves. Akemi opened a file and wrote Fujin's name in a list that already had 23 other names. She said, a training session for newbies will be held three days from now at noon. I have registered you. So just show up and join the class. Fujin noted the date and thanked her, thank you, Akemi-san. Fujin left the hospital thinking, three days. Should I train a jutsu or should I train with summons? Suddenly he heard, Fujin. Fujin turned to his right. Hataki Takao walked towards him and asked, Where were you yesterday evening? We tried finding you without any success. Fujin replied, I was doing some special training. Anyways, what's up? Takao looked at Fujin but didn't get any clues from him. He said, Well, it's good that you are safe. Lord Hokage wants to meet you. So meet him right away. Fujin nodded and said, All right. Thank you for passing the message. Fujin flickered towards the Hokage building. He entered and knocked on the door. Hiruzen invited him. Fujin entered and said, I met Takao san outside the hospital. He said you wanted to meet me, Grandpa. Hiruzen looked at him and asked, Hospital? Are you injured? Fujin shook his head and answered, No. I am planning to learn mystical palm jutsu. So I went to register myself. He put up a sad expression and said, If a mission goes bad, I want to have the capability of at least healing my teammates a bit. Hiruza knew that Fujin was referring to his previous mission indirectly as he couldn't say it out loud. He couldn't heal any injuries on Tamatsu for hours. His features softened. He said, I sent a couple of messengers to you last evening, but they couldn't find you. I was worried that someone tried to claim your bounty. Fujin furrowed his brows and asked, Didn't you say that there is no danger in Konoha and that no one has ever claimed a bounty before? Hiruzen coughed and said, I did. But there can always be a first time. Fujin watched Hiruzen with a deadpan expression. He thought, This old fox is unbelievable. Hiruzen changed the subject and asked, Anyways, where were you? Fujin replied, I was trying to find a summon. Hiruzen's eyes widened. He immediately scolded, Why did you try it on your own? That is very dangerous. Fujin nodded and said, Yeah. You don't need to tell me, Grandpa. It was very scary. I had to face a wolf tide and even saw gigantic whales. Hiruzen squinted his eyes and asked, You tried it more than once? Fujin nodded and said, Yeah. It was so scary that I wanted to stop. But I couldn't help but think about your words and my teammates and kept going until I succeeded. Hiruzen's features softened. He thought, though it was risky and he is usually greedy, the will of fire burns bright in him. As long as he can grow safely for two to three more years, he can fulfill the gap left by Tamatsu's squad by himself. Hiruzen said, it's good that you managed to get it done. Who did you sign the contract with? Fujin answered, they are winged saber-tooths. Have you heard about them, Grandpa? Hiruzen thought for a bit before shaking his head. He replied, I haven't heard about anyone having these summons. How do they look and how strong are they? Fujin replied, they look like a normal saber-tooth, only many times larger. Their wings are hidden along their fur, so they are hard to spot normally. They can fly very well. As for their strength, they are very strong. The one I met could have probably defeated me with ease. Though I can't say for sure as I never fought. Hiruzen analyzed, I don't recall seeing any such summons or even reading about them. I guess it must be a tribe that rarely signs contracts. 
From what Fujin described, their strongest fighters should be at a league Jiaonan level or just stronger than that which is quite good but nothing exceptional. He looked at Fujin and concluded, oh well, Renjiro wasn't planning to hand him his sloth summon. Since he managed to get a contract with his own strength, I can't complain. If he passes the contract to the next generation, then Fujin would have contributed a lot to the village. He said, I don't know anything about them, Fujin. But good work. Chapter 229 Hiruzen lifted a couple of boxes from under his desk and placed them on his desk and said, This arrived yesterday evening. I called you as I believed that you would want it right away. Fujin observed the boxes. His attention was immediately drawn to their ornate designs. Their lids were carved with intricate patterns of dragons and tigers. And it was made from a wood that had an ancient feeling to it. Fujin realized and quickly exclaimed, My swords are here? Hiruza nodded and said, Fuji arrived here from the land of iron yesterday. A slash in, Fujin and Hiruza met Furutani Fuji in chapter 111. Fujin moved forward and lifted one of the lids to see a soft, plush lining that cradled his sword. He grabbed the sheath and picked up his sword. The sheath was an art in itself. Swirling designs were etched into its glossy black lacquer. As Fujin ran his fingers along the sheath, he felt the satisfying smoothness of the fine craftsmanship. Finally, he drew out the sword. The blade was long and thin with a very slight curve to it. Both its edges were very sharp. When the light fell on it, it shimmered with a greenish hue that caught Fujin's eye. The hilt was made of polished green jade that fit comfortably in Fujin's hands. Fujin moved the sword around. It felt very light and almost as if it was an extension of his arm. A smile appeared on his face as chakra began flowing along the blade. He muttered, The chakra flow along this blade is so smooth. Fujin's chakra flowed through the blade without any obstruction. It was charged with wind chakra almost instantaneously. Fujin had no doubts that if he swung his sword, the entire Hokage building would collapse. Hiruzen smiled and said, The sword has some chakra metal that assists in wind chakra flow. Very few will be able to stop your sword in the future. Of course, do be careful about them. The swords are very expensive and could get some unwanted attention. Fujin replied, if they are greedy, they might try to get my head first. But I will keep it in mind, Grandpa. Fujin immediately began checking his other sword leaving Hiruzen a bit awkward as he recalled that Fujin's head was worth more than those swords. The second sword was just as good as the first one. Fujin kept his sword back in the sheaths. Hiruzen instructed, keep the sheaths and boxes properly. The blacksmiths attach a lot of importance to making them so destroying them or throwing them away is seen as an insult by them. Also, the sheath is made of special materials which help preserve the chakra metal properties in the sword. So when you don't use them, keep them in their sheaths. Fujin replied, I didn't know about that. But seeing how well the sheath and the box are made, I guess it makes sense. I'll store them properly. Hiruzen smiled and said, That is all. There is still some time before I invite you to Umbu. Use it to master mystical palm and create a bond and develop teamwork with your summons. Fujin nodded and left the room. He thought, I guess Ri wasn't kidding when he said that the younger ones hadn't ever seen a human. It should have been a long time since they had a summoner. Kinda sucks. I was hoping that Hiruza knew how impressive they were and used that fact to get some wind crystals. Anyways, since he doesn't know, I doubt he could warn me about their plans. On the plus side, I will be able to keep my sage training a secret. If I do master it, my strength will grow phenomenally. And since there is no way to sense it unless I use it, it will become my strongest ace in the hole. A smile formed on his face as he wondered who would fall prey to this hidden card. Of course, that would be a long time away and would need a lot of hard work and perhaps some luck to achieve. Fujin returned home. Two symbols glowed on his bracers and his old swords appeared. Fujin calculated, Hiruzen asked me to keep the new swords in their sheaths. I will have to modify the storage seal so that my new swords fit. That isn't an issue. 
The problem is that I have to store them with their sheaths. So when I summon the sword, I will get the sword with the sheath instead of just the sword. And while that may look cool, it will be very inefficient. So what to do? Fujin analyzed a lot and began recalling all the seals he had learned. After a few minutes, he prepared a plan that would allow him to store the swords in the sheaths but summon just the swords. However, before he could work on it, he had an idea. Fujin thought, wait a minute. Though Ambu ninjas wear a mask to hide their identity, I doubt that it would be a hundred percent effective. After all, every ninja has unique features. Someone like Kakashi is very easy to identify despite his Umbu mask. So it's safe to assume that every village will try to keep information about the Umbu ninjas of enemy villages. If that is the case, then I should give them something to identify me with myself instead of them figuring out something I can't change and don't know. A mischievous smile appeared on Fujin's face as he thought of a plan to mess with the minds of the ones that might want to target him in the future. He stored the new swords in a scroll and kept the old swords back in his bracers. He left his house and went to the training ground. He bit his thumb and weaved a few hand signs and slammed his right palm on the ground. Summoning Jutsu Smoke appeared in front of Fujin. In the smoke, the silhouette of a three-meter-tall saber-tooth was visible. Meanwhile, Fujin's breath became heavy. He was alarmed, damn. A single summoning jutsu exhausted more than 40% of my chakra. The smoke dispersed showing Goro. He looked at Fujin and exclaimed in joy, I knew it. I knew it. I dared my brothers to make a bet with me that you would summon me first. They didn't even dare to accept my bet. Ha 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 ha. Fujin watched with a deadpan expression. He sighed in his mind, looks like this jutsu is a waste until I can summon his brothers. Goro asked, so, why did you summon me? Tell me whose ass you want to be bitten. You can rely on me 100%. Fujin replied, sure I can. But I am not facing any enemy. I just want to see how a great winged saber tooth like you fights. And I want to build good teamwork between us. Goro answered with a bit less excitement in his voice, oh, that sounds boring. But since you can see how great I am, I will show you. Fujin said, I am not sure how much we can fly here. Can you summon me to your mountain? We can experiment there. Goro nodded, all right, all right, I will see you in a minute. He disappeared. Fujin sighed, did he fall on his head as a child or did Ryu spoil him rotten for him to develop such a personality? I hope he fights well. Otherwise, it'd be completely hopeless. Fujin suddenly disappeared from the training ground and appeared at Mount Matiki in front of Goro. Fujin's sudden appearance was noticed by a few winged saber-tooths but they ignored him. Goro asked, So, what do you want to see first? Fujin looked around him. He was in a small cave with just Goro. He said, I want to see how a winged saber-tooth fights. Then, I can see how we can work together. Goro said, All right, climb on my back. Fujin climbed on his back. Goro said, hold tight. He spread his wings and jumped out of the cave. He flapped his wings a few times and began flying at a very fast speed. Chakra gathered in Fujin's eyes to keep them safe from the strong winds. Goro said with pride, the first thing you should know about us is that we fly very fast. Even most of the birds can't keep up with us. That is especially true for Kaido. He loves flying. He can fly as fast as lightning and can keep that speed up for days. Fujin was surprised. He analyzed, speed of lightning is unrealistic. But if I assume that he flies twice as fast as Goro and can maintain that speed for hours, then he would be a very good aid in escaping. Chapter 230, Goro moved towards a boulder on the huge mountain. He said, this should be a no-brainer, but we also have very high strength. He raised his paw and brought it down on the boulder with a lot of force. His paw split the boulder into two and turned a lot of it into dust. Fujin wasn't surprised. He expected such physical prowess from them. Goro said, See, see. How I turned it into dust with a wave of my paw. That's how strong I am. 
Fujim replied, yeah, that is very strong. I wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of it. Goro laughed, of course, you wouldn't. I could bite that stone too, but I don't want dust and soil in my mouth. Fujin said, it's fine. I can guess what a bite from you can do. Show me your other skills. Goro said, cool. He flapped his wings and moved away from the mountain and said, watch. This is the skill that makes us the apex predators. Goro's body suddenly became still. Chakra gathered on his wings. Fujin sensed it and was surprised, nature chakra. Even the younger ones can use senjutsu? Goro flapped his wings again. This time, he didn't move. Instead, very strong winds flew downwards. Fujin was surprised. He analyzed, that attack is stronger than my supercharged infinite breakthrough. And at least a few times stronger. Goro chuckled, are you shocked? You are shocked, right? If I use this attack on animals on land, all of them will die. Even if they survive, they will be injured. And even if they are strong enough to resist, I can just fly away. Ha 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 ha. If anyone else heard Goro's words, they might feel contempt for his attitude. However, Fujin wasn't one of them. He agreed with Goro's strategy wholeheartedly. In Fujin's books, other than winning a war without fighting, the best way to fight was to maintain distance and keep attacking the enemy without allowing the enemy to attack back. And if the enemy is stronger? He can always run away and turn the fight into a game of tag. It was why Fujin learned so many jutsus that allowed him to hide and escape. Fujin thought, looks like I was hasty. He is good. Goro said, in addition, we can also do this. He began gathering chakra in his throat. He looked up and fired a beam made of wind. The beam hit the cloud and created a huge hole in it. Fujin observed the wind beam carefully. His eyes widened as he noticed how the beam worked. He couldn't help but mutter, incredible. Goro was surprised. He looked back at Fujin and asked, did you understand what happened? Fujin looked at Goro. He realized that Goro's breath had gotten heavier. He thought, it seems like the attack uses a lot of chakra. Fujin nodded, yeah. Though it seemed like a normal beam of wind, it is instead made of incredibly sharp winds. The inside of the beam is basically like a meat grinder. If anyone were to be hit by it, I doubt any flesh would be left on their bones. Goro exclaimed, Wow! Father wasn't kidding when he said that your affinity to wind is very strong. And you are right. This is my most devastating attack. It is also the signature attack of our pride. We call it the wind breath or the breath of wind. The only way to survive it is if the opponent has a very tough body that can't be cut with my winds. But I haven't met any such opponents yet, ha ha ha. Even if someone has tough skin, they still have vulnerable parts like eyes, nose and ears. Fujin wondered, will I be able to withstand the attack with iron skin? I should test it later with my clones. Regardless, this attack is very dangerous. If I can learn it, I can use it like a cheap version of dust release. I can recall very few ninjas who could defend against this attack. Goro interrupted Fujin's thoughts and said, in addition, we also have some other moves. Like, he gathered chakra into his throat again and launched a ball of wind into the clouds. The attack left a small hole in the clouds. Fujin noticed, it is very similar to my vacuum cannon except for the fact that there is no vacuum core. However, its destructive power won't be much weaker than my vacuum cannon due to the amount of chakra he put into it. Goro said, this is our air bullet. We use it against weaker opponents as it doesn't need much chakra. Fujin said, that is still quite powerful. What else do you have? Goro answered, well, this is most of our traditional moves. Our fights usually involve us attacking with these attacks from a distance or using our strong bodies to crush our enemies. Some in the pride do make some of their personal moves or master another element, but I am still too young to learn them. Fujin quickly asked, I see. How old are you? Fujin was very interested in knowing the answer. 
After all, animals and humans had quite different growth stages and lifespans. Goro answered in a smug voice, I am one of the youngest in my pride and still one of the most reliable and strongest. I am only 39 years old. Fujin was stunned. He thought in disbelief, he is 39 years old. From the way he talked, I assumed he was 39 months old. Goro noticed that Fujin was speechless. He looked back and asked, You can't believe how young I am, right? Seeing my strength, I bet you thought I am some 300 years old monster, right? Ha ha ha. Fujin was left speechless. Though he had been very polite so far and praised Goro a few times to fan his ego so that he could get along better, he wasn't sure what he could say without being insulting. Luckily, Goro changed the subject. Now that you have seen what I can do, what ideas did you come up with for cooperation and teamwork? Fujin became serious and said, I haven't thought of much. Like you, I also specialize in wind manipulation. The only idea I had so far is launching my attacks at the same time as you to double our power or launching them alternatingly to double our attack frequency. Goro looked at Fujin suspiciously and asked, Do you think that your wind attacks are as strong as mine? Fujin replied, Your wind breath is stronger than anything I can do right now. But others, I can amplify with my own attacks. For instance, Fujin built up around 15% of his chakra and looked above. Wind Release, Infinite Breakthrough Jutsu He released the supercharged jutsu at the clouds above them. Goro observed and commented, Wow! That was good. Not as strong as mine, but good nonetheless. Fujin didn't answer and used another jutsu. Wind Release, Air Bullet Jutsu He fired 15 air bullets. Goro said, not bad. They are much smaller in size, but the quantity is go. His eyes suddenly went wide open in shock. Fujin swung his sword and released a sword wave that split the clouds into two for over a hundred meters. Goro exclaimed, That was fucking good. You are strong. Fujin said, I also have techniques to pierce into the strongest armor. So in case we encounter someone on whom your wind breath doesn't work, I could create openings in their defenses and let you kill them with ease. But, though it seems strong, a combination of two wind users won't be very good. I will learn a few fire attacks so that we could use a fire-wind combination attack. Goro said, I agree. Not to mention, your chakra reserves took a big hit when you summoned me. That said, I am not sure how good a fire-wind combination attack will be. Fujin replied, it'll be awesome. I have already tried it with others who can spit fire. But yeah, you are right. Summoning you consumed more than 40% of my chakra. If I summon you in a fight, I'll have very little chakra left. So you will have to do the majority of the fighting. Goro grinned and said, As I said earlier, don't worry about it and leave everything to me. Ha ha ha. Fujin sighed at his eccentricities but didn't say anything. After all, it was a good thing that Goro was willing to fight for him and that he seemed to be a very competent fighter. Fujin thought, though Ryu said that my chakra growth will slow down, it is still growing at a considerable rate. In a year, it should grow sufficiently to at least make summoning Goro easier on my chakra reserves. Fujin and Goro tried a few combination attacks until Fujin ran out of chakra. Goro ended his reverse summoning and Fujin returned back to Konoha. Chapter 231 For the next couple of days, Fujin trained with Goro on Mount Matiki to improve their coordination. They first tried their moves on nearby mountains. When they got comfortable, they found nearby animals that Goro used to fight and began hunting. Finally, the day for training mystical palm jutsu arrived. Fujin did his morning workout rituals and visited the hospital at noon. After asking, he entered the room where he would be taught. As soon as he did, thirty-three pairs of eyes landed on him. Fujin looked around. The room was very spacious. It had a huge blackboard on the opposite side of the entry door. It also had a long but thin indoor pool in the shape of an arc and curved tables lined up along its edge. A few fish swam in it. Fujin observed the other people in the room. He didn't recognize any of them. 
but a few of them recognized Fujin as they had seen him during the Chunin exams. However, before they could say anything, a bald guy entered the room and instructed loudly, Take your seats, everyone. We don't have any time to waste. Fujin and the others who were standing took a seat while observing the instructor. He was completely bald and looked quite old. Two girls in their late teens entered the room and stood behind the instructor. The instructor walked to the front of the room and began writing on the blackboard. He said, I am Yamanaka Yoshi. I will be teaching you the basics of mystical palm jutsu and guiding you until I am sure that you can perform it. The girls standing behind you are Hyuga Emi and Karama Asaka. They are training to become medical ninjas and they will be monitoring your progress and clearing your doubts. He looked around the room and muttered, Just thirty-four are here. Looks like two didn't show up. He passed a sheet in the room and said, Write your names on it. I will need it to keep track of your progress. He moved back to the blackboard and said, I will first explain to you the theory behind mystical palm jutsu. I will also tell you the advantages and disadvantages of it and tell you when to use it and when not to use it. Pay careful attention because if you use it when you shouldn't, you can kill your patient or force real medical means to amputate them. His words made everyone in the room serious. Most of them were here because they wanted to help their teammates or themselves in case of a major injury. So worsening an injury was the last thing they would want to happen. For the next couple of hours, Yoshi kept giving his lecture. He also cleared any doubts anyone had. Fujin paid careful attention and took some notes down alongside others in the room. When he stopped, the room sighed in relief. None of the people here were as young as Fujin. It had been years since they had to sit in the academy and hear lectures. Yoshi said, Now that I have explained everything to you and cleared your doubts, we will begin hands-on training. But before we begin, we will be splitting the room into two. As I had said earlier, mystical palm requires very precise chakra control. So the ones who are confident in their chakra control walk towards the tables. The others keep sitting where you are. Fujin was very confident in his chakra control. He got up and moved towards the tables. So did eleven other people. The two assistants also moved next to Yoshi. Hyuga Emi was holding a rather thick scroll. She laid it on the table and opened it a bit until a seal could be seen in the scroll. Yoshi walked in front of it and made a hand sign. A fish popped up in the seal. He said, this storage scroll has 100 storage seals with 100 injured fishes in it. We will be using them to test your jutsu. He extended his right hand towards the fish. Green chakra appeared on his hand and began pouring into the fish. For the next 30 seconds, the fish didn't make any movements and kept laying as if it was dead. However, it soon began making small movements. In a minute, it jumped off the scroll and landed in the pool. Yoshi said with a smile, this is how you do it. No one in the room was surprised. After all, everyone had seen medical ninjas in action. Yoshi said, though this looks simple, it will take a long time for you to learn this. You first need to develop good chakra control and you will need four to six months after that to be able to heal the fish as I did. You will require another six months of training to be able to use this jutsu safely on ninjas. His words surprised everyone in the room. Fujin thought, almost one year for just mastering this basic jutsu? He couldn't help but mutter in his mind, it's just using our chakra to increase the body's natural healing. How tough can it be? Yoshi noticed the looks of skepticism on most of the trainees. However, he wasn't surprised. He scoffed in his mind, it's the same every month. They think that it is an easy jutsu that they will learn in a few days. Half of them won't even have the patience to dedicate enough time to this jutsu to master it. He looked at the twelve who had claimed that they had good chakra control and said, You try it first. Be careful about the amount of chakra you use. Hyuga Emi and Karama Asaka rolled the scroll until twelve seals were visible and summoned twelve fishes. Fujin and the rest stepped forward. Fujin observed his fish and observed, This fish almost looks dead. I wonder how they put fish in such a state. The seal looks similar to the one Uchiha Sora used to store the dead body. 
so it should have slowed time to preserve the fish in this state. He extended his palm towards the fish and began releasing an extremely tiny amount of chakra. The chakra touched the body of the fish and began entering it. Fujin frowned but stayed steady as he realized, my chakra isn't entering his body without any resistance. The fish's body is resisting my chakra making healing tougher. In addition, if I increase power, it will probably destroy the fish's body instead of healing it. Fujin kept at it while releasing chakra as slowly as he could. However, even after three minutes, there wasn't any change in the fish. In the meantime, the other eleven were also trying. In under a minute, four fish were burnt enough to be safe for consumption. In the next minute, another four were burnt alive while the remaining three couldn't insert their chakra into the fish. Yoshi's eyes moved on all twelve trainees before being glued to Fujin. He thought, not bad. He was able to insert some chakra into the fish without burning it. Fujin's attention was completely on the fish. He thought, at this rate, I don't think the fish will be healed today. I should increase the chakra. He did say that it will take four to six months to learn this. Burning one fish should be fine. Fujin slowly increased his chakra output for the next 30 seconds. As he did, he noticed that a fin moved. He immediately stopped increasing the chakra and maintained his current rate. However, in 10 seconds, he noticed that the skin had begun burning. He immediately lowered his chakra output. Yoshi's eyes widened in surprise. He thought, what chakra control? Even senior medical ninjas wouldn't be able to control their chakra this well every time. Despite lowering the chakra output, the fish's flesh was completely burnt. Fujin sighed and picked up the fish. He thought, I can't heal if it resists my chakra. Fujin felt someone staring at him. He looked to his right and saw Kurama Asuka staring at him. Chakra flowed through his hand as he properly cooked the fish and asked, Are these fish safe to be eaten? Asuka snorted and swiped the fish off his hand and said, You are here to learn healing and not cooking. Fujin sighed, If I knew that there would be a two-hour lecture, I'd have brought some snacks. Yoshi said, That's enough. Go back and sit and analyze where you went wrong. He looked towards the others and instructed, Half of you come here and try healing the fish. Eleven people got up and went to the table while Fujin and the rest took their seats. At the same time Emi and Asuka swapped the fishes, Yoshi arrived in front of Fujin and the rest who tried healing the fish. Chapter 232, Yoshi asked, What have you learned from your failed attempt? One of the trainees said, We have to be very careful with the amount of chakra we put in the fish. If we use more chakra, it can very easily burn up. Another said, But if we use less chakra, the fish won't heal. Another couple of trainees gave similar answers before going quiet. The ones who hadn't attempted healing yet paid attention as they would soon face the same troubles. Yoshi looked at Fujin and asked, Anything else? Fujin wasn't planning to answer as he expected the instructor to explain the obstacle he faced regardless of his answer. But noticing his gaze, Fujin answered, The fish's body resists our chakra. So very little chakra is actually used to heal the chakra. Yoshi nodded, you are right. In truth, all twelve of you faced this issue. Otherwise, even with little chakra, you would have been able to heal a little bit and with excessive chakra, you would have first noticed rapid healing before the fish got burned. He looked at Fujin and asked, can you guess why the fish resisted your chakra? Fujin answered, I am not sure. The only possible explanation I can come up with is that the fish's body instinctively resisted as my chakra was a foreign chakra. But if that is the case, healing would be abnormally difficult. Especially since the fish's body has minuscule chakra when compared with ninjas. Yoshi replied, Your guess is wrong. There are two reasons why the fish's body instinctively rejects and resists your chakra. The first reason is that your chakra is too harsh. This type of chakra is very effective in combat and hence all of you release this chakra instinctively. But, to heal, you need to release a very gentle and docile chakra. Only then it will be accepted by the patient's body and help heal their bodies. Fujin and the rest were surprised. 
Fujin asked, What do you mean by gentle and docile chakra? Yoshi answered, It means that your chakra shouldn't threaten your patient's body and must feel soothing enough for them to not resist at all and instead allow it to do its work. You will need to eliminate any thoughts you have about killing or fighting before you heal a patient and only then will you be able to heal. Of course, with practice, you will begin releasing a gentle chakra with ease. This is one of the main reasons why it takes so long to learn this jutsu. The second reason is that the chakra you used was a tribute less. Though it seems that medical ninjutsu doesn't need any nature manipulation, it isn't the case. You have to only utilize the young aspect of chakra while using medical ninjutsu. Fujin's eyes widened. He thought, young release? Medical ninjutsu requires young release? Will we be trained in it? Fujin asked, how can we only utilize the young aspect of our chakra? Does it have similar training like the way we train for normal natures? Yoshi shook his head and explained, there is no way to train in young release. He stopped and corrected himself, no, that wouldn't be right to say. But the methods to train Yang release are all secret techniques. So you won't be able to get access to them. As for mystical palm jutsu, you will employ the most basic method for utilizing Yang nature. You will keep trying to heal fish until you are able to heal using only the Yang aspect of your chakra. Once you find it, you should practice a few hundred times so that you master using that aspect. His words made everyone frown. After all, this was like finding a needle in a haystack. It would be difficult, time-consuming and very luck-based. One ninja, who was from the Yamanaka clan as well, asked, Can we perform medical ninjutsu using the Yin aspect of our chakra? Yoshi replied, You can, but it is very difficult. Only senior medical ninjas can do so. And even then, we don't use it for healing external wounds. So focus on learning the yang aspect of the chakra. Yoshi looked at him and said, However, if you know yin release, then learning basic yang release will be easier. You just have to avoid releasing the yin aspect of chakra. The ninja nodded and said, Thank you for the tip, Yoshi sensei. Yoshi looked at everyone and asked, Do you have any more doubts? No one asked any questions. So he returned to monitor the next batch of trainees. Fujin closed his eyes and began thinking about Yoshi's words, so I will have to separate Yang and Yin aspects of the chakra to learn mystical palm jutsu. And here I thought that I'd get it down in no time. Still, this is good. Going by Yoshi's words, if I can learn Yang release, I should also learn Yin release. So my Jin jutsu would become stronger. I might be able to use it in battle against stronger enemies as well. That said, I guess making my chakra gentle first would be the challenge. To eliminate all thoughts of fighting and killing? That's tough. Or would have been tough if I hadn't just experienced it while traveling on Ryu's head. Maybe I should go back to him and see how I could experience it again. Though I guess that I should first take a look at what methods the village has. After all, I did feel that I was able to slightly heal the fish. It is probably why Yoshi asked me a question specifically. The remaining 22 people tried healing the fish and met with similar obstacles. Yoshi didn't see anyone noteworthy among them. So once everyone was done, he had a similar exchange with the remaining trainees. Once all doubts were resolved, he summarized, as you have already tried healing, you would have realized the three major aspects of healing. The first is having a gentle chakra that doesn't make the patient feel any threat. The second is utilizing the yang aspect of your chakra and the last is having very good chakra control. He looked at everyone and said, that's it for today. We will meet again after seven days at noon. In these seven days, I want you to do only one thing. Meditate for as long as you can, and while meditating, think of happy thoughts or pleasant memories. The next time you attempt healing, you will try to think of those memories before healing. Fujin watched him with a dumbfounded look. He thought, what the hell? That's how you make your chakra gentle? You couldn't come with any other bullshit? And this is the village that has the most advanced medical ninjutsu? No wonder Haruzen shot down Tsunade's proposal of training a lot of medical ninjas. Imagine thousands of ninjas thinking happy thoughts while the rest fought. 
Like Fujin, many were speechless by what Yoshi asked them to do. However, if they knew what Yoshi's thoughts were, they would begin cursing him right away. Yoshi enjoyed the look of disbelief on the trainees. He thought, making your chakra gentle isn't difficult. As they keep practicing this jutsu, their chakra will automatically become gentle and docile unless they keep getting angry or frustrated. But, since every one of them thinks that learning this jutsu is easy, I might as well have some fun with them. Just the thought of them meditating while having pleasant thoughts is hilarious. It'll be even more fun when they get annoyed as it won't work, ha ha ha. Yoshi dismissed everyone. When the room was empty, a smile appeared on Yoshi's face. Emmy and Asuka sighed thinking, this old geezer is messing around once again. Fujin moved to Ichiraku while thinking, that old geezer was definitely messing with us when he said that. Something seemed off. Though I didn't sense a lie, he is a medical ninja from the Yamanaka clan. So he might be a good sensor as well. It won't be difficult for him to lie without being sensed. That said, meditation in itself isn't bad. I should stabilize my mind by meditating for a few hours and eliminating all thoughts before I visit next week. More importantly, I should focus on the Yang release. Fujin reached Ichiraku and A while thinking about Yang release. Chapter 233 Fujin sat in his meditation room and sat in a meditative position. Soon, chakra could be seen surrounding his body. Fujin's mind was analyzing his chakra, Yang in nature. How can I segregate the two? As Fujin inspected his chakra, he analyzed, Yang release is described as the physical energy that governs vitality, growth, and life force. Meanwhile, in release is described as the spiritual energy that governs imagination, creativity, and the formation of shape and form. If I have to compare them with techniques, then yang release is often connected with taijutsu while in release is linked with jinjutsu. Ninjutsu needs a balance of both of them. But, when we train taijutsu, jinjutsu or ninjutsu, we don't feel the yang or in aspects of chakra. Fujin clenched his fist and raised it in front of his hands as continued analyzing, if yang release is just the physical energy, then can this be considered as yang release? After all, it enhances my physique. Chakra appeared around his fist. The chakra grew larger and at the same time, Fujin's fist became stronger. Fujin's eyes widened and began glowing as he realized, no, the chakra on my fist is just normal chakra. After all, I haven't segregated the chakra. But, when I focus the chakra on my fist, my fist itself becomes much more resilient. Otherwise, every time I punch something, my fist will become a bloody mess due to the recoil. The chakra that enhances my fist is the yang aspect of my chakra. Fujin didn't analyze anything for a couple of minutes and let the realization sink in. Finally, he let out a sigh and muttered, so learning Senju Taijutsu Chakra automatically teaches us Yang Release. So I have known how to use Yang Release for more than a year without knowing that I know it. He lowered his fist and thought, Sai, you could have at least told me Rinjiro. Do these guys get a kick out of keeping some details a secret? Still, to think that he taught me Yang Release. He wasn't kidding about the magnanimity of the Senju clan. No way any other clan would teach Yin or Yang Release to outsiders. Fujin focused his chakra once again. This time, a thin layer of chakra gathered on his entire body. However, the chakra began decreasing and soon dissipated. However, chakra was still gathered in his flesh. Fujin felt that his body was much stronger. He opened his eyes and raised his right hand in front of him. A formless chakra appeared on his palm. Fujin thought, this should be pure yang chakra. Since there is no Yin Chakra involved, I can't control its shape. I guess Yoshi wasn't speaking the complete truth then. With just Yang Chakra, a medical ninja won't be able to heal perfectly. They will need a little bit of Yin Chakra to control the Yang Chakra so that they can heal effectively. But, since he said that we just need to keep trying until we find the right proportions, I guess that we will eventually be able to release Chakra that is majorly Yang but has a bit of Yin to control it appropriately. Anyways. Suddenly, Yin Chakra flowed into his right palm and mixed with the Yang Chakra. 
the chakra took the shape of a ball and began rotating rapidly. Fujin analyzed, so in the case of Raisingan, Yang chakra is responsible for the damage while Yin chakra is responsible for the rotation and the spherical form. To think that I was able to just do it subconsciously without knowing the details. The same should be the case with every ninjutsu. Fujin went into the lowest basement and began experimenting with all his ninjutsus. He began studying how Yin and Yang chakra worked in every ninjutsu. Three days later, Fujin was standing in his basement. He made a few hand signs. Bringer of Darkness Jutsu. Immediately, the entire room went dark. A smile formed on Fujin's face. Great. The time needed to reduce this jutsu has been reduced by three times. Though I spent three days studying Yang and Yin release, it was time well spent. I will be able to improve my ninjutsus as well. Though they wouldn't have such a huge improvement, it is still better than nothing. Fujin left the basement and freshened himself up. He had barely rested for three days. He thought, since I have learnt both Yang and Yin releases, it's time for a treat. Fujin spent the remaining day visiting all his favorite restaurants in Kanoha until he was full. The next day, Fujin summoned Goro and asked Goro to reverse summon him. When Fujin appeared on Mount Matiki, Goro asked, What do you want to train in today? Fujin replied, I want to talk with your father. Can you take me to him? Goro nodded, Sure. Climb on my majestic back. Goro carried Fujin on his back and flew away from Mount Matiki. En route, Fujin said, By the way, I had a few more ideas for combination jutsus. You will love the next one. Goro grinned and said, I can't wait to try. Thanks to you, I have become even more amazing. I will leave both Kurigan and Kaido in the dust, ha ha ha. In a few minutes, they arrived before Ryu's humongous body. Ryu was resting, however, he opened an eye to see Goro flying towards him. Goro landed in front of him and said, Father, Fujin wanted to see you, so he summoned the most amazing winged saber tooth to help him. See ya! He dropped Fujin and flew away without waiting for Ryu's reply. Ryu sighed at his son's antics and muttered in a sleepy tone, What do you want? Fujin replied, I want to experience the nature chakra once again. Can you monitor me? Ryu asked with one eye closed, Why do you want to experience that again? Fujin answered, I am trying to learn mystical palm jutsu. The instructor said that we need to have a very calm and pleasant mind in order to learn it. And I felt the most calm and pleasant when we flew to Mount Matiki last time. Ryu stared at Fujin and asked lazily, Is mystical palm jutsu that healing jutsu? Fujin nodded. Ryu said in the same tone, So you want to tell me that you need to sense nature chakra in order to learn a basic healing jutsu? Fujin felt awkward upon hearing his question. He said, Well, it isn't a necessity. But it will be of great help. Ryu said, If you keep sensing nature chakra again and again, you will inevitably begin absorbing it as well. And you aren't ready to absorb it. If you do, the only result will be your death. So stop using excuses to achieve that state once again. I know that it feels great and you would want to feel it again and again, but be patient for a few years. Ryu closed his eye and Fujin disappeared leading a cloud of smoke. Fujin appeared back in his basement. A look of surprise could be seen on his face as he muttered, did he end Goro's summon so casually? He got up and sighed, that state felt so peaceful and heavenly. Perhaps it truly felt addictive. I guess Ryu was right in calling the reason an excuse. Oh well, I'll see how it goes in the next training session. For now, it's time to retrain my jutsus. Fujin went to the training ground. He began using the jutsus that he had already mastered and began using them while properly applying yang and yin chakras. He decided, I will begin with the infinite breakthrough jutsu. He gathered chakra in his throat while segregating it into yang and yin. He used the yang chakra to provide power to the jutsu and used the yin chakra to decide the shape and range of the jutsu. Then, he exhaled a normal infinite breakthrough jutsu. Fujin analyzed, the speed of performing the jutsu is much slower. But it's understandable as I am not doing it the normal way. 
I will need to keep practicing to see how much the speed will improve. If it still takes longer, then it won't be worth it. Fujin kept practicing. As he did, his speed increased and a smile formed on his face as he could see the benefits of this new way. He ate a soldier pill so that he could train for longer. Soon, the skies went dark. Fujin gathered chakra once again and instinctively split it into yang and yin. He exhaled another infinite breakthrough jutsu. The jutsu traveled in a straight line like a beam with a two-meter radius. It destroyed all trees in its path for over 100 meters. Fujin grinned, amazing. Though my speed is still a bit slower, the benefits of performing jutsus this way are just amazing. By controlling Yang Chakra, I can easily decide how much power I want to put into the jutsu. If I want to supercharge it, I only have to increase the Yang Chakra and don't have to increase the Yin Chakra. So I can save Yin Chakra while supercharging this jutsu. However, more than Yang Chakra, I am impressed by the abilities of Yin Chakra. I didn't expect such a result. With a grin on his face, he observed his surroundings. It was a complete mess. Some trees had hundreds of holes in their trunk while some had hundreds of cuts on them. A few trees were completely shredded. If anyone visited this place, they would be terrified by the destruction. Fujin was very happy. It was as if a whole new realm of possibilities had opened up for him. A terrifying new realm. Chapter 234 For the next couple of days, Fujin kept practicing infinite breakthrough jutsu with yin yang amplifications until he was satisfied. Soon, it was the day of visiting the hospital. Fujin trained his body in the morning and spent a couple of hours meditating to relax his mind and eliminate all needless thoughts and distractions. He left his house for the hospital but suddenly he had a thought, wait a minute. Yoshi said last time that we need to think about happy and pleasant thoughts. So we need to be happy. And I am happy after eating delicious food. I should stuff my stomach before going. Otherwise, if I keep thinking about eating the fish, I don't think I could heal it, haha. <laughs> Having decided, he visited Ichiraku once again and enjoyed himself while blissfully ignoring the time for Yoshi's training session. At noon, Yoshi entered the same room and saw 28 people in the room. He looked around and his face fell as he thought, six quit already including that youngster. A shame. I had high hopes for him. But, if he doesn't have the discipline of sticking for a week, then there is no way he can become a medical ninja. He began by giving a short lecture and started guiding the trainees to use the mystical palm jutsu. Half an hour later, Fujin knocked on the door and entered the room. Once again, he attracted everyone's attention. Yoshi squinted his eyes. He didn't know how to feel. On one hand, he was happy that Fujin wanted to continue while on the other hand, he was disappointed by his indiscipline. He walked towards Fujin and said, You are late. Fujin nodded but he had a smile on his face. Yoshi's eyes twitched. He commented in his mind, Did that Hataki brat spread his influence on the youngsters? Yoshi put up a serious face and said strictly, I won't allow any tardy ninja to learn medical ninjutsu. So you better give me a good reason for being late. Otherwise, I won't be teaching you. His words were loud enough to be heard by everyone in the room. They all had their attention on Fujin. For half an hour, they had been trying unsuccessfully. So seeing another person get yelled at felt refreshing. They were hoping to get some entertainment. Fujin maintained his smile and said, Of course, I have a reason, Sensei. I had left home on time and should have been here before noon. But then I recalled your words. Yoshi was confused. He asked, My words? Fujin nodded and asked, Didn't you say that we should have happy and pleasant thoughts in order to be able to heal? If the fish's body perceives any threat, then it won't allow our chakra to assist it, right? Yoshi nodded but was still confused. He thought, I did say that bullshit but how is it related to him being late? Fujin said, I recalled your words and realized that in the last week, when I was healing the fish, I was very hungry and was wondering how the fish would taste. It is probably why the fish's body put up a resistance. In addition, I am at my happiest after eating a delicious meal. 
so I took your advice and decided to eat up first before showing up here. Otherwise, I would only fail like last time. Yoshi and everyone in the room were stunned. They were left speechless by Fujin's excuse. Yoshi thought, what the fuck? How did he reach that conclusion? He wanted to yell, but before he could say anything, Fujin bowed and said, that's why I am late sensei. But I still apologize for the delay. It won't happen again. Yoshi was left speechless once again. Fujin didn't even give him any chance to scold him. In the end, he could only say, don't be late again or I won't accept you in the class. His words left everyone else dumbfounded. Especially Emmy and Asuka. Memories of Yoshi yelling at them surfaced in their heads. They both thought, how did he avoid getting yelled at? Could we have just said that we wanted to eat and get away without getting yelled at for years? Fujin said, of course. Yoshi said, go try to heal a fish. Fujin nodded and quickly left and occupied an empty spot that already had a fish. He observed the fish and thought, there's no way there would be a happier sight than his expression. Oh well, here goes nothing. Fujin weaved hand signs and extended his right palm towards the fish with a smile on his face. Yang Chakra appeared on his palm. He used a little bit of Yin Chakra to manipulate the Yang Chakra and began healing the fish. Everyone's eyes were on Fujin. Fujin gently increased his chakra output. To his surprise, the fish began twitching and moving its fins rapidly in just 30 seconds. Once again, shock spread throughout the room. The trainees were shocked that someone managed to heal the fish so quickly. Meanwhile, Emmy and Asuka's eyes popped out. They both cursed in their mind, that shitty advice works. However, the most shocked was Yoshi. He had no idea what to make of the scene unfolding in front of his eyes. The fish began flailing as Fujin's chakra began burning his body. Fujin quickly reduced his chakra output. The fish's body stopped burning, but it was no longer being healed at the required rate. It soon became still once again. Fujin stopped his jutsu. He looked at Yoshi with an innocent face and said excitedly, Your advice is great, sensei. I didn't think I would make progress so quickly. With a few more happy thoughts, I think I can heal the fish in no time. Yoshi's eyes twitched. It wasn't the praise he wanted to hear. However, before he could say anything, he felt many eyes on him. He looked away from Fujin to see that all 28 trainees were staring at him. Awe and respect could be seen in their eyes. Yoshi gulped as he noticed the reverence in their eyes for him. One guy said, I will think of happy thoughts too, sensei. Another asked, I too am the happiest when I eat delicious food. Can I be back in 30 minutes? A few more asked the same question. Another wondered out loud, should I propose to Emiko chan I will be the happiest if she says yes. However, the guy next to him said, but if she says no, then I am afraid that you will never learn this jutsu. The guy shivered and said, you are right. Another guy overheard their conversation and chimed in, we should try to get instant happiness. A lecherous smile appeared on his face, you understand what I mean, right? His statement made everyone feel awkward. They immediately moved two steps away from him. Another looked at Yoshi and asked with a serious face, I am the happiest when I am drunk. But how can I control my chakra properly when I am drunk? Similar statements began flowing through the room. Yoshi saw the chaos in the room with a dumbfounded expression. Never before had he lost control of a room while teaching trainees. However, he couldn't keep staying quiet. He was asked too many questions. He reluctantly said, if anyone wants to go out to relax, you can. But return within an hour. The ones who want to keep training, you can keep training. We will monitor your progress. His words made many trainees excited. Soon, 23 trainees left the room. While leaving, one excitedly exclaimed in a loud voice, I never knew that to become a medical ninja we have to keep ourselves happy all the time. If I did, I would have become a medical ninja right after graduating. Not to mention, with the skills of a medical ninja, I wouldn't even have to be worried about my liver. Ha ha ha. 
Those words made Yoshi look at the ninja. He couldn't believe it and muttered in a low voice, how did things reach this stage? He couldn't help but look at Fujin who still had that innocent smile on his face. Chapter 235, Bring Me More In Shushuya, an old man yelled for yet another drink. The waiter sighed. He took the bottle of sake to his table and poured him more sake while thinking, why does he keep yelling? All the customers from nearby tables have moved away due to him. He even chased a few away at the door. Despite the waiter's worries, the old man wasn't concerned. It was as if he didn't care about anything. He repeated his actions until one guy had enough. He got up and walked to his table and said loudly, Why do you keep shouting old ma? The man suddenly stopped speaking and went pale. He fumbled, Yo, Oss, Sherson, say? Yamanaka Yoshi looked up and saw the middle-aged man. He exclaimed with a wide smile on his face, Isamu. Have a seat. Drink with me. Isamu sat down unwillingly. Seeing Yoshi's state, he was sure that he would be embarrassed and unlike Yoshi, he wasn't drunk enough to not care. He thought, I am a Jounin and a senior medical ninja. There are very few who would outrank me. To think that my luck is so bad that the drunkard I wanted to quiet down just happened to be one. With one last hope of saving himself from the embarrassment, he asked, Why are you drinking so much, Sensei? Yoshi was very tipsy. However, he could still hold rational conversation but his voice and tone were very inconsistent. He said, You won't believe what I witnessed today, Isamu. It was mind-blowing. In my forty years of being a medical ninja and thirty years of being an instructor, I have never witnessed such a sight. Isamu sighed in relief that Yoshi could hold a sane conversation. He was also intrigued at the same time. He couldn't help but ask, What did you see? Yoshi asked, Do you remember that happy thought speech I used to give to the mystical palm trainees? A smile formed on Isamu's face as he replied, Yes, Sensei. We drank multiple times while laughing hilariously at their hilarious attempts. Yoshi said, Yes, that one. One of the trainees followed my advice and made huge improvements. A peculiar expression appeared on his face. He said, How could he? We both know that it is bullshit. They just need some time and practice to tune their chakra to healing mode. Yoshi said, No, it did happen. He managed to heal a bit on his second try. In his second session itself, he made a lot of advancements. And after every attempt, he would think of more happy thoughts and make more improvements. He even thanked me after every improvement. I won't be surprised if he masters the mystical palm jutsu in a month. The whole room was looking at me with reverence in their eyes. Now Isamu was dumbfounded. His mind went into overdrive to make sense of the situation. Soon, he reached a conclusion. He asked, Are you sure that he hasn't already learned the jutsu? Or perhaps someone else is tutoring him? Unlike Yoshi, Isamu wasn't overwhelmed by the situation. So he could think with a stable mind. However, Yoshi shook his head and said, No way. He definitely never used this jutsu before. As for a tutor, that is probably a no as well. I could see how thankful he was in his eyes after every small improvement. It felt so genuine. Bring me more! The waiter hurried to his table while Isamu became embarrassed at being seen alongside him. He got up and said, Bring me along with you next time to see that trainee, Sensei. I will take my leave for now. However, Yoshi said, What's the hurry? Sit down. I'll tell of all the fun and weird things that happened today. Isamu could only sit back reluctantly. Yoshi had taught his batch of medical ninjas and hence held a lot of respect. He couldn't disobey him so brazenly. So he sat down and endured the embarrassment of being seen alongside him. At the same time, loud laughing noise could be heard from the Ichiraku stall. Though the person laughing couldn't be seen due to the curtains, he caused a lot of weird looks to fall on Ichiraku. Tuchi sighed. He had lost count of how many times he had repeated himself, but he had to say it again, Fujin Kuen. You shouldn't laugh so much while eating. Fujin replied, it's fine. 
It's fine. It was just so hilarious. Ha ha ha. I am pouted and said angrily, you keep laughing but don't even tell me what is so funny. Fujin kept laughing and said, you won't understand. I am snorted and looked away and said, tell me. I'll see whether I can understand or not. Fujin replied, it's ninja stuff. Anyways, I am learning a new technique and the old instructor I have was trying some bullshit on us. So I just used his bullshit and made it look like it was true. His face was so hilarious. Ha ha ha. I am looked at Fujin with a confused expression. She muttered to herself, what part of that is so funny? She looked at her father, but he too didn't understand and shook his head. The father-daughter duo left Fujin to his devices. Isamu helped Yoshi to his house before returning to his. However, en route, he couldn't help but think about Fujin. No matter how much he thought about it, he couldn't make sense of it. In the end, he sighed and muttered, I need to check on him. No way that happiness bullshit works. Either he has taken training or has someone guiding him. Otherwise, he will be the greatest talent in medical ninjutsu in our village. No, in the entire ninja world and perhaps history too. After filling his stomach and laughing a lot, Fujin returned home. He took out a scroll as he recalled the earlier events. Earlier in the Kanoha Hospital. The trainees had trained hard for over three hours. But other than Fujin, no one else managed to make much progress no matter how happy they were. Finally, Emmy and Asuka handed all 29 trainees a scroll. Yoshi said, This scroll is similar to the big scroll that preserves the fish. We will be temporarily giving these scrolls to you. When your training is completed, you have to return them. If you fail to return or damage them, then you will have to pay 100,000 Rio as a fine. The huge fine made most of the trainees gulp. They held the scroll properly as if it was an expensive and precious jade. Meanwhile, Fujin thought, this scroll has the same seals? I should try to study the seals. Though I have Sora's seals that were used to store the dead body and eyes, I didn't want to risk experimenting with them as it would have been a huge loss if I damaged the scroll. But, if I damage this scroll, then I only have to pay 100k Rio. It could be helpful if I can replicate the seals. Though 100k Rio was a lot for a normal Jinin or even weaker Chunins, it wasn't much for Fujin who had claimed multiple bounties. Yoshi continued, every scroll has 12 fish that you can use to try your mystical palm jutsu. This is a gift from us to you. In the future, you can ask for more fish at the reception, but you will have to pay for them. Is that understood? Everyone nodded. Yoshi said, try to heal the fish by yourselves until we meet next week. You will have to practice a lot in order to succeed. Now leave. At his home, Fujin looked at the scroll and muttered, it looks like Kanoha wants as many ninjas to learn this jutsu as they can. Otherwise, they wouldn't use so many resources on us. After all, we are just one batch. From what I heard, a new batch is started every month. And Yoshi claimed that it normally takes around 8 to 12 months to learn this jutsu and use it without any risks. So there might be another 12 batches being trained alongside us. Now that I think about it, it is kinda surprising that Tomatsu's squad didn't have anyone who could heal. Fujin opened the scroll and summoned a fish. He observed, hmm, it seems to be the same seal. Good. I'll first use up the fish and then try to study the seals. Fujin began practicing the mystical palm jutsu once again. Chapter 236 In an hour, Fujin had gone through all twelve fishes without completely healing any. He sighed, I feel like I am close but I still can't heal it without burning its flesh. Still, I have a feeling that it should just be a matter of practice. I should get a hang of this jutsu soon. Fujin turned his attention towards the seal and began testing it. After a while, he concluded, interesting seal. It has the base of a normal storage seal. That should be used to create a space in the seal. In addition, there are seals to preserve life and not pose any harm to it as well as to keep the air fresh and rich in oxygen. I can replicate these with ease. However, there are a few additional seals that I don't recognize. 
I wonder if they will be in section A of the library. Since the only additional component in the seal is time, I guess that these seals are responsible for slowing down time in the seal. Suddenly, Fujin's eyes widened as he had an idea. Wait. Since there are seals to slow down time, are there also seals that speed up time? If yes, then I could build my own hyperbolic time chamber. The fourth war is only around eight to nine years away and I am not sure how strong I can be by then. But a hyperbolic time chamber could provide me with a huge help. Especially to master other elements and to try to fuse elements and learn Kekiai Jenkai's. But... A frown formed on Fujin's face, but this won't be without drawbacks. I don't have any means to extend my lifespan. Using such means will make me get older faster. At the very least, I shouldn't use it until the growth of my body has stopped. Not to mention, it is highly questionable if such a seal exists. After all, if it does, I am sure that there would be many others who could come to the same conclusion as me. So, such training rooms should have been a trend in the ninja world. Especially during the times of great wars. Every village could use them to quickly train their kids and add more manpower to their armies. Still, even if it doesn't exist, can I invent such a seal? Fujin stared at the unfamiliar symbols while thinking, the Kanoa library should have the seal to slow down time. Whereas, speeding up time just needs reverse principles. With this seal as a base, I could have something to work with. Fujin analyzed more before nodding to himself, yes, I can try this. Even if I have to limit the usage for myself, this method can be very handy. I'll work on this after mastering the seal that slows down time. With numerous ideas running through his mind, Fujin began studying the seal properly. He wrote down the symbols he didn't identify and experimented with them until he was sleepy. The next day Fujin created a couple of shadow clones. The clones looked at him and nodded. No words were needed. Fujin left the house and began his morning routine while his clones continued working on the seal. After completing his morning routine, Fujin began relearning his jutsus by controlling Yin and Yang chakra. Fujin analyzed, my infinite breakthrough jutsu is modified to the limit. I can't strengthen it once again in a short time. Time to move on to the air bullet jutsu. Once this jutsu is down, I will check if Yin and Yang chakra could be used to improve wind vacuum jutsus. Fujin trained till his chakra levels became low. Satisfied with his progress, he returned home, took the scroll and went to the hospital to buy more fish for testing. After dinner, he trained mystical palm jutsu once again before going to bed. For the next five days, Fujin trained in this manner. Finally, on the fifth night, a grin formed on Fujin's face. In front of him, a fish was rapidly flapping its fins and jumping on the scroll. Fujin muttered, Mystical palm jutsu is learned. He grabbed the fish and flickered to his washroom. He filled a bucket with water and placed the healed fish in it. The fish finally calmed down and began swimming merrily. Fujin observed the fish for ten minutes and thought, Good, there are no side effects or complications. I should try healing a few more. Fujin returned towards where his scroll was. He opened it completely and summoned five fishes and weaved a hand sign. Multi-Shadow Clone Jutsu for shadow clones appeared around him. All immediately used mystical palm jutsu. In 30 seconds, all fish began moving on the scroll. Fujin transferred all the fish into the bucket and observed them. All were fine and didn't develop any complications. A clone said, Looks like the first step of learning this jutsu is completed. Another nodded and said, Yes. Now we just have to try it on humans. Fujin dismissed his clones and thought, it too should be similar. But I will have to be more careful. These fish were injured to the appropriate degree. In field situations, the injuries could be poisoned, may have already attracted some bacteria or there could be internal injuries. Anyways, no need to be worried about that. Yoshi should educate me about this. Fujin let out a yawn and muttered, I should go to sleep. Though I have managed to learn this jutsu, the seal has been difficult to replicate. I will spend the entire day tomorrow learning it. 
The next morning, Fujin entered his basement and made a hand sign. Multi-Shadow Clone Jutsu In an instant, the entire basement was filled with smoke. Fujin created 35 shadow clones. His face went pale due to the loss of Chopra. He sat down for a couple of minutes and meditated. His clones observed him and realized, I still can't control my chakra during the shadow clone jutsu. All chakra gets distributed equally. Since I made 35 shadow clones, my main body just has one thirty-sixth of his chakra remaining. No wonder the main body immediately began meditating. Though Fujin was meditating, his clones didn't need to meditate. They didn't disturb him and began working on the seal. After an hour, Fujin's chakra finally recovered to a sufficient level. Fujin thought, I need to modify the multi-shadow clone jutsu. Instead of dividing all chakra, I need to assign the chakra for the jutsu to divide. That way, only the chakra I want will be equally divided while I will still have access to my remaining chakra. Fujin opened his eyes and saw that all 35 clones were working on the seal. He observed them while thinking, there are already 35 shadow clones working on the seal. Adding myself won't increase the pace of research. What should I do? After thinking a bit, he got up and said, looks like I underestimated how much chakra I would lose. His clones looked at him and nodded. Fujin said, I will go to the meditation room and meditate. You guys keep working on the seal for the next three hours. Then dismiss yourself in groups of five and intervals of five minutes. The clones nodded and began working again while Fujin began meditating in his meditation room to calm his mind and recover his chakra. Three hours later, the clones began dismissing themselves in the decided order. With each clone's disappearance, a surge of memories flooded Fujin's mind like a deluge of information pouring into his consciousness. He closed his eyes, feeling the weight of the collective experiences washing over him. The memories came in fragments, a jumble of observations, analysis, and speculations, like pieces of a puzzle seeking their place. Despite the overwhelming influx of knowledge, Fujin remained focused, his mind swiftly analyzing and processing each memory as it arrived. He meticulously pieced together the memories, drawing connections, and extracting the essential insights. However, amidst the exhilaration of acquiring so much information, a slight headache gnawed at Fujin's temple. It was the consequence of absorbing so many memories. Fortunately, due to the time interval, the headache wasn't intense. Fujin pressed on integrating all the memories together and gaining the gains made by all of his clones. Finally, he let out a sigh and muttered, I can't say what is worse having an intense headache at the same time or many headaches spread out over 30 minutes. Whatever, time to redo it. Fujin returned to the basement. However, this time, he didn't use the multi-shadow clone jutsu and instead used shadow clone jutsu 30 times. He could control the amount of chakra he pours in a single shadow clone. Due to this, he stopped when he felt that the chakra was reaching low levels. Fujin's clones began working once again. Meanwhile, Fujin left his house and went to Yakiniku to fill his stomach. Analyzing memories of 35 clones not only gave him a headache, but it also created a hole in his stomach. Chapter 237 Fujin's clones spent the whole day studying the seal and trying to replicate it. Due to studying with 30 clones, they made rapid progress. Finally, at midnight, one shadow clone exclaimed, I did it. This immediately attracted everyone's attention. They began moving closer to him to observe the seal. But the clone said with a chuckle, no need to be impatient. He dispelled himself and sent memories to Fujin and all his clones. All the clones absorbed the memories and realized. Immediately, they began creating the seal. Meanwhile, Fujin, who was meditating in the meditation room, opened his eyes. A smile formed on his face. He created a shadow clone and dispelled it. All the shadow clones received the memories. After completing the seal, clones began dispelling themselves at regular intervals. After absorbing everyone's memories, Fujin returned to the basement. He collected all the scrolls and opened up a new one. 
he quickly inscribed the newly learned seal into the scroll and studied it. After observing it thoroughly, he concluded, Good, this looks exactly like the seal I copied. Now, time to test it. Fujin stored a rotten apple in the seal and thought, It's good that I had the presence of mind to buy a rotten apple when I went out to eat. I will check if the apple state worsens or remains the same until tomorrow morning. In the meantime, I will have a nice long sleep. My headache is killing me. The next morning, as soon as he woke up, Fujin withdrew the rotten apple from the seal. He observed it and concluded, the same as last night. Great. I will continue storing it in this seal to test how well this seal works. If it can keep it stored for a week or more, I'll begin reversing the seal to increase the speed of time. Fujin sealed the apple back in the seal and looked at the clock. His eyes widened, the hell? It is already 11.45 a.m.? Shit, I underestimated that headache. Fujin quickly got off his bed and freshened up. He grabbed a few fruits to eat and flickered to the hospital. Thanks to his speed, he barely managed to make it in time. Fujin entered the room thinking, though last time was fun, it's probably best to not delay pointlessly. After all, my reputation is nowhere near Kakashi's. As Fujin entered the room, the room was quite noisy. Everyone was talking about the activities they did to ensure maximum happiness before coming to the hospital. However, they went quiet and looked at Fujin. After all, he was the only one to have some success in healing the fish. A few groups called Fujin, but soon after Fujin entered the room, Yoshi, Isamu, Emi, and Asuka entered the room as well. So everyone quickly occupied their seats. Yoshi and Isamu walked to the front of the room and Yoshi announced, This is Isamu. He was one of my students as well. Now he is a full-fledged medical ninja with a lot of achievements under his belt. Have you practiced at home? Everyone nodded. One person said excitedly, Yes, Sensei. I also did a lot of stuff to keep myself happy. Yoshi's face immediately went dark while Isamu let out a chuckle. Yoshi said, All right. Show me your progress. Everyone began going to the tables in groups and tried healing the fish. Fujin observed them. As he expected, no one had made any progress. Finally, it was Fujin's turn to go. He got up and approached the table. The eyes of Yoshi, Isamu, and others in the room were glued on him. He weaved a hand sign and extended his right hand towards the fish. Yang Chakra appeared on his palm and began healing the fish. In a few seconds, the fish began improving in health. It began quivering. Ten seconds later, it began moving its fins rapidly and jumped into the small pond on the other side of the table. Silence spread throughout the room. Everyone was shocked by what they witnessed. One guy asked in a soft voice, Didn't Yoshi-sensei say that we will need four to six months to reach this stage? The guy next to him nodded but couldn't say anything. Yoshi was the one who was in the most shock. After all, he had seen how much Fujin struggled just two weeks ago. Meanwhile, Isamu was very suspicious. Fujin looked at Yoshi and said with a smile, having a full stomach helps a lot, Sensei. Can we move on to the next step? Yoshi finally gathered his thoughts and said, Good work. He looked at Emi and Asuka and said, you two take control of the room and guide everyone. He looked back at Fujin and said, Fujin, come with me. Yoshi and Isamu began walking out of the room. Fujin followed thinking, did I make too much of an impact on them by learning the jutsu so quickly? They walked out of the room and towards Yoshi's office as Fujin concluded, that should be the case. Oh well, it doesn't matter much now even if I show off my talent or skills. It would just make the village value me more. The trio entered a small cabin. Both Yoshi and Isamu stared at Fujin until he got uncomfortable and asked, What are you two staring like this? Both ignored his question and kept staring. Isamu asked, Fujin, tell us the truth. Have you learnt or practiced the mystical palm jutsu earlier? Fujin replied, Nope. Isamu asked again, did anyone else guide you privately after you visited the hospital two weeks ago? Fujin tilted his head and asked, Do we also get private tutors for learning mystical palm jutsu? 
He looked at Yoshi and asked, Why didn't you tell me earlier, Sensei? Sweat formed on Yoshi and Isamu's heads. They both had the same thought, this brat learned the jutsu in two weeks and still wanted personal tutoring? Yoshi coughed and said, We don't offer any personal tutoring. However, if any trainee has good relations with a medical ninja, they can receive their help. Fujim replied, Oh, that makes sense. Unfortunately, I don't have a close friendship with any medical ninja. Yoshi and Isamu both went silent and looked at each other. Both agreed that Fujin had incredible talent. Yoshi looked back at Fujin and asked, Fujin, do you want to become a medical ninja? Fujin frowned. He thought for a bit and shook his head. He said, Becoming a medical ninja will take a lot of time. I don't have much time on my hands right now. If I have time in the future, then I might consider it. Fujin did consider it seriously. After all, medical ninjutsu seemed to be a very good way to master Yang and Yin Chakra. Unfortunately, Fujin couldn't do so. He thought, I am learning a lot of things at the same time. Ninjutsu, Taijutsu, Swordplay and Fuinjutsu have been my main focus. And I have also learned some Jinjutsu. If I add medical ninjutsu to the mix as well, I might overburden myself and make a mess of everything. After all, becoming a medical ninja might need more time than learning Fuinjutsu. Mystical palm jutsu is sufficient for my current needs. Yoshi and Isamu frowned. From Fujin's answer, they realized that even if Fujin pursued medical ninjutsu, it wouldn't be his main focus. That wasn't what they wanted. Yoshi said, Fujin, I think you misunderstood me. I want you to abandon your other options and focus completely on becoming a medical ninja. As he was speaking, both he and Isamu figured out the answer from Fujin's face. So before Fujin could refuse, Isamu said, We will be honest with you Fujin. I didn't want to tell you this right now in case you become overconfident, but I will because if you don't, then it will be a huge loss for Konoha. Your talent for medical ninjutsu is very high. If you become a medical ninja, then you will become a very good one in a few years. Also, your fighting capabilities won't be wasted as you can use them to protect yourself on the front lines. Yoshi nodded in agreement. However, Fujin shook his head. This time he didn't even need to think. He was learning mystical palm jutsu to ensure that he could last longer in fights and quickly heal himself if he took lethal damage. Focusing on medical ninjutsu would be reversing his priorities. He answered, Sorry, I don't intend to do so. Yoshi and Isamu were surprised. They didn't expect Fujin to turn them down so directly. They both sighed. Yoshi said, All right. I will teach you the complexities of mystical palm jutsu and how to use it on your allies. I and Isamu will guide you for three days. If you change your mind later, you know where to find us. Fujin nodded and quickly thanked them. Yoshi and Isamu began teaching Fujin with a lot of enthusiasm and made the lessons as entertaining as they could. They wanted to use this opportunity to make Fujin change his mind. Chapter 238 Yoshi and Isamu train Fujin for three continuous days. Fujin absorbed all their teachings and became capable enough to use this jutsu on humans. However, despite his rapid progress, Yoshi and Isamu weren't happy as they weren't able to change Fujin's mind. Fujin thanked them once again before leaving. After exiting the talent, Fujin let out a sigh. He could see reluctance in the eyes of Yoshi and Isamu. He thought, they really wanted me to pursue medical ninjutsu. Unfortunately, that's not the path I want to move on. That said, I understood why they wanted me to pursue this path. It isn't that they think that my talent is good, they probably think that my talent is the greatest due to how quickly I learned the jutsu. Unfortunately, that isn't the case. If it was, perhaps I'd be tempted to take this path at the beginning. Back in the hospital, Isamu let out a sigh and said, we couldn't change his mind. Yoshi nodded and said, yes. But I know someone who can. Come with me. Isamu was surprised. He looked at Yoshi and asked, who are you talking about, Sensei? Yoshi smirked and said, Oh, you know him. 
He is the best in the world at influencing kids. Isamu was still confused. He couldn't figure out who Yoshi was referring to. However, he didn't ask as it looked like Yoshi wanted to keep him in suspense. He quickly followed Yoshi. After a few minutes, both entered into a room. Isamu's eyes twitched as he muttered, I should have known. Yoshi smirked and bowed slightly, Lord Hokage. Hiruzen looked at them and said, Yoshi, Isamu, how have you two been? Yoshi replied, We have been great, Lord Hokage. We have come here because we have a request for you and hope that you can do it. It will provide a huge boost to our medical capabilities. Hiruzen was surprised at his claim. He thought, since Tsunade left, our medical ninjutsu hasn't made much progress. What did these two find? He asked, What is your request? Yoshi said, We met a young kid who has incredible talent at medical ninjutsu. We believe that it may even surpass Tsunade's talent. He managed to learn the mystical palm jutsu with minimal guidance in two weeks. Unfortunately, he isn't interested in pursuing medical ninjutsu. Can you convince him to do so? Hiruzen asked, Who is the kid? Yoshi answered, Suzuki Fujin. Hiruzen went silent for a few seconds as thoughts ran through his mind. He shook his head and said, No. Yoshi was surprised. He quickly asked, Why no? However, Hiruzen interrupted him, You two are mistaken. He isn't talented in medical ninjutsu. Yoshi and Isamu weren't expecting such a response. Hiruzen corrected himself, Well, he could be. But mystical palm jutsu won't be a good measure of his talent. Fujin has had excellent chakra control since his academy days. And he has learned the Senju Taijutsu style. So he is accustomed to both Yang Chakra and excellent chakra control. That is why he learned mystical palm jutsu so quickly. Yoshi and Isamu were dumbfounded by that answer. They looked into each other's eyes. Both were so excited by Fujin's talent and prospects that they never thought from this angle. Isamu muttered, Is he related to the Senju clan? Hiruzen answered, No. But his sensei was from the Senju clan. Yoshi and Isamu let out a sigh. Yoshi said, We got excited about nothing. Sorry for wasting your time, Lord Hokage. Hiruzen replied with a chuckle, It's fine. It was good to see you after a long time. You can leave. Yoshi and Isamu nodded and left. Hiruzen saw their backs while thinking, though it doesn't show his talent in medical ninjutsu, it definitely shows his talent in young release. After all, I doubt Renjiro would have spoon-fed him everything. No, he certainly didn't know about it when I trained him. Now that he has learned it, I wonder if he will manage to use Yang and Yin Chakra to modify his jutsus and make them stronger. Hiruzen obviously knew how to use Yin and Yang Chakra to amplify his jutsus. When Fujin arrived to collect the swords, he was surprised to learn that Fujin wanted to learn mystical palm jutsu. Knowing that it would mean that he would have to learn how to use Yang Chakra, Hiruzen insisted that Fujin learn the jutsu before he was recruited into Umbu. The next day, Fujin once again began using Yin and Yang Chakra to modify his jutsus. However, he was stuck. He analyzed, just like infinite breakthrough jutsu, the air bullet jutsu also showed results quickly. But I haven't been able to modify vacuum bullet and vacuum sphere jutsus at all. I guess the reason is that they have already reached the limits of modification. After all, I could modify the vacuum cannon jutsu. But even that was very little. Since it was based on the vacuum bullet, it too was quite close to perfection. Oh well, I will just focus on my other jutsus. I will start with Wind Sword and Spinning Shield of Wind Jutsus and then followed up with Wind Gale Wolf and Wind Dragon Jutsus. Following it, I will work on the Rank D and E Wind Jutsus before working on Earth Wall Jutsu and Lightning Jutsus. Fujin began training. In the next four days, he modified Wind Sword and Spinning Shield of Wind Jutsus and began working on the Wind Gale Jutsu. However, he decided to take a break and decided to work on another important project. He opened a scroll and withdrew an apple from it. The apple was rotten. Fujin observed it and concluded, Good. 
The apple hasn't rotted any further despite it being a week. Time to create a seal with the opposite effect. Fujin created 30 shadow clones one by one and all began thinking about how to reverse the seal. For the next three days, they constantly racked their brains thinking about how to reverse the seal. Hundreds of empty scrolls were used up to try their experiments. Finally, one of the clones sighed and said aloud, This is impossible. We have no leads at all. The other clones didn't reply. After all, they had experienced nothing but failure for three days. Considering that Fujin was training with 30 clones, it was equivalent to spending three months trying to reverse the seal. However, not a single clone had any breakthrough. Another clone said, though we learnt the seal, we did it by reverse engineering the seal we already had. There are a lot of symbols that we don't have full information about. It will be better if we try to create this seal after becoming a few Injutsu Grandmaster. Fujin agreed with his clone's analysis. One by one, he began dispelling his clones. The tiredness set into his body as he went to sleep. The next day, he had just finished his morning training when an Umbu ninja entered the training ground. Fujin instantly sensed him and waited for him. The Umbu ninja flickered in front of Fujin and instructed, Come to Lord Hokage's office in one hour. Fujin nodded. Having delivered the message, the Umbu ninja flickered away. Fujin saw him leave and thought, finally time to join the Umbu, huh? I kinda wish that Haruzen took another couple of months. I would have managed to completely modify most of my moves using Yin and Yang Chakra by then. He shook that thought and flickered to his house to freshen up. He thought, oh well. I have heard a lot about how Umbu works and how crucial their role is for the village. Unfortunately, there is not much concrete data on their true activities apart from the fact that they do a lot of dark stuff. A smile appeared on Fujin's face as he entered his house, whatever, I just hope that it is exciting. I haven't had a good fight for a long time. In an hour, Fujin appeared outside the Hokage's office. Takao was waiting outside the door. He looked at Fujin and said, right on time as always. Go to the basement of the Hokage building. Fujin furrowed his eyebrows and asked, There is a basement under this building? Takao rolled his eyes and said, Of course there is. The entrance is in the backmost room on the ground floor. Now hurry. Fujin nodded and disappeared from Takao's sight. Takao muttered, I said hurry, not flicker. Fujin appeared in the room Takao mentioned. An umbu ninja with an eagle mask was sitting in the room. He looked at Fujin and asked, Suzuki Fujin? Fujin nodded. The umbu ninja made a hand sign. A hole appeared in the room. He said, You are the last one. Enter. He jumped in the hole and Fujin followed him. After landing, Fujin looked around himself. A look of surprise appeared on his face. Chapter 239 Fujin was surprised due to a few reasons. For one, the basement was much larger than what Fujin expected. It was definitely larger than the base of the Hokage building. It was one large and continuous room with a bunch of rooms lined along the walls. Except that, there wasn't any wall or pillar in the entire basement. Fujin analyzed, the basement is so large. This would mean that it extends beyond just the Hokage building. I guess even the basement of the Kanoha Hospital is connected so it could allow an alternate route of travel between the Hokage building and the hospital. Another reason for his surprise was the dense amount of seals he sensed in the basement. He realized, no wonder I never found this basement. The density of the seals here is almost comparable to my house. And they should be stronger as well. And the last reason for being surprised was that he wasn't the only one. He looked at the ones around him and thought, I knew that I wouldn't be the only one but I expected only a few were at max 20. However, there are more than 200 ninjas here. Looks like Haruzen wants to increase the strength of the Umbu unit to a whole new level. The Eagle Mask Umbu Ninja said, Stay here. Lord Hokage will arrive soon. He flickered away after speaking. Fujin looked around himself. Almost everyone in the room was much older than him. However, 
his eyes landed on an acquaintance. Terry too noticed Fujin and walked towards Fujin. He waved his hands and said, I knew you would be selected as well, Fujin. Fujin wasn't overly surprised to see Teru. After all, he had heard a lot about the umbu from Teru and his strength wasn't weak. Fujin chuckled, I expected to see you here as well. But I didn't expect to see so many people here. Teru nodded and replied, me neither. It looks like Lord Hokage wants to replace the loss of the Uchiha clan by training a huge number of umbu ninjas. Fujin nodded but couldn't help but think, I doubt training a couple of hundred umbu will be able to replace the Uchihas. But I guess that this is better than nothing. Fujin asked, Did you see Hoka here as well? Fujin didn't want to spread his chakra field here as it might seem insulting to others in the basement. Terra shook his head and said, No, Hoka is from the branch family of the Hyuga clan. He won't be invited into the umbu. Fujin was surprised to hear that. But after thinking for a few seconds, he realized that it was very logical. He replied, I see. That sucks for him. Teru nodded. He was about to speak when both Fujin and Teru looked in a direction. A huge chakra was being released by the eagle mass Tumbu. He announced loudly, stand properly in lines and hear carefully. Lord Hokage will be speaking a few words. Hiruzen had appeared in the room. He stood at one end of the basement. Soon, everyone gathered in front of him. Hiruzen looked at everyone and thought, good. All 234 accepted the invite. Hiruzen kept looking at everyone without speaking for over a minute. He made eye contact with every ninja in the room. Finally, he began saying in a serious tone, I am glad that all of you have chosen to come here today and I am sure that you would be surprised to see a large number of ninjas I want to induct into the umbu. Everyone nodded. Though many had speculations, no one knew for sure. Even the umbu ninjas weren't entirely sure. Hiruzen continued in a grave voice, In the last month, we experienced one of the darkest chapters in our village's history, the Uchiha Massacre. The loss we have suffered is immeasurable, not just in terms of lives, but also in the trust and unity that once bound us. We stand on the precipice of uncertainty, facing external threats that loom over us like dark clouds. Our enemies sense our vulnerability and seek to exploit it. Though I have managed to keep them at arm's length for now, they will still try to provoke us again. Hiruzen stopped speaking and noticed the mood in the basement. Everyone's expression had become grim. Hiruzen began speaking once again. However, this time he heroically said, however, they are gravely mistaken to think of us as weak. We, the shinobi of Kanoha, are resilient. We have faced trials and tribulations throughout our history, and yet we have always emerged stronger. It is in our blood, in our very essence, to rise above the challenges that beset us. We possess a fire that burns deep within our hearts, the will of fire. It is the legacy that has been passed down from generation to generation, and now, in this critical moment, it falls upon us to carry it forward. The Uchiha massacre has left a void within our ranks, but it is our duty to fill that void, strengthen our defenses, and ensure that no enemy looks at us with malevolent eyes. In order to fulfill the void, I work day and night to find the most talented chunins in our village. All of you will be inducted among the Umbu ranks. You will receive proper training to become full-fledged Umbu members. And every single one of you will strive to reach the Umbu captain position. I have no doubts that every single one of you will reach the level of the Jounins. With 234 new Jounins, not a single enemy village will dare look at us with malevolent eyes. You shall become the shield that protects our village, the sword that strikes fear into the hearts of our enemies. I have faith in each and every one of you, in your skills, your dedication, and your unwavering spirit. Together, we shall rise above the shadows that seek to engulf us. We shall write a new chapter in the history of Kanoha, one of resilience, growth, and triumph. Remember, my fellow shinobi, that our legacy is not defined by the tragedies we endure, but by how we rise above them. Let us stand tall, shoulder to shoulder, as we face the challenges that lie ahead. May the will of fire burn bright within each of you, 
guiding us towards a future where our village stands strong and our people thrive. For Kanoha, and for the fallen Uchiha, we shall honor their memory through our unwavering resolve. Now, let us embark on this journey together. From today onwards, I welcome you all into the ranks of Kanoha's and Satsu's Sinjutsu Takushu Butai. Hiruzen's words sent goosebumps throughout the crowd. They made everyone's blood boil. Even the hardened Umbu ninjas got excited and more patriotic than ever. Most of the trainees shouted together, Yes, Lord Hokage. Sweat gathered on Fujin's forehead. He stared at Hiruzen as he thought, Holy shit. His speeches keep improving by the day. Even I felt goosebumps. He looked around himself. Everyone was maniacally staring at Hiruzen. A fire burned in their hearts and madness was visible in their eyes. Fujin gulped as he thought, Wow! One single speech might just end up creating 234 jounins in Kanoha. Hiruzen's face maintained a serious look. However, he was pleasantly happy with the sight in front of him. He thought, I haven't used this speech since the death of Minato. It's time to have another period of rapid growth. Along with these 234, I will work with the clans to create more ninjas at every rank. Only then can Kanoha's army be properly reformed. Hiruzen waited for a few minutes for the excitement to calm down. He wasn't impatient about striking when the iron was hot. After all, he had just lit a fire in the hearts of everyone. He was assured that this fire won't die down any time soon. Everyone will train hard for some time. Some might train hard for a few months before the fire dies down. While some might train hard for years and go even beyond the Jounin rank. Finally, he said, all of you will be divided into teams. You will be assigned under an Umbu captain. The captain will be responsible for training you for a few months and will also lead you in field missions. He looked at the eagle mast Umbu standing behind him and said, He is eagle. He is the commander of all ninjas in the Umbu unit. If you have any issues, you can approach him. He looked back at the crowd and said, He will begin assigning you to Umbu captains. Cooperate with him and begin your training as soon as you can. Kanoha needs all of you to step up at this very moment. Hiruzen took a step back and handed the reins to Eagle. Eagle quickly began guiding everyone to their respective Umbu captains. He had already read all the files that Hiruzen sent him and memorized everyone's face, name, and skills. Everyone was called here after he had finished assigning the teams. Chapter 240 Eagle was busy informing everyone about their Umbu captain. Soon, he arrived in front of Fujin and Teru. He looked at them and said, Good, you are together. Both of you are assigned under Kuma. He pointed towards a bear mass Umbu and said, That's him, go and introduce yourselves. Fujin and Teru walked to him. Another young Chunin was already standing next to the bear marked Umbu. The Umbu with the codename Kuma was leaning against the wall. He was a very large person. He was easily over seven feet in height and had a large physique. In addition, he wore plate armor and had a metal staff next to him. Both Fujin and Teru speculated that he was from the Akimichi clan. The youngster next to Kuma looked at Teru and said with a smile, Looks like we are in the same team once again. Teru smiled and looked at Fujin and said, Fujin, he is Hataki Kane. He was in my Jinin squad along with Yori. Kane, he is Suzuki Fujin. He was my classmate. A slash in, Kane was shown in Chapter 51. Fujin and Kane said hello to each other. Kuma looked at the three youngsters and said, It's good that you three know each other. Follow me. He opened the room behind him and entered. Fujin, Teru, and Kane followed him in. Kuma closed the door. The room was small and compact with multiple cupboards, lockers, and boxes along the walls. Fujin realized that the room itself had a lot of seals for defense and privacy. He nodded in appreciation, not bad for Umbu headquarters. Looks like the village higher-ups didn't spare any cost while making this basement. Kuma removed his mask and sat down on a bench with a smile on his face. He said, this will be our private quarters. You can use this room to keep spare clothes and weapons. We will also have our team meetings here. 
Everyone nodded and took their seats. Kuma said, let's start with introductions. I am Akimichi Tsuyoshi. You can call me Captain. I specialize in Akimichi clan secret techniques, fire release, and using a bow to fight. And I prefer frontal assaults during the fighting. What about you guys? Fujin noticed, unlike Renjiro, he isn't interested in knowing hobbies, likes and dislikes. But I suppose that makes sense considering that this is the umbu. Fujin said, I am Suzuki Fujin. I specialize in wind release and I fight using swords. I am also a sensor and can use the mystical palm jutsu. I prefer to fight from a distance or to fight using hit and run tactics. Tsuyoshi closely observed Fujin. After all, Fujin's fighting method was completely opposite to Tsuyoshi's methods. However, before he could analyze Fujin, his attention was gained by Teru and Kane. Teru followed up, I am Senju Teru. I specialize in water and earth releases and am good with taijutsu. I prefer frontal assaults but can engage in mid-range battles as well. Kane was the last to speak, I am Ataki Kane. I specialize in lightning release and I use a short blade to engage in Ataki Kenjutsu. I can use the mystical palm jutsu as well. I prefer high-speed combat that keeps the enemy on their toes and inflicts multiple small damages to the enemy. My team can use the advantage provided by those small damages to kill the enemy. Tsuyoshi began analyzing, as expected, they are bad despite their young age. Fujin and Kane prefer to do high-speed battles to take advantage of their wind and lightning affinities while Teru has the steadiness of the Senju clan. With me as the core, we can form several effective strategies and battle formations. It looks like the chief did a wonderful job once again. My team will cover all five natures. In addition, with Fujin's sensor capabilities and his and Kane's healing jutsu, we will have a rather all-round squad for Umbu. He said, good. It looks like you have a good base. I will first tell you about some basic rules of Umbu. The trio paid attention to his words. Tsuyoshi said, for an Umbu, maintaining secrecy is a must. You will never talk about any Umbu mission you do with anyone outside your chain of command. In fact, you shouldn't even be telling anyone that you are selected into the Umbu. To maintain anonymity, you will choose a mask and codename for you. You will always call the other Umbu ninjas by their codenames whenever you are on a mission. And when we meet off duty, you should never call me or any other Umbu ninja using their codenames. As you know, my codename is Kuma. The wooden box behind has a lot of masks. Choose whichever one you want. Also, choose a codename for yourselves. Fujin, Teru, and Kane nodded. They quickly opened up the box and saw a bunch of animal masks in it. The boys took some time to decide on their masks and tried them on to check which size fitted them properly. After a couple of minutes, they walked back in front of Tsuyoshi. Tsuyoshi observed their masks. Teru had taken a turtle mask. Fujin had a hawk mask while Kane had a fox mask. Tsuyoshi asked, Have you chosen your codename? The trio nodded. Teru said, My codename will be Turtle. Fujin said, Mine will be Hawk. Kane said, Mine will be Kitsune. Tsuyoshi nodded and said, Good. Now I why? However, Fujin interrupted him, Captain, since there are so many ninjas in the Umbu, wouldn't multiple Umbu ninjas have the same masks and codenames? Tsuyoshi nodded, Yes, they get repeated. I know at least 11 other Umbu ninjas with the hawk mask and codename. But you don't need to worry as it is a good thing. Our enemies can't recognize us easily from the mask due to how many there are. Also, you don't need to worry about confusion in our ranks. Lord Hokage and our commander have very large memories. They will always recognize you and give you the right task. Fujin nodded and said, All right. Tsuyoshi continued, I will first give you a brief description of my training plan. So listen carefully. Fujin, Teru and Kane once again paid full attention. Tsuyoshi said, since you have been selected to the Umbu, it shows that you already have good training, discipline and decent strength. So your training won't involve any jutsus or techniques to make you stronger. 
Instead, your training will focus on making you act and fight like an Umbu Ninja. I will train you in various formations and battle tactics that we will be using in field missions. In addition, I will also teach you all about poisons including but not limited to detecting poison, which poisons to use against an array of opponents and in various situations and what to do if you or your ally gets poisoned. Your training will also involve learning various assassination techniques. You will also learn how to provide the perfect security. Infiltration, disguise, etiquettes, concealing traces, planting evidence, causing fights, diplomacy and other such stuff will also be taught. He took a pause and looked at the three youngsters and said in a serious tone, as a normal ninja, the life of your teammates takes the highest precedence. I am sure that you have saved your teammates or got saved many times during missions. At times, you might have done that at the cost of your mission. But in Umbu, the mission comes above everything else. Failing missions can have grave consequences for our village. And getting captured by an enemy is a strict no. So you will also be trained to resist torture and will also be equipped with multiple means of ending your own life if need be. The faces of the three youngsters grew grim. They all realized that this wouldn't be as easy as their Jinnin and Chunin lives. And they realized that the risks to their lives during their time in the Umbu will be the highest. Tsuyoshi so looked at them and asked, Any doubts? All three replied, No, Captain. Tsuyoshi so smiled and said, Good. Though we may experience difficult situations, unless there is no choice, we won't abandon our comrades. So no need to be tense. But do train very hard so that we won't ever have to be in a position like that. As an umbu, you will have access to the training grounds and rooms that are specifically reserved for the umbu. In the entire village, these facilities are among the very best. So in addition to my training, you can train there to steadily and rapidly build your strength. A smile formed on Fujin's face. He had heard that Umbu training facilities had training rooms similar to the Forest of Death. So they probably had elemental stones. He couldn't wait to get his hands on them. He would take every Ryo that Haruzen won by betting on him back with interest. Tsuyoshi got up and said, I will take you to your first mission as an Umbu. Chapter 241 The youngsters were surprised to hear that they would take a mission on their first day. After such a long talk, they expected at least a few weeks of training. Teru asked in surprise, a mission on our first day? Both Fujin and Kane also had the same question. Tsuyoshi waved his hand and said, don't worry. Since you are new here, we will be taking an easy mission. So you will get to do a mission and get used to the Umbu way of operating at the same time. He grabbed his mask and put it on and said, as I said, outside the room, you will only refer to me by my code name. He walked out of the room. The boys put on their masks and followed him out. At the same time, the Kanoha Academy was very busy. It was the day of the graduation exam. 359 students from the final year were taking the exam in various classrooms. Hyuga Hachiro looked at the file and said, Next, Daisuki Daisuki. Daisuki stood up and walked to the front of the classroom. Hachiro looked at him and said, Transform into Lord Hokage. Daisuki weaved hand signs and soon transformed into Haruzen. He looked exactly like Haruzen with no flaws in appearance. Hachiro nodded in approval. He and a couple more teachers entered his marks in their files. Hachiro said, Good. Now show me substitution jutsu. Daisuki weaved hand signs and substituted himself with a log of wood placed in the class. He was even better at this jutsu than the transformation jutsu. Hachiro nodded once again and said, Now create clones. Daisuki weaved hand signs and three clones appeared next to him. Hachiro was surprised. He said, Good work. I can tell that you have worked hard in the last few months. Daisuki replied, Thank you, Sensei. It is all because you were such a good teacher. Daisuki didn't have any reluctance or shame in giving him the credit. He was aware that Hachiro would have a major say in his final marks and could influence which squad he would be assigned to and who his sensei will be. Hachiro was pleased by the praise. He said with a smile, You have passed the exam. Go back to your seat. 
Next, Anze Buncho. Daisuke returned while Buncho took his place. Just like Daisuke, Buncho too did the three jutsu perfectly. Hachiro was surprised once again. He wondered, both Daisuke and Buncho were struggling a lot a few months ago. I was sure that they would fail the exam. How did they suddenly improve so much? He looked at the other three orphans in the classroom and wondered, have these three improved as well? He called out Iri Ryoma next. Just like the ones before him, he too completed the three jutsus. Hachiro praised him as well and called out, next, Yuzuki Tatsuya. Tatsuya walked up to the front. Like others, he too performed all the three jutsus. This time, Hachiro wasn't surprised, but he was very curious about how they improved so suddenly. He said, good, you have passed the exam as well. Next. However, Tatsuya interrupted him, Sensei, I have a question. Hachiro looked at him and said, ask. Tatsuya asked, can I perform other jutsus to improve my score even further? Hachiro was surprised. He nodded and said, sure, go ahead. However, he thought, what is going on? Not only has he mastered the three jutsus, but even mastered more? A frown formed on his face, I already sent all the talented people from my class to the elite batch. Did I misjudge their talent? No, they definitely weren't this good half a year ago. Tatsuya's question also surprised the kids in the classroom. They didn't expect Tatsuya to learn a new jutsu in addition to learning the three required jutsus. After all, most of them had a hard time mastering those three basic jutsus. Daisuke, Buncho, and Ryoma especially stared at him. Despite being close friends, they weren't aware that Tatsuya learned another jutsu. Tatsuya weaved hand signs and pointed a finger at the log of wood. Fire release, one jutsu. A fire ray was released from the tip of his finger and landed on the wood. Soon, smoke appeared from the point of contact and after a few seconds, it caught fire. Hachiro quickly made a move and doused the fire. At the same time, the entire class looked at Tatsuya in awe. Among the 50 students who took the exam, he was the only one to perform another jutsu. Hachiro patted Tatsuya's shoulder and praised, Great work, Tatsuya. This will improve your score a lot. Do you have any other jutsu you want to show? Tatsuya shook his head and said, I have just learned one jutsu so far, Sensei. I am also training in fire release, two jutsu, but I haven't learned it yet. Hachiro said, That is a rank D jutsu. You will need some time to learn it. But it's good that you have taken the initiative to learn by yourself. Keep working hard. Tatsuya excitedly said, Yes, Sensei. Tatsuya returned to his seat as everyone stared at him. He felt very pleased with himself. Hachiro called out, Next, hand a Bunjiro. Bunjiro walked to the front. He was very pumped after seeing Tatsuya's performance. He performed the three jutsus and said, Sensei, I also want to perform another jutsu. Hachiro didn't show his surprise and allowed him. Bunjiro quickly weaved hand signs. Water release, water pellet jutsu. He spat a bullet made of water at the log of the wood. It hit the spot Tatsuya had burned earlier and pierced eight inches into the log. This time, Hachiro couldn't hide his surprise. He thought, that was a rank D jutsu. Though the piercing power of his jutsu was only because of the damage Tatsuya did to the log, the fact that he could aim it on point is even more amazing. He should have excellent chakra control and aim to do so. Hachiro's gaze towards Bunjiro changed. He praised him a lot before sending him back. He looked at the class and said, It is already noon. We will take a 30-minute break for lunch. As soon as he and the other teachers exited the room, Tatsuya and Bunjiro were surrounded by their classmates. In a matter of minutes, they had become the most popular kids in the classroom. Only Daisuke, Buncho, and Ryoma were upset and had a look of jealousy on their face. Fujin's analysis regarding the five orphans was on point. As he had speculated, there were slackers and hard workers in this group. Daisuke, 
Buncho and Ryoma stopped training right after they learned the three jutsus and could perform them without failing even once. They spent their time relaxing and playing. On the other hand, Tatsuya and Bunjiro checked their nature affinity and chose jutsus to learn from the library. As a result, they made much higher progress as compared to the other three. Without the requirement of having to wait for everyone else to finish in order to visit Fujin, the differences became visible immediately. And in the future, these differences would expand further and break their little circle of friends. Daisuke would convince Buncho and Ryoma with his silver tongue and they would accuse Tatsuya and Bunjiro for training in secret and not hanging out with them. It would result in an argument that would end their six-year-old friendship. While Tatsuya and Bunjiro were getting all the attention, Hachiro walked with a frown on his mouth as he wondered, how did these five improve so suddenly? It's unnatural. And they don't have any family members to guide them either. Though Daisuke praised me, I didn't have anything to do with their progress. He analyzed a lot before having a bad feeling. He thought, don't tell me that they are spies planted by other villages. After all, brainwashing young kids and sending them to other villages as a spy is done quite frequently. Though we do a background check, it isn't foolproof. I need to inform Lord Hokage. He quickly hurried to the Hokage's office. Chapter 242 Hiruzen had just returned to his office after giving the speech. He was about to get back to paperwork when Hachiro knocked on the door. Hachiro entered after receiving permission and greeted Hiruzen politely. Hiruzen asked, shouldn't you be conducting the exam? Why are you here? Hachiro replied, I gave the students a lunch break. I am here because I noticed something suspicious that didn't make much sense. So I wanted to inform you. Hiruzen asked, What did you notice? Hachiro informed him, My class has five orphans who always hang out together. Until a few months ago, I was sure that they would fail. But today, all five of them performed all the three jutsus perfectly. A couple of them even performed elemental jutsus. A look of surprise appeared on Hiruzen's face. He said, That's good. I didn't expect that we would have anyone outside the elite classrooms to learn elemental jutsus. Hachiro replied, Me neither. That is why I am suspicious. However, Hiruzen wasn't worried. He asked, What are their names? Hachiro reported their names. Hiruzen nodded. The names were as he expected. He said, These five had approached Suzuki Fujin a few months ago for guidance and were tutored by him. That is probably why they progressed so quickly. You don't need to worry, but feel free to conduct a background check if you want to. Hachiro was surprised. He asked, Is Fujin the one who graduated a couple of years ago at the top of his class? Hiruza nodded and said, A few of them were in the same orphanage. Hachiro realized. He quickly thanked Hiruza for providing the info and left. Hiruza thought, That boy keeps on giving me surprises. I didn't expect him to be good at teaching as well. Still, from my reports, he spent very little time with them. How did they improve so quickly? Hiruzen wondered for a couple of minutes before stopping. He shook his head and thought, it isn't important how you manage that. The important fact is that he did. From Hachiro's words, those five children would have entered the Jinin Reserve Force and wouldn't have achieved anything else. But now, since two managed to learn elemental jutsus, it's safe to say that those two will at least become chunins. If they work hard or have good luck, they might even become a jounin. After all, though it might not seem much to learn an elemental jutsu at the age of 12, the fact is that they made the progress in just a few months. If they could maintain that zeal for a few years, it'd be great. Regardless, this is a great achievement for Fujin. Hiruzen was very impressed with what Fujin did. The act of training five children in a village that has thousands of ninjas might seem insignificant. But from Hiruzen's point of view, it was very significant. After all, there were hundreds of ninjas in Kanoha who could be considered veterans and were far more experienced than Fujin. If these ninjas also guided a few orphans or civilians in the academy and ensured that those kids reached the Chunin rank, Kanoha's strength would grow exponentially. Hiruzen thought, 
Initially, we didn't need any such training as all the clans would train their next generation with all their heart. But, after three great wars, the strength and numbers of the clan ninjas have severely dropped. Right now, the highest number of ninjas are from civilian families or orphans. It is unlikely that this would change in the future. However, these civilian students don't get the same level of guidance as the clan children. After all, there is no way a teacher can make a difference when teaching so many students who have different levels of talents in every different phi. Suddenly, Haruzen had an idea. He thought, wait, instead of just hoping that someone guides these kids, how about I start a mentorship program? Haruzen thought more about his idea and immediately began figuring out the details. In a couple of minutes, he decided, yes, this can be great. I will first make a list of ninjas that can provide good guidance. Then I will assign five students to each of them. They won't have to do anything actively. But once a month, they will have to spend a couple of hours with the students, solve their doubts and provide them with some guidance on how to proceed further and create a decent training plan for them. This way, we will be able to find all the hardworking or talented students that go under the radar. And I can even make some use of the retired ninjas who don't have anything to do. I could even ensure that most of such mentors are civilians or orphans themselves so that they would feel an emotional connection with the students and take them more seriously. Hiruzen saw Hataki Takao entering the office with a bunch of files. Takao said, Lord Hawk. However, Hiruzen interrupted him and instructed, Keep those files to the side and call Shikaku to meet me at this moment. Takao was surprised to see how impatient Haruzen sounded. He immediately placed the files in a corner and left. At the same time, Fujin, Teru and Kane were hiding in the village while keeping a watch. Every single one of them was pissed off. Half an hour earlier, Tsuyoshi brought Fujin, Terry and Kane to the streets of Kanoha. He looked at them and asked in a serious tone, Are you aware of where the new Kanoha prison is? The boys nodded. The old prison was close to the Echiha compound. The new one was built next to the torture and interrogation department. Tsuyoshi said, Since the Echiha massacre, the duties of policing the village have also fallen on the Umbu. Your first mission is to hide out of plain sight and keep a watch on the village. If any fight is happening, you should break it off. If a crime is taking place, stop it and arrest the criminal and escort him or her to the prison. If it isn't, then keep hiding. Don't show yourself unless a situation occurs. We will meet back in the same room at 8 p.m. After saying that, he flickered away. Fujin, Teru and Kane watched with dumbfounded expressions as their captain gave them the most boring of the jobs and ran away. Fujin immediately cursed, what the fuck? He looked at Teru and said, you said Umbu missions are thrilling. Teru was left speechless. Kane sighed and said, I had heard that all Akimichi clan members are polite, straightforward and kind-hearted. It looks like it isn't correct. The group was still shocked at how seriously Tsuyoshi had informed them about the mission and ran away before they could react. Teru said in a dejected tone, I didn't know that Umbu were also given the duty of policing the streets. No wonder Lord Hokage recruited so many new Umbu. It looks like the newbies will be made to police the village until the training is done. Fujin said with a sigh, I never expected that I'd say that the bandit extermination missions were more interesting. Seeing that Fujin and Teru were dejected, Kane, being the oldest one in the group, took responsibility and said, All right, that's enough brooding. Though the mission is boring, we should still do it seriously. It would be the worst if we do a bad job and they make us keep doing this mission as a punishment. Teru looked at him and said, on the contrary, they might permanently put us in charge of policing if we do a very good job. Kane's eyes twitched. He said, stop behaving like kids and keep a watch seriously. Fujin looked at him with a deadpan expression and said, we are watching over civilians. Why are you talking as if two S-rank ninjas are going to clash in this street in the next couple of seconds? Kane was left speechless. Though he tried to instill seriousness, Fujin was on point. They didn't need to be serious while watching over civilians. At the same moment, all three stared at the street and kept staring for a few seconds. 
However, nothing happened. Terra sighed and said, You suck at jinxing, Fujin. Looks like we will have a boring day. Fujin sighed as well, yeah. Leave it. Let's take our positions. The trio stopped complaining and took their positions. They kept an eye on the surroundings while staying hidden. None of them was very serious as the job was too easy and boring. Fujin wondered, now, what to do? After thinking for a bit, he made a hand sign. Shadow Clone Jutsu He used the Jutsu thrice and created three clones. Two clones had 10% of his maximum chakra while the third had 40% of his chakra. The clone with the maximum chakra moved to the 23rd training ground. He continued his training of modifying his jutsus with yin and yang chakra and relearning them. Meanwhile, the remaining two clones went to the library. Fujin analyzed, the chances of any incident happening is low. Even if it does, the involved parties should be very weak. I will keep 40% of my chakra with me in case of an emergency. As long as nothing happens, my chakra will regenerate throughout the day. Meanwhile, one clone will keep modifying my jutsus. And the other two clones will begin training in fire manipulation. If we receive the same mission tomorrow as well, then I will begin training in fire manipulation seriously while keeping an eye as well. Fujin let out a chuckle as he realized, I expected to receive some very difficult missions in Umbu. To think that I would get a rank D mission like when I became a Jinin and that I would sneakily train an element as I did during the academy days. Life is strange, ha ha ha. Anyways, this is good too. Though it will take a bit longer now, I will still manage to modify all my jutsus in a few months. And I also learn fire release jutsus. That should improve my combination of jutsus with the summons considerably. It'd be best if I can complete all of that before having to go on the deadly missions. Just like Fujin, Around 80 other Umbu ninjas were keeping an eye on the village. 90% of them were inducted into the Umbu on that day. Though their excitement was doused as well, the fire lit by Haruzen still existed in their hearts. Like Fujin, they too began thinking about the ways they could get stronger. In the following period of peace, their strength would grow rapidly. And along with them, Kanoha too would close its chapter of weakness and revive its military might. Chapter 243, The Land of Waterfall The Land of Waterfall was a country filled with mountains, rivers, and waterfalls. Due to the same reason, it also had various valleys which added to the beautiful scenery of the country. In one such unnamed valley was a secret base. Twelve ninjas were busy staring at a map and making plans. All twelve ninjas had hidden their faces using demon-faced masks. After some time, a ninja pointed at a spot on the map and said, Captain, according to our information, Lord Idoyuya and his entourage have already crossed the border. They will cross this bridge in around two hours. The captain nodded. He didn't make any decision. A ninja standing next to him said in a soft voice, Yes, but he is guarded by Hara Yudo. Even with us twelve acting together, defeating him will be difficult. He is an expert at water release. He could defend the noble Yuya and counterattack at the same time. The captain nodded grimly and said, Yudo was away on a secret mission for a long time. I didn't expect him to return along with Yuya. It complicates our situation. Suddenly, a snort was heard. The twelve ninjas looked towards the source of the sound. Two more masked ninjas were sitting in the cave as well. One was wearing an elephant mask while the other was wearing a red ape mask. The ape mask ninja scolded, What are you afraid of with us here? Do your attack as planned. We will sneak attack Hare Yudo and kill him. Even if he is an expert in water release, it is weak against our earth release. The mission will go as planned. The captain looked at him and nodded, With your assurance, I can rest assured. He looked at his subordinates and said with determination in his voice, Our Kawaguchi family has been suppressed by the Ito family for far too long. Today, with the aid of our friend from Awabakure, we will eliminate their successor and their strongest guardian. With this first step, our family will rise up steadily and take control of the northwestern area of our country. 
His words sent a wave of excitement through his subordinates. They all shouted in excitement, Yes, Captain. The umbu from IWA saw their excitement and sniggered secretly. They thought, What fools! Getting excited about ruling just one small part of this small rural country. However, they didn't say anything. Their orders were to slowly expand Iwabakur's influence in Takigakur. If they succeed, then in the next war, Iwabakur could attack the land of fire through three countries without having to face much resistance. It would force Kanoha's forces to spread too thin. After all, Kanoha's location meant that it would have to defend against all four major villages. The captain began laying out the plans. He set a few pieces on the map and said, we will set up our ambush just away from this bridge. This place doesn't have any water bodies close by, so Yua's water manipulation will be restricted. After we kill them, we will burn their bodies and dump them close to the land of fire. We will plant some pieces of evidence that they were attacked by Kanoha who retreated after killing them. This way, no suspicion will be cast upon us and Lord Daimyo will restrict the country's dealings with the land of fire. Everyone nodded. The Umbu ninjas from Iwabakur were also satisfied with the plan. The captain looked at their satisfaction and sighed in relief. Though their family had ambitions, they definitely didn't have the power to lord over one region. It was only due to the support from Iwabakur that they had the guts to make such a plan. So he had to ensure that the IWA Umbu were satisfied. With the preparations made, they set off immediately. They moved out of the valley and moved rapidly and stealthily on top of the trees. Within five minutes, they reached close to the spot where they were planning to set an ambush. Suddenly, one of the Awabakur Umbu shouted, Look out! His shout alerted everyone. However, even before they could raise their guard, they saw air bullets ripping through the trees to their right and coming straight at them. Their eyes widened. The bullets were too close to move away. One ninja was too close to the air bullets. Even before he could see them, an air bullet pierced through his head and he dropped dead. The others watched the air bullets and reacted however they could. Some bent forward for the bullets to pass from above while some gathered chakra in their feet and stamped their legs on the ground to stop themselves and saw the bullets pass in front of their eyes. However, some air bullets still pierced through the limbs of a couple of ninjas. The Iwabakir ninjas frowned. Their plan was perfect. They didn't expect to be ambushed. Immediately, all the remaining eleven Takigakir ninjas and two Iwabakir Umbu looked angrily at the spot from where air bullets were fired at them. However, they couldn't sense anyone. Suddenly, the bare-masked IWA Umbu slammed his hands on the ground. Earth release, Earth Dome Jutsu. An Earth Dome appeared from the ground and began surrounding all of them. The Takigakir ninjas watched with eyes widened as they saw a strong windstorm coming at them from the opposite direction. Luckily, the earth dome was formed in time. The strong wind currents hit the dome and caused tremors to pass through the dome. Dust began falling inside the dome due to those tremors. However, the dome didn't collapse. Sweat formed behind the masks of Takigakir ninjas. The captain gulped and said, Luckily you noticed the attack. However, the Iwabakur Umbu ninjas were still frowning. The Abe Mast Umbu said, Be careful. I can't sense the attacker. He could be very stro. Suddenly, his body moved out of the way instinctively. A hole appeared in the dome and a very strong bullet made of wind pierced into the dome. The bullet hit the side of his jacket and left a cut along the sides of his abdomen. At the same time, nine more vacuum bullets pierced into the earth dome. Unlike the war-hardened Iwabakir Umbu, the ninjas from Takigakir didn't have the same survival instincts. Five vacuum bullets pierced through the vital organs of the Takigakir ninjas. The remaining bullets could only leave some cuts on the bodies of the remaining ninjas. The Takigakir ninjas were horrified and left tongue-tied. The captain's heart ached as he saw the dead ninjas and thought, we worked so hard to raise them to Chunin level. The family spent countless resources on them. But in less than a minute, more than half of them are dead? Fear could be seen on his face. The Iwabakur Umbu noticed their emotions and frowned. 
At the same time, they were on guard due to how brutal and efficient their opponent was. The elephant-masked IWA Umbu once again slammed his hands on the ground while thinking, we can't stay hidden here if the dome can't protect us. We will just be sitting ducks. Small spikes began appearing on the surface of the Earth Dome. The spikes were launched in all directions as the Earth Dome collapsed. The spikes buried themselves in the trees but didn't hit their attacker. They watched with frowns on their face as they still couldn't find who attacked them. The Abe Mass Tumbu instructed, Keep an eye in all directions. I will find that bastard. He weaved hand signs and slammed his hands on the ground. Earth release, earth sensing jutsu. A vibration was sent through the ground. Every animal who was in a 1.5 kilometer radius felt the vibration passing under their feet. They quickly began running away from the point of impact. Despite the large scale of vibration, the umbu still didn't sense anyone. A frown formed on his face. He snorted and put more chakra into the ground. The vibrations intensified. The Takigakir ninjas could feel the ground shaking under their feet. The vibrations were so strong that they even traveled up the tree trunks. On one such tree, the vibrations were felt under the feet of a masked ninja hiding there. A smile formed behind the mask of the Abe Masked Umbu as he muttered, Got him. At the next moment, giant spears formed under the tree and launched at the ninja hiding on it. However, the ninja immediately flickered away. But since the IWA ninjas had already sensed him, they didn't allow him to disappear from their sight once again. They, along with the Takigakir ninjas, gave chase. The attacker noticed it and sighed, Looks like I can't sneak attack anymore. He looked towards the ninjas chasing him and launched a couple of dozen air bullets. The IWA and Taki ninjas saw the attack and dodged it with ease. Due to the distance between them and since they knew the attack was coming, it was much easier to dodge. However, using that short moment of distraction, the ninja disappeared once again. The ape masked ninja frowned and quickly began feeling the vibrations under his feet. Suddenly, he turned around and shouted, Behind us. All the ninjas quickly turned around. To their surprise, the attacker was very close. The Taki ninja who was the farthest in the back watched the attacker swing his sword at him. The scenes of his comrades falling dead ran through his brain. In a rage, he grabbed his kunai and swung it at the attacker's sword and yelled, Die! At the same time, the others grabbed their kunai to attack him. They planned to kill him when he was blocked. However, they watched with widened eyes as the sword cut through the kunai as if it was air. The sword beheaded the seventh Taki ninja. The eyes of the remaining five Taki ninjas went red in rage. They tried to attack, but the attacker flickered on a branch behind him. The IWA Umbu finally got a good look at the ninja. The attacker was a well-built young ninja who was wearing a hawk mask. In addition, he had two swords hanging on the right side of his waist. And the sword sheaths on both those swords were very exquisite. Swirling designs were etched into its glossy black lacquer. They immediately recognized him and their expressions became grim behind their masks. The Taki ninjas were enraged. They were about to attack when the elephant masked Umbu said in a grim voice, It is the spectral swordsman. The Taki ninjas suddenly stopped. Their expressions became grim. Horror could be seen in their eyes. They watched their attacker as if he was the Grim Reaper himself. Chapter 244 the five Taki ninjas stared at the spectral swordsman in front of them and gulped. His information began running through their mind. It was around six months ago when murmurs of a swordsman were being heard. It was said that he appeared and disappeared at will. It was said that his victims wouldn't even know when they were dead until they saw their headless bodies with their detached heads. According to the rumors, there were two features that were identified with the spectral swordsman. They were the hawk mask he wore and two exquisite swords hanging on the right side of his waist. The swordsman was soon called the Spectral Swordsman. Among the minor villages, he was a menace. There were no records of anyone stopping him. Even against the major villages, his record was very good. He would eliminate his target and escape long before any reinforcements could arrive. He was so efficient 
that it took over six months for someone to actually see him in action. As soon as he was seen, rumors of his appearance spread quickly throughout the ninja world. The ape mast Tumbu shouted, Don't be shocked by his reputation. He is just one guy. Stay and fight together. Keep an eye out for his sneak attacks. His words snapped everyone from their shock. They prepared themselves for an intense fight. Chakra flowed through the sword of the spectral swordsman as he swung it towards the seven ninjas. A windstorm consisting of hundreds of sword slashes immediately engulfed the group. The two IWA Umbu ninjas immediately slammed their hands on the ground. Earth release, multiple earth walls jutsu. Immediately, dozens of walls of varying sizes appeared from the ground. They surrounded them from multiple sides. Having experienced the vacuum bullets, they didn't want to lock themselves in without any room for escaping. The windstorm hit the walls and left multiple slashes in the walls. But once again, the walls stood. Behind the wall, the ape mass Tumbu shouted, Keep an eye out for those wind bullets. And counterattack once these winds die down. Even without his warning, everyone was as alert as they could be. The spectral swordsman noticed their defense. He opened his mouth and exhaled a horizontal wind wave. However, the core of this wind wave was made of vacuum. The vacuum wave hit the walls and cut through them with ease. The enemy ninjas saw the wave and immediately jumped high up to dodge the wave. The wave safely passed from under them and cut off a bunch of trees before leaving a deep scar on the ground. However, their troubles weren't over. As soon as they jumped to dodge the attack, the swordsman flickered next to them. They watched in horror as he swung his sword once again. The one closest to him had no chance of dodging. His neck was sent flying in the air. Worse, the sword also sent a flying slash towards the rest of them. Three more Taki ninjas couldn't dodge or use any defensive jutsus and died to the slash. Only the Taki captain and the two IWA Umbu were able to move out of the way. The IWA ninjas quickly got back on the ground while leading hand signs. Elephant Mast Umbu slammed his hands on the ground. Earth Release, Mud River Jutsu The ground in front of him turned into mud and flowed towards the swordsman at a high speed. At the same time, the Abe Mast Umbu completed his jutsu. Fire Release, Fire Dragon Jutsu he spat a fire dragon into the mud river. Both jutsus combined seamlessly and moved towards the swordsman ferociously. However, the swordsman just flickered out of the way and once again moved to their rear and attacked with his sword. The Taki captain saw his actions. He thought, I can't let him swing his sword anymore. Or even I might die here. He weaved signs and spat a water jet at the swordsman to force him back. However, Instead of dodging, the swordsman exhaled a vacuum cannon into the water jet. The jutsu overwhelmed the water jet and ripped straight through it at a rapid speed. The Taki captain didn't expect such a response and was caught off guard. He barely managed to move to his right. Unfortunately, the jutsu was too fast and much larger than the earlier bullets. The cannon hit the left side of his chest and tore it from his body entirely. Even his heart was destroyed. He fell to the ground with his eyes wide open and full of terror and shock. The sight sent a shiver down the spines of the IWA Umbu. However, they didn't let it affect them and attacked the swordsman immediately. This time, his position was pelted by hundreds of sharp spikes. However, he still flickered away. The Abe Mast Umbu cursed, slippery bastard. However, suddenly their eyes widened. Both looked to their left. A blue arrow of lightning was piercing through everything in its path and approaching them at an insane speed. They immediately tried to jump out of the way but tripped and fell down. In a panic, they looked at their feet. They were shocked to see that their feet were stuck in the ground. Shock appeared on their faces as they couldn't believe that they were trapped using the element they were most proficient in. The lightning arrow reached them and exploded. Both their bodies were zapped mercilessly. A miserable scream exited their mouth. After a few seconds, the lightning dispersed. The scent of their burnt flesh could be smelled. However, they were still alive and barely stood on their feet. The lightning had got rid of the trap under their feet. 
Unfortunately, the swordsman appeared behind them and beheaded them both with a single swing of his sword. All fourteen ninjas were killed. The swordsman looked at the dead ninjas and thought, it doesn't matter how many times it happens, your intelligence still shocks me, Shikaku. He looked up to see a turtle masked Umbu appearing from the ground. He was the one who trapped their feet. Turtle sighed and said, Your speed keeps amazing me, Hawk. It's as if you get faster every day. The victory was overwhelming. And the major reason for such an overwhelming victory was his speed. He dodged every attack and always had the initiative whenever he decided to attack. At times, his enemies didn't even have the time to form a jutsu. Hawk replied, they were at most chunins. Only these two were better. Still, they weren't strong enough. Turtle muttered to himself, do you have to keep saying that every time? Besides, you are also a chunin. Soon after, a bear-masked and a fox-masked umbu appeared from the direction from where the lightning arrow was shot. Kuma observed the surroundings and said, great work as usual, Hawk. Hawk nodded and asked, I didn't sense anyone else other than these guys. So is this mission over? Kuma nodded. We checked the perimeter and didn't find anyone else. There shouldn't be any more danger for Yuya. And if something does happen, he still has Yudo protecting him. In any case, this was the only attack that the commander predicted. It isn't our job to keep protecting them until they reach their home. Hawk nodded. Of course, the commander who Kuma referred to was Kanoha's Jounin commander and not the Umbu commander. Shikaku had predicted that a move would be made against Ido Yuya, who had good relations with Kanoha. Hence, Kuma's Umbu unit was sent to eliminate the attackers and push the blame on a Wagakure. Kuma approached the dead bodies and instructed, Turtle, crush them with earth release. Make it look like they were killed by a Wagakure ninjas instead of a sword. Turtle nodded and got to work. In a few minutes, he changed how the wounds on everyone's bodies looked. He stabbed earth spears into the wounds made by the air and vacuum bullets. As for the ones that were beheaded, he crushed their bodies at the spot of the cut so that they wouldn't look like a clean cut. If anyone would see their bodies, it would be very unlikely that they could be traced back to the spectral swordsman. Hawk inspected the bodies and nodded in satisfaction. The truth is that he had done many more killings than he was given credit for. However, most of them were hidden due to Turtle's methods. So he was looked at as more of a fable rather than a bloodthirsty killer. After planting some fake evidence, Turtle buried all the bodies in the ground and they left without speaking another word and began returning to Kanoha. They returned back to their quarters in the Umbu. After removing their masks, Tsuyoshi said, Great work as usual. The mission was completed without a hitch. He looked at Fujin and said with a smile, Fujin, over the last twenty months, your performance has been brilliant. Lord Hokage has acknowledged your performance and asked you to meet him tomorrow. His praise for Fujin wasn't unjustified. Fujin had fit into the Umbu unit like a glove and seamlessly blended into the Umbu lifestyle. He was efficient, deadly, and didn't seek fame or glory. Despite having a famous title, very few in Kanoha knew that it was him. Kane and Tara's eyes widened as they realized what Tsuyoshi meant. Fujin nodded and said with a smile, all right. Teru immediately patted Fujin's shoulder and said in excitement, congrats, Fujin. Chapter 245, Kane also realized why Fujin was called by the Hokage. He smiled and said, looks like you won the race for promotion to Umbu captain. He sighed and continued, makes sense though considering how many people you have killed. Your spectral swordsman title is very well known and feared. Tsuyoshi shook his head and said, the Umbu captain title isn't handed so easily. You will be given a promotion mission. The mission is usually very difficult. Only if you perform it satisfactorily will you be promoted. Anyways, no point in speculating about it. Take some rest today and ensure that you are at your complete readiness tomorrow. Fujin nodded and said, all right, captain. Thank you for all your guidance. The squad dispersed. Unlike the time with his Jinin squad, the Umbu squad never hung together other than when they were training or doing missions. 
Siyoshi had instructed them to not appear together in public while they were a part of the umbu. Due to this the trio of Fujin, Teru and Kin never went out together to eat or party despite being in the same team for over a year and a half. Fujin grabbed a random mask, put it on and walked out of the room while thinking, a secret mission, huh? I wonder what it will be. He thought for a bit and speculated, it will most probably be another political scheme by Shikaku. That guy makes way too many schemes. No wonder Kanoha's position is so solid despite being vulnerable militarily for so long. Anyways, it is still early morning. What should I do for the day? Just resting the entire day will be a waste. As he was thinking, he walked towards the training facilities of the Umbu. A grin formed on his face behind the mask. With his next step, his physical features transformed. His height increased to 6 feet 6 inches and his body became very slim. On his next step, his chakra signature transformed. It became heavy in Yin Chakra. If a sensor were to sense him, it would be very difficult to link him to Fujin. He kept walking nonchalantly to the training facilities. After arriving at the facility, he saw a few other umbu. Without exchanging words with anyone or attracting any attention, he walked towards the wind training rooms and entered one. His eyes immediately roamed through the room. All the seals in the room that were inscribed and hidden in the room became visible to him. Many of these seals were for inspection and spying. He acted as if he didn't notice any of them and sat in the center of the room and began meditating. Just like in the tower in the Forest of Death, these rooms also had elemental crystals. Fujin began absorbing the energy from the crystal. The room didn't initially have any methods of investigation and spying. But, shortly after Fujin entered the Umbu, he began using these rooms and his rate of absorbing the energy from wind crystals skyrocketed. He initially needed to meditate for four hours for twelve days to completely absorb all the energy in one wind crystal. But in a few months, he got used to absorbing energy from the wind crystal. He began exhausting an entire crystal in one meditation session of four hours. This development alarmed Haruzen. Wind crystals used to be the ones that used to be the slowest to be exhausted. But suddenly, its rate of absorption became second to only fire crystals. He immediately tried to investigate but didn't find anything. So he resorted to inscribing seals in the wind training rooms. Unfortunately, Fujin was a seal master as well. He easily identified the seals and played around with them. Hiruzen couldn't figure out how the crystal was getting absorbed so quickly. Numerous times, he also sent some umbu to spy on the meditation rooms. But in that case, Fujin would absorb very little energy from the wind crystal. Due to this, no one could blame him. Instead, the Umbu ninjas that were keeping an eye became his perfect alibi. Of course, Hiruzen did suspect him. After all, the number of wind users was very low in Kanoha. After failing to find any suspect, he thought very hard, the absorption rate of wind crystals increased suddenly after the new Umbu were inducted. Of those 234, only 5 specialize in wind release. But, I can't disregard others or the older Umbu as it is possible that they are developing wind as their second or third element. Finally, Haruzen gave up, leave it. Even if I find the culprit, I can't punish them or tell them to stop. Otherwise, everyone else will begin questioning the speech I gave to motivate them. Besides, even though the usage is high, we do have a good stock of wind crystals. It is still within an acceptable range. Since he joined the Umbu, Fujin alone used up around 250 wind crystals. He had successfully used up all the money Haruzen earned by gambling on him and was still collecting interest. The overall consumption of wind crystals during this period was over 400. It barely exceeded earth and water crystals which were in the range of 350 to 400. Of course, fire crystals were still the ones being used the most. The Umbu training facility used over 1,500 fire crystals every year. Due to the sudden increase in Umbu numbers, Hiruzen ran out of fire crystals a few times. If not for the fact that the Echiha clan no longer existed and he could divert the fire crystals that used to be allotted to them, he would have been forced to apply restrictions on the fire training rooms. 
Other than the wind crystals, Fujin also absorbed energy from lightning, fire, and earth crystals. However, his rate of absorption with them was very low. His rate of absorbing wind energy kept increasing rapidly until he hit a limit. But his other elements didn't experience such an increase in the rate of absorption and he reached their limits much sooner. Fujin had expected such a result from fire and earth crystals but he was disappointed when he couldn't increase the speed of absorption from lightning crystals. Of course, despite the slower rate of absorption, it was still very helpful in improving his affinity with those elements. In around three and a half hours, Fujin emptied the wind crystal. He got up and went into a lightning training room. These rooms didn't have the same level of investigative seals. The seals in the wind training room didn't detect that the crystal was empty until another Umbu visited to train his wind element and realized that it was empty. Fujin spent most of his day in the training facility and only returned home late at night. He had dinner and went to sleep. The next day, he once again began his morning with an intense morning workout. Unless he was out on a mission, Fujin never missed his morning workout for even a single day. Instead, his morning workout had gotten even more intense. He had managed to use his previous training seal at its 100% capacity. He created a new seal for himself that had a maximum limit four times higher than the seal Haruzen had created for him. Fujin returned home after the workout and freshened up for the meeting with Haruzen. While getting prepared, he took a look at his bracers and thought, I have been using these bracers since I became a jinin. Time to change it. He took off his bracers. A grin formed on his face as he thought, the spectral swordsman identity has become too well known. All the Umbu ninjas from the four major villages identify me on sight. Even though they don't know about most of my capabilities, it is annoying when they get on full alert and don't provide any openings. It's time to play that card. He discarded his old bracers and put on new ones. Unlike his previous ones, these were very thin and of the same color as his skin. So from a distance, it was very difficult to spot them. In addition, he had inscribed dozens of small storage seals on each bracer and stored a variety of weapons in it. His chakra metal swords were also stored in the bracers. Of course, despite being very thin, they were much harder than his previous bracers as they used better metals and Fujin himself worked with the blacksmith to inscribe seals into them to make them as tough as he could. With all preparations made, he placed the seal on his door and flickered towards the Hokage building. Chapter 246 Fujin knocked and entered the Hokage's office. He noticed that Shikaku was also in the room. However, apart from them, no one else was in the room. Even the four Umbu ninjas that usually guarded Haruzen weren't there. Haruzen smiled and asked, Fujin, how have you been? He noticed the new bracers Fujin was wearing and immediately noticed the high number of seals inscribed in them. He looked into Fujin's eyes and meaningfully said, Good bracers. Fujin ignored the gaze and the implications behind his words. He replied with a smile, Thank you, Grandpa. I have been well. Hiruzen had gotten used to Fujin ignoring subtle messages. He said, Your performance in the Umbu has been very good. Both Siyoshi and the Umbu commander have recommended me for promoting you to the Umbu captain rank. However, the Umbu captain rank is equivalent to the Jounin rank. So to become one, you have to complete a promotion mission. Fujin nodded and said, Yes, captain informed me. Hiruzen looked at Shikaku. Shikaku stepped forward and handed a scroll to Fujin and said, Recently, we have been getting multiple strange reports from the Land of Wind. We suspect that Sunagakir wants to end the alliance with us while the daimyo of the Land of Wind doesn't. Your mission will be to infiltrate into the Land of Wind and cause discontent for Sunagakir among their nobles and make them more inclined to assign missions to Kanoha. The scroll has multiple scrolls with details of all the nobles in the Land of Wind, their nature, likes, dislikes, the people precious to them and their current relations with us and Suna along with some recommendations for you. You will act on your own and are free to do whatever you want to make progress in the mission. Just don't let anyone know that you are from Kanoha. Fujin furrowed his eyebrows. The mission was huge. Though he had grown stronger, 
his strength wasn't at a level where he could casually influence the relations between a daimyo and a kage. Hiruzen and Shikaku noticed his expressions but didn't say anything. Fujin said, The mission is too difficult. Though I could make some moves, I am sure that Suno will retaliate immediately. So my actions won't make much of a difference. Shikaku nodded and said, Yes, but you don't need to worry. You aren't the only one we have sent. Many other Umbu ninjas have been given the same promotion mission. So the attention from Sanagakir will be divided among all of you. Of course, if you think that you can't continue the mission anymore, you are allowed to retreat. In addition, be careful of who you kill as the Umbu ninjas we deployed will be under disguises. A frown formed on Fujin's face. The mission was not only difficult but it also had several complexities. He sighed and thought, despite the training, most of my missions in the Umbu were straightforward assassination, elimination, or protection missions. I guess that Hiruzen wanted me to focus on those skills. Looks like my guess was wrong. This mission will be a pain in the ass. Fujin asked, how long do I have to stay there? Shikaku replied, as long as you can. Retreat when you think that your cover might be blown or you don't think you can make any further progress towards the mission. The success or failure of the mission will be decided by how long you manage to stay in the land of wind and the result of your actions there. Fujin digested the information. Shikaku asked, any more questions? Fujin shook his head and said, no. But I would like to have the attire of a sand umbu ninja along with a new mask that is popular among their ranks. Shikaku had expected such a request from Fujin. He handed Fujin another scroll and said, This scroll has what you asked for. It also has enough ration bars and water to last half a year. Fujin accepted the scroll. At the same time, he got an idea of how long he was expected to stay undercover in the land of wind. Shikaku asked, Are you ready to move out or do you need some time to prepare? Fujin replied, I can move out right away. Shikaku nodded and said, Good. We have one more mission for you. This one isn't related to your promotion mission, but a good performance could influence our decision if your performance in the Land of Wind is subpar. Fujin looked at Shikaku without changing his expression and thought, Do you still not know that such manipulation tactics don't work on me? Shikaku obviously knew it. He had interacted several times with Fujin but he was just too lazy to change his ways for just one person. From his point of view, regardless of how he spoke, Fujin would act the same way. So he didn't bother changing his dialogue. Shikaku said, In recent times, we have noticed the movement of some bounty hunter rogue ninjas in the forests around our village. I speculate that they have an accomplice in the village who monitors the movements of ninjas and informs his group outside the village. We tried trapping them but haven't had any success so far as they are very careful with their targets. Hiruzen added, You haven't been seen much since a bounty was put on your head as your umbu achievements haven't been credited to you yet. So you will be the perfect bait for them. Go through the village gate without any disguise and let them see you. Hopefully, they will think of you as the perfect target and ambush you outside the village. We will send a Jounin squad to follow you stealthily from a distance. They will reinforce you as soon as the battle begins or you send a signal. Fujin thought for a few seconds and said, All right. Do we have any intel on who the rogue bounty hunters are? Hiruzen shook his head. We have eliminated one group who had rogue ninjas from IWA, but they didn't have any intel on others. According to our calculations, there are three more groups. Fujin said, Okay. I will move out now. He left the office and began walking casually towards the village gate while thinking, Bounty Hunters. I haven't encountered any in this world other than Kakuzu. Anyways, as long as he or any other s rank ninjas aren't involved, I should be fine. If they are weak, I can eliminate them myself. Otherwise, I will just have to stall them. Fujin reached the gate and felt a few eyes on himself. He analyzed, hmm. Though there are a bunch of eyes on me, it will be difficult to say who is with the bounty hunters. After all, there are always a bunch of eyes on the village gate. Oh well, let's see. As soon as Fujin left the village, two pairs of eyes sparkled in greed. 
One of these pairs belonged to a man in his twenties with an ordinary appearance and was operating a firework shop near the village gate. He observed the direction in which Fujin left and couldn't help but lick his lips. He thought, when we made a list of the good targets, this boy topped it. Who knows which gods he offended to get such a big bounty. Unfortunately, this coward didn't leave the village for so long. But finally, it's time. The man looked at a stall opposite his. The man in that stall also looked back at him. Their eyes met. Both quickly used their methods to inform their respective groups. However, unknown to both of them, one squad of Jounans left the village secretly and followed Fujin from a few kilometers away. If either of the two bounty hunter groups knew about the existence of these ninjas, they wouldn't dare to approach Fujin even if their courage was amplified a hundred times. After all, this group was led by Kanoha's newest elite Jounin, Kapi Ninja Kakashi. Fujin didn't sense Kakashi's squad. However, he wasn't surprised as he wouldn't be good bait if they could be sensed so easily. He continued traveling through the woods as if everything was normal, but he didn't move at his max speed to not create any doubts in the minds of the bounty hunters. Two groups of bounty hunters quickly moved towards the route from Kanoha to the Land of Rain. The first group was made of rogue ninjas from Kirigakure. They excelled in assassination. Their group contained eleven ninjas. Before betraying, eight were Chunins and Kiri while the remaining three were Jounins. The second group was made of rogue ninjas from the countries of lands of rain, river, grass, bird, and bear. This group had twenty-four people, eleven of whom were Jounins in their village before they went rogue. Both reached the same spot on the route at the same time and got into a standoff. After all, their messengers had also informed them that another group of bounty hunters might also be hunting Fujin and neither wanted the other group to get to Fujin first. Chapter 247 The Two Groups of Bounty Hunters Stared at Each Other Suddenly, Kidoshiro, one of the Kiri rogues, sighed in relief and said loudly, Thankfully we found them. I was worried that these morons might ambush him closer to Kanoha and steal our jackpot. His statement irked the bounty hunters and the other group. One of them sneered and said, Aren't you being too cocky? We outnumber you by more than two to one. Do you think you have a chance to compete against us? The leader of the Kiri robes grinned. His name was Higashi Renzo. He was a large muscular guy with hideous scars all over his body. He was being trained to be the next generation of the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist. Unfortunately, before he could complete his training, everything went crazy in that country. Renzo said in a hoarse voice, You may outnumber us, but do you weaklings think you have any chance against us? A wave of killing intent washed over the other group of bounty hunters. Their expressions became very grim. Though they haven't ever experienced it, Kiri's cruel methods and the craziness of their ninjas were well known throughout the world. Ogawa Shingo, the leader of this group, exerted his chakra to snap his comrades out of the killing intent unleashed by his opponent. The Kiri ninjas were about to attack, but he raised his hand and said, Stop. If we fight here, we will alert the Kanoha ninjas and will be hunted until we are all dead. Even if you are strong against Kanoha, you are nothing but bugs. Not only will you not get the bounty, but you will be hunted. So why not team up? We will ambush the kid together and split the reward on his head. We will each get 10 million Rio and won't have to fight each other to death. Shiro immediately said, Why would we split the rewards with you? As for Kanoha ninjas, we will have long killed you all and that brat and left even before those tree huggers since something is row. He was interrupted by a Jounin who said, Shut up. Rinzo, let's cooperate. The Kanoha ninjas are already hunting for us. A huge battle could invite all sorts of trouble. Rinzo wanted to fight. However, he couldn't disregard the concerns of the Jounin who just spoke. After all, he was the only seal master in their group and was his second in command. Without his help, bounty hunting would become much more risky. Rinzo looked at Shingo and said, All right, let's team up. The two groups teamed up and set up an ambush for Fujin. Fujin had a frown on his face. Even after traveling for six hours, no one intercepted or attacked him. He thought, 
Did they sense the trap that Shikaka laid for them? Or were their accomplices on a break when I left the village? He continued moving through the vast forests of the Land of Fire while occasionally activating and spreading his chakra field. Finally, after half an hour, he sensed something off. His speed slowed down as he maintained his chakra field and analyzed, I can't sense for locations. These guys have a seal master within their ranks. That's annoying. I can't check how strong they are. But this might not be entirely bad. Since they are separated, I will hunt them one by one. The four locations that Fujin's chakra field couldn't sense were small underground rooms constructed using earth release. If it was a normal sensor, he wouldn't feel anything off. But Fujin himself was a seal master. So it couldn't be hidden from him. The four locations were all spread properly. Two were close to the path that Fujin was taking, while the remaining two locations covered the left and the right sides. Fujin locked his eyes on the location to the left. He was about to move when he suddenly stopped. His eyes shrunk as his instincts warned him and he stayed in his location. He thought, why am I having such a bad feeling? It is almost comparable to the feeling I had when we fell into Darui's trap. During his time in Umbu, Fujin had developed an incredible sense of danger. His instincts would warn him every time he was about to fall in grave danger. Though he wasn't completely sure, Fujin speculated that it was a result of him gaining more experience and due to him using his sensing abilities hundreds of thousands of times. The seals in those hidden locations were more advanced than what Fujin had speculated. When his chakra field covered those locations, a few seals began emitting green light. The leader in each of the rooms frowned. They knew that Fujin was a sensor but didn't expect him to spread his chakra field deep in the forest. However, they didn't make a move as they knew that a sensor wouldn't be able to sense them. They expected Fujin to continue forward into their trap. However, their frowns deepened when Fujin didn't move forward and the seals kept emitting the green light. Renzo asked, Did he discover us? The seal master answered, That is unlikely. Unless he is a seal master himself or works closely with one. Renzo quickly analyzed the situation and said, It doesn't matter. He is just one Chunin brat. Let's go out and hunt him. He quickly broke the seal on the underground room and appeared outside. At the same time, the other three hideouts also received the message and soon they broke out as well. Fujin immediately sensed everyone and began sweating. He almost cursed, What the fuck? 35 fucking bounty hunters? And seven of them have jown in levels of chakra. The bounty hunters ran towards Fujin at full speed. Fortunately, Fujin was over a mile away from their location. He quickly ran backwards and made a few shadow clones while thinking, this is the last time I'm being the bait. The smartest man and the most experienced man my ass. If I didn't know them any better, I'd think that this is a scheme to kill me. For chakra fields extended towards Fujin and his clones and began sensing him. Fujin was left speechless once again. He cursed, seriously, what the hell? Seal masters, censors, such huge numbers. Don't tell me Akage is also hiding within their ranks. Fujin didn't know that two groups of bounty hunters were hunting him together. He'd have been confident of taking one group on by himself. But with the two groups working together, he didn't want to take much risk. Hiruzen and Shikaku also didn't predict that Fujin would lure two groups of bounty hunters. Otherwise, they would have sent more ninjas along with him. At the same time, Pakin said, Kakashi, 35 new sins have suddenly appeared. Kakashi's eyes widened as he exclaimed, 35? Pakin replied, yes. Fujin is running back in our direction but enemies are faster than him. They will reach him before us. Kakashi said, everyone, we will move at our fastest speed. Guy grinned and said loudly, 35 bounty hunters on your first mission as an elite Jounin. I'd expect nothing less from my eternal rival. Despite talking, he was the only one in the squad who was able to keep up with Kakashi's speed. Kakashi didn't pay attention to Guy's words as he was confused, didn't Shikaku say that Fujin was incredibly fast on his feet? How are they faster than him? 
Among the bounty hunters, one of the censors informed, his chakra has split into four. According to the intel, he knows the shadow clone Jutsu. I can't identify who is the real one. Renzo commanded, keep track of all four of them. If they split, we will also split and chase one each. Fujin's clones didn't split up. The bounty hunters moved incredibly fast and quickly caught up with Fujin. They still maintained the four groups. Two were trying to chase Fujin from the right and left while the remaining two were on his rear. The ones in the rear were led by Renzo and Shingo respectively. Fujin looked back at them and thought, all right, they are close enough. Fujin and his clones split into pairs of two and dispersed in opposite directions. This forced the two groups in his rear to split up and move towards the groups on their respective sides. The situation suddenly changed as now the groups on Fujin's two sides became the closest to him while the groups at his rear lagged behind. Fujin kept observing their positions. Soon, all four groups of bounty hunters and the two pairs of Fujin's clones were in a straight line, Fujin and his clones stopped and turned around. Fire release, searing migraine jutsu. Wind release, infinite breakthrough jutsu. One clone released the searing migraine jutsu while the one next to release the infinite breakthrough jutsu. The same was replicated by the other pair. The jutsus combined together perfectly and fused into one deadly attack. The bounty hunters who were chasing at their full speed were suddenly stunned to see a massive firestorm head towards them. The attack came without any warning and they had very little time to react. Chapter 248 On one side, the group closest to Fujin was a Kiri group of five led by their third Jianan. The former Kiri Jianan rapidly weaved hand signs. Water Release, Water Wall Jutsu A water wall appeared in front of his group of five just before the combination attack reached them. The Jutsu hit the water wall and broke through it as if it was air. A huge amount of steam was released as the entire water wall evaporated. Renzo saw with wide eyes as five of his men were being engulfed by the firestorm. He could hear their screams. He quickly completed hand signs and shouted, quickly flood this place. Water release, exploding water shock wave. The other five in his group also used the same jutsu. A huge amount of water was released which formed giant waves and moved towards the incoming attack and their allies. On the other side, a couple of Jounins slammed their hands on the ground. Earth release, earth wall jutsu. Two walls appeared in front of them. However, the range of the combination attack was too much. It easily engulfed the walls and hit the group regardless. Unlike the battle-hardened Kiri rogues, this group didn't have the same expertise. For the first time in their lives, they began experiencing the unique feeling of being cooked alive. A few quickly escaped into the ground while the others screamed miserably within the firestorm. The group behind them saw the terror in front of them. Shingo quickly slammed his hands on the ground. Earth release, Earth Dome. Seeing the mistake made by the group in front of him, he chose a jutsu that would protect them from all sides. The fire-wind combination jutsu engulfed the dome, but the people inside were safe. Water and fire clashed on the other side of the battlefield. The combined efforts of six ninjas overpowered the combination jutsu and waterways engulfed their allies. The water doused the fire on them and provided them with some relief. For Kiri rogues were burnt badly. Only the Jounin was in better shape as he had a thin layer of water armor surrounding him. A look of relief appeared on the faces of the six ninjas when suddenly they began feeling the heat. They looked behind themselves and saw in horror as another jutsu of the same scale approached them. Since the second bandit group didn't stop the attack and just protected themselves, the Kiri Road ninjas had to face an attack from both sides. This situation was a result of Fujin's clever manipulation of the battlefield. Since he split into two groups, the bounty hunters assumed that he wanted to run away. They didn't even notice that they were all in a straight line. All their attention was entirely on the pair in front of them. Renzo once again weaved hand signs. In the nick of time, he completed his jutsu and spat out massive amounts of water. His jutsu was overwhelmed, but the water brought them enough time for others to repeat that jutsu. 
A water pool was formed which engulfed the eleven Kiri Rogue ninjas and kept them protected from the fire. However, the water itself was heating up and evaporating at a rapid speed. Everyone could feel the heat, especially the four people from the first group who were very badly burnt. Renzo looked at the firestorm with a frown on his face. He cursed, horrible. The intel was way off. It didn't mention large-scale wind jutsus. It didn't even say that he knew any fire jutsus. All it said was to be careful of his vacuum jutsus and swordplay. Suddenly, his eyes widened as he realized, vacuum jutsus. Fuck! Despite being underwater, he shouted, be careful. It was a no-brainer that Fujin's ability with the fire release was completely a surprise to them. After all, he had developed it entirely during his time with the Umbu. While he didn't intend to keep it a secret like his lightning release, he hadn't been on any mission without his mask. So very few were aware of it. Fujin's details in the bingo book were almost two years old. Since he was never seen leading the village after getting the bounty, the bounty hunters assumed that he had given up on his ninja career. Fujin's clones observed the bounty hunters. In the group that used earth walls, three had escaped underground while the remaining six were burning. Behind them, fifteen people were hiding in an earth dome. A smirk formed on both their faces. A dozen vacuum bullets formed in both their mouths. They launched them all simultaneously. The group of fifteen bounty hunters were feeling safe inside the dome. Suddenly, bullets rained into the dome. They were all caught off guard and couldn't even move. Twelve ninjas had their hearts, brains, or throats pierced. They collapsed on the spot. The remaining three were also injured but could still move around. They quickly escaped underground in terror and moved towards the Kiri group. On the other side, Fujin's clones observed the Kiri ninjas being protected by water and guessed, this group looks to be exclusively from Kiri. Whereas that squad is only using Earth Release. Does this bounty hunter group have factions within them? Oh well, they'll all be dead anyways. Wind Release, Vacuum Serial Wave Jutsu. Sharp vacuum blades were launched at the water pool protecting them. The vacuum blades moved through the fire and into the water right when Renzo shouted. The four ninjas that were badly burnt didn't even see the attack coming and were cut into two. The Jounin who was injured tried to dodge as well. He barely moved his body and head out of the way. But one vacuum blade hit below his right knee and cut his leg off. The remaining six managed to dodge the attack. Renzo's heart ached. Fortunants were dead while one Jounin would no longer be able to fight. That was a huge loss for his group. He felt a great hatred for Fujin and the messenger. At the same time, he felt regret for choosing Fujin as the target. However, his expression soon became vicious. He decided, since you have caused us so much loss, I will claim your bounty no matter what. I cannot disappoint Lord Mizukage any further. The effects of the fire-wind combination jutsu had finally begun dissipating. Renzo looked at his subordinates that were still fine. They noticed his gaze and nodded. Soon, six bounty hunters from the other group came out of the ground next to the Kiri survivors. They looked at the situation around them in shock. Of the thirty-five attackers, only six were still uninjured. As many as twenty-three had died or were critically injured. And it had barely been over a couple of minutes since they began chasing after Fujin. Swords appeared in the hands of Fujin and his clones. They flickered towards the bounty hunters. The combination of searing migraine and infinite breakthrough jutsus was one of his strongest methods. Since this group managed to survive, using the same jutsu once again on them wouldn't be very effective. After all, he no longer had the element of surprise. Renzo noticed his movements and said, They are coming, prepare yourself. Everyone readied themselves. Fujin's attacks had eliminated most of the weaker ones from their ranks. Of the remaining people, half had Jown in ranks before going rogue. Fujin's clone appeared to one side of the group and swung his sword from five meters away. A sword wave was launched at them. The expression of the group became grim. Apart from Renzo, only one person was able to follow the movement of Fujin and his clones. 
Just before the sword slash could hit them, a barrier appeared around them. The slash hit the barrier and caused it to shake, but it stood erect. Fujin's eyes landed on the Jaonin who created the barrier. He thought, so this guy is probably their seal master. Fujin wasn't bothered that his attack wasn't successful. The information he gained in exchange for merely swinging his sword was sufficient. However, before he could attack once more, Renzo left the barrier. He raised his sword and slashed it down on the clone who had just attacked the barrier. Fujin's clone easily blocked his sword, but couldn't cut through it as Renzo also used chakra flow on his sword. At the same time, Shinjo and two Jaonins from his group exited the barrier and attacked the other three Fujins. Fujin was surprised. He defended while analyzing the barrier, it looks like this is a one-way barrier. It prevents entry but allows exit. A good way to keep attacking from a location. Suddenly, four more bounty hunters exited the barrier. They were the four Chunins, including Shiro, from Renzo's group. Fujin frowned, he didn't want to get ganged up on. So the four of them counterattacked. Renzo was able to hold his opponent back, but the other three were feeling overwhelmed. Fujin's clones barely managed to get away from them and were about to attack the four ninjas that exited the barrier when those ninjas avoided Fujin and ran in four different directions. Fujin was confused. He thought, the hell? Are they quitting the group and escaping? Or do they plan to attack me in the back? He didn't want to risk getting pincered and wanted to attack them, but the Jaonins caught up and began fighting once again. Since they blocked him, Fujin confirmed, they are running away. The four ninjas moved and stood surrounding Fujin and the rest. They made the snake hand seal and clapped their hands. Immediately, a violet barrier began appearing and surrounded Fujin and the other bounty hunters. The barriers formed four walls, a roof and another layer underground, cutting off all means of escape. Fujin was shocked. He muttered, for violet flames formation. No wonder I felt such an intense danger. Chapter 249 A grin spread on Renzo's face. He said, You are now trapped. I was planning to just kill you and get your head. But since you have killed four of my men, I will torture you until you beg for death. The morale of the remaining hunters and the barrier finally recovered. Fujin thought, Just four? Are there multiple groups here? No fear appeared on Fujin's face. He retorted, Torture me? He looked towards his right and said, I left the village to bait and hunt you down. If you dissolve the formation and surrender, you might be able to keep your life. Otherwise, even if you manage to kill me, your only result will be death. The bounty hunters were shocked to hear that Fujin was the bait. Renzo and others followed Fujin's gaze. Their eyes widened as four Kanoha ninjas appeared outside the barrier. Shingo muttered with a grim face, We were schemed against. It is Kakashi of the Sharingan. Their morale which had just recovered crashed down. Fujin's words were completely true. They would have a very difficult battle to just kill Fujin. Facing even stronger Kanoha ninjas right after it would be a certain death. Meanwhile, Kakashi's group also had grim faces. Yamanaka Ken said, Fujin is trapped. Kakashi too had a grim face. He said, the barrier has a high demand for chakra. And all four ninjas need to keep supplying chakra continuously. We will target one spot and kill one of them. The battlefield entered a deadlock. The Kanoha Jaonins couldn't interfere. And though the bounty hunters were safe for the moment, they were very fearful for their life. Fujin noticed the distraction and immediately took advantage. The clones gathered chakra. The four Jaonins facing them noticed it and reacted. However, a dozen vacuum bullets were already fired at each of them. Despite the low distance and the fast speed of the bullets, they still moved their body as much as they could. Renzo dodged ten bullets and the remaining two he blocked with his sword. However, cracks spread through his sword due to the power behind the bullets. His expression became dark as he realized, if I hadn't used chakra flow on the swords, the bullets might have pierced straight through them. However, the other three weren't as strong as him. They could only move sufficiently for the bullets to miss their vital organs. 
A bullet grazed the right arm of Shingo. It left a cut so deep that even his bone was visible. The other two were hit by two to three vacuum bullets each. Unfortunately for those two, they were once again standing right behind each other. So despite dodging, they were targeted by the vacuum bullets heading towards them from their back. One of them was very unlucky. A vacuum bullet hit his back and pierced straight through his heart. He dropped dead. The other one had a couple more holes created in his body but luckily avoided any critical injuries. One of Fujin's clones laughed and taunted, This barrier is good. This way, none of you can run away. Ha 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 ha. Not wanting to lose any more morale, Renzo immediately attacked the clone closest to him and shouted, Everyone! Attack him! Attack and kill all four of him. Only after he is dead we can plan on how to escape the once outside the barrier. There was still another barrier created inside the four violet flames formation. It still had five people. One was the injured Jounin from Renzo's group. Another was the Sealmaster while three were from the other group. Other than the injured Jounin, the others exited the barrier and attacked Fujin's clones. The Sealmaster said, his chakra has become very low. He won't be able to continue for much longer. Fujin's clones were all low on chakra. They had spent a lot of their chakra on the fire-wind combination jutsu. And after using vacuum jutsus repeatedly, they didn't have much chakra. Outside the barrier, the Kanoha ninjas were getting worried. They were bombarding the barrier with ninjutsu at the spot where Shiro was. The barrier shook but still stood erect. However, the four ninjas, especially Shiro, were under a lot of pressure. Their chakra was being drained rapidly. Suddenly, Pakin noticed something and looked to his left. After observing properly, he said, Kakashi, focus on your smell in that direction. Kakashi was surprised by Pakin's request. He quickly gathered chakra in his nose and enhanced his sense of smell. Suddenly his expression became very peculiar. Guy noticed and asked, What did you smell? Kakashi shook his head and said, Nothing. Keep an eye on the barrier. We won't attack any more as we might run out of chakra before the barrier breaks. If that happens, we will be in a tougher spot. Guy and the two special Jounins from the Yamanaka clan realized that Kakashi was hiding something. They didn't question him and began paying attention to fighting inside the barrier. Without their attacks, the four ninjas maintaining the formation side in relief. They quickly consumed a soldier pill to recover their chakra rapidly. Yamanaka Ken said, Though maintaining the barrier needs a lot of chakra, they could rest until they have recovered if they keep using soldier pills. Should we call in reinforcements to prevent that? Kakashi shook his head and replied, No need. There are only twelve left and two are severely injured. Regardless of the pills, the four maintaining the barrier will be exhausted. We can take them out without much issue. Yamanaka Ken nodded. Inside the barrier, Fujin and his clones fought intensely for five minutes. However, the remaining ninjas were all very careful. Fujin took deep breaths while analyzing, they are too careful. In the last five minutes, I only managed to kill that guy with five to six holes in his body. Though I injured the rest to varying degrees, I haven't been able to injure them critically. He looked towards his other clones. At the same time, they too looked into his eyes and nodded. Suddenly, three clones flickered away and appeared next to Shiro. Renzo had a bad feeling. He and the rest ran towards them, but the three clones touched the barrier and at the next moment exploded. The force of the explosions was felt throughout the barrier. Shiro fell to his knees and began vomiting blood, while the remaining three also felt the impact. They began coughing blood. Renzo shouted in panic, Hang on! The barrier must not fall. The four rogue ninjas gritted their teeth and forcefully maintained the formation. Kakashi and the rest didn't manage to enter inside. Renzo looked viciously at Fujin and said, That was stupid. Without clones, you are an easy target for us. He immediately ran towards Fujin who was breathing roughly. Everyone could see that he was exhausted. Guy was getting restless, but Kakashi said, It's fine, just watch. 
Renzo swung his sword at Fujin. Fujin deflected his blow with his sword and punched him with his left hand. Renzo punched back at his fist. However, Fujin opened his fist at the last moment and caught Renzo's fist. A grin broke on his face. Renzo suddenly had a bad feeling. Without a word, Fujin exploded. All the bounty hunters were stunned. The explosion created a dust cloud. In a second, a body was launched out of the dust cloud. He landed a few meters away. It was Renzo. His left arm was completely blown off. His chest, abdomen, face, and thighs had hideous burns and were covered in blood. In addition to the existing horrible scars, his entire appearance looked similar to that of a terrifying demon. One of the bounty hunters muttered in disbelief, did he explode his main body? Renzo replied with a hoarse voice, it was a shadow clone. A sense of disbelief and shock spread through the four ninjas maintaining the barrier and the remaining seven ninjas inside the barrier. Such huge casualties were inflicted upon them by merely shadow clones. Finally, one said, no wonder he has a twenty million bounty. No, even a twenty million bounty is low for him. Outside the barrier, everyone other than Kakashi and Pakin was shocked. Yamanaka Ken exclaimed, that was a shadow clone? Where is his real body? On cue, Fujin flickered behind him. They quickly turned around to see him. There wasn't a single scratch on his body. Guy and the others realized that Kakashi and Pakin had smelled his scent and hence stopped attacking the formation. Kakashi looked at him and memories regarding Fujin's graduation exam surfaced. Fujin had made quite an impact that day by asking for a chakra metal sword. Kakashi never imagined that the boy would become so strong in just a few years. He said, good work. Guy had no idea how Fujin managed to achieve this. But he didn't care. He raised his thumb and said with a grin, you are good. I can feel the power of youth flowing through you. The two Yamanaka ninjas also looked at Fujin with surprise in their eyes. The bounty hunters in the barrier noticed Fujin outside the barrier. They had already expected. However, the eyes of the seal master widened. He exclaimed in horror, his chakra. Chapter 250 Renzo ignored his missing arm and all his injuries and tried to analyze when Fujin switched with a clone. He realized, according to the intel, he moves very fast. That is why we set up the trap and prepared the formation in the first place. However, when he escaped, his speed didn't match the intel. But our minds were too occupied with claiming his bounty and we didn't notice the anomaly. He probably switched himself with a clone even before we exited the hidden bases while his clones moved slowly to catch us off guard with that combination jutsu. Renzo's analysis was very close to the truth. Fujin created a shadow clone with 20% of his chakra and escaped right after sensing that he was facing 35 enemies. He hit his chakra signature and scent and moved without making any sounds or leaving any trail due to which the sensors among the bounty hunters never sensed his main body. Later on, when he saw the four violet flames formation, Fujin realized why he was feeling a sense of danger. After realizing that his backup was Kakashi, he stopped hiding his scent so that Kakashi could smell his scent and stop worrying. While he could expose a flaw to the bounty hunters, Fujin didn't care as the bounty hunters were already in deep trouble. Inside the barrier, everyone looked at the seal master, who was also a censor, as he exclaimed loudly, his chakra. Renzo looked at him and asked, what about his chakra? The seal master gulped and said, it's massive. It's almost twice your maximum chakra, Renzo. He likely only used around 20 to 25% of his chakra on those four shadow clones. The eyes of the ninjas inside the barrier widened in horror as they took a look at Fujin once again. Though Fujin had improved a lot during his time in the Umbu, his biggest improvement was the increase in his chakra reserves. As Ryu had speculated, the growth in Fujin's chakra reserves had begun slowing down. But thanks to the fact that his chakra reserves were already comparable to a Jounin and the aid provided by the elemental crystals, his growth was still massive. His chakra reserves had grown by three times in the last 20 months. 
In another six months, his chakra reserves would reach the same level as Renjiro's. However, Fujin did sense that his growth was slowing down rapidly. So he wasn't sure about reaching Hiruzen's level of chakra at his current rate. Kakashi looked at the spot where Fujin's three clones had exploded and said, Focus your jutsus on that ninja again. The Kanoha ninjas were about to attack when Fujin said, Wait, I'll give them a few more explosions. He created six shadow clones, each with 5% of his chakra. Three flickered close to Shiro while the other three flickered close to the other three ninjas maintaining the formation. Kakashi nodded and weaved a few hand signs as well. Lightning release, shadow clone jutsu. A shadow clone infused with lightning appeared and followed Fujin's clones. Fujin's clones once again touched the barrier and exploded. Shiro was prepared this time and poured more chakra into the barrier. However, the explosions were much stronger as the clones were full of chakra. The impact of the explosion was once again sent through the barrier. As the person closest to the explosion, once again the majority of the impact was borne by Shiro. He collapsed on the ground and almost lost consciousness. However, he gritted his teeth and forced himself to stay awake. He said to himself, No! I have to stay awake. Otherwise, all of us will be dead. Through sheer will, he forced himself to stay awake. Unfortunately, Kakashi's lightning shadow clone appeared and transformed into lightning and hit the barrier on one single point. The barrier could no longer hold on and a small hole appeared in it as the lightning broke through. It hit Shiro and electrocuted him. Shiro was already on his last legs. He didn't even have the energy to scream as his body was electrocuted to death. With his death, the entire formation collapsed. Immediately, all five Kanoha ninjas flickered towards the opponents. The bounty hunters were on guard as well. As soon as the formation collapsed, they began running away in different directions. However, compared to the fresh Kanoha ninjas, the bounty hunters were extremely tired. Fujin's clones immediately attacked the other three ninjas who were maintaining the formation. They were already exhausted and low on chakra. None among them could put up a fight and were beheaded with ease. Fujin's clones immediately flickered towards the ones who were escaping. Kakashi flickered behind Renzo. Despite being gravely injured, Renzo stopped running and swung his sword at Kakashi. However, lightning appeared in Kakashi's hand and hit the blade. Despite the chakra around Renzo's sword, lightning still conducted through his sword and into his body. Kakashi said, Higashi Renzo, you are a long way from home. Renzo's sword shattered and Kakashi's hand pierced into his chest. At the same time, Guy appeared behind Shingo. Shingo began weaving hand signs. However, Guy grinned, too slow. Before Shingo could complete his hand signs, Guy had already reached his position. His eyes widened as he saw a kick coming at him from the top. He immediately moved to his right. Guy's kick landed on the ground. Shingo was still maintaining his hand seal, however, Guy's kick tore the ground open. Hundreds of small stones were launched in all directions. Shingo was hit by dozens of small stones at rapid speed. He was still unharmed, however, he couldn't continue weaving hand signs. Guy quickly attacked him once again. Shingo snorted internally, Do you think that only you can use taijutsu? Shingo's physique was much larger and more muscular than Guy's. He formed his fist and punched back at Guy. Their fists collided. Shingo's expression immediately changed. An intense pain coursed through his entire arm. He cursed, What the fuck is his body made of? Unfortunately, he didn't have any time to actually ask that question. Guy's second punch was coming straight at him. Unwillingly, he had to punch back with his other arm. An intense pain coursed through that arm as well. However, it was much worse due to the injury caused by Fujin earlier. He cursed, Fuck! It feels like my arm will break into two. Guy immediately noticed that his opponent was in a lot of pain. He didn't miss the opportunity and bombarded Shingo with punches and kicks. Shingo, who dared to match Guy in Taijutsu despite his injuries, was overwhelmed. He was beaten to a bloody pulp. 
Da knocked him unconscious and tied him up while thinking, Lord Hokage wanted some prisoners to check their memories. This guy looked quite strong. He should have some information. Some distance away from where Gai and Shingdo were fighting, Fujin flickered behind one of the three remaining subordinates of Shingdo. The bounty hunter noticed Fujin and turned around to fight. However, he was already very exhausted. There were dozens of small cuts on his body from the earlier fights. He had seen Fujin's clones cut through kunais with ease. So he began leaving hand signs. However, Fujin opened his mouth and shot eight vacuum bullets. One bullet was aimed at his forehead and another was aimed at his heart. The remaining six were to cut off his escape route. The bounty hunter moved his head out of the way and tried to twist his body. However, the vacuum bullets were too fast. One graze passed his face and tore his right cheek and ear off. His bloody teeth could be seen. Another bullet hit his rib cage and pierced through his chest. It avoided his heart, but he was on his last legs. With a swing of Fujin's sword, he was beheaded. Fujin spread his chakra field to observe the other battles. He noticed, so Kakashi has already killed their leader. My clones and that guy have killed their opponents as well. Guy should win soon too. So just that seal master and the one-leg bounty hunter are alive. Fujin sensed that Kakashi was moving towards the one-leg guy. So he moved towards the seal master. Fujin's clones followed him as well. Yamanaka Ken had confronted the seal master. Both entered in a fight and were evenly matched. The only bounty hunter who wasn't attacked so far was the one-leg Jounin from Kiri. Despite having just one leg, he was moving quite fast through the forest. Unfortunately, Kakashi killed Renzo too quickly. He immediately gave chase and caught up. The Jounin noticed Kakashi and immediately turned around and weaved hand signs. Kakashi noticed his hand signs and weaved hand signs as well. Water Release, Water Clone Jutsu Fire Release, Fireball Jutsu For water clones appeared next to the Kiri Rogue. They saw a giant fireball headed straight at them. One of the clones weaved hand signs. Water Release, Water Wall Jutsu A water wall appeared in front of them. The fireball hit it and exploded. A lot of water was turned into smoke and covered the area while the rest was splashed back at the ninja and his clones. They were about to attack once again when a sound of lightning was heard. Lightning traveled through the water that was splashed on them and electrocuted them all. All four water clones were instantly dispelled. The one-leg Jounin's eyes widened. He realized, he used my own jutsu against me. He barely maintained his consciousness. However, Kakashi appeared in front of him and placed his right hand on his chest. Immediately, an intense current passed through his body and knocked him out. Kakashi tied him up and placed a seal on his chest and thought, one captured alive. Guy should have captured his opponent as well. This mission is successful. Chapter 251 Water Release Water Needles Jutsu Water split into hundreds of drops. Each drop turned into a needle and rained at Yamanaka Ken. Ken immediately flickered out of the way while making his hand seal. He flickered once again to get close to his opponent. Mind Destruction Jutsu His opponent immediately moved out of the way and jumped on a branch behind him. Suddenly, his eyes widened. A vacuum bullet hit his chest and pierced straight through it. However, his body turned into water and collapsed. A few meters behind him, his body appeared once again. He looked at Fujin and said, You can hide your chakra. No wonder I didn't sense you back then. But now that I know it, hiding it is useless. Fujin didn't reply but Ken flickered close to him once again and tried using the same jutsu. The seal master took out a scroll and jumped back on the ground to dodge Ken's attack. He opened the scroll and smeared his blood across it and weaved a few hand signs rapidly. Fujin frowned and wondered, is he attempting to reverse summon himself somehow? Chakra gathered in his mouth as he shot a few vacuum bullets at him. At the same time, Ken once again used the mind destruction jutsu. However, a black tortoise projection made entirely of chakra appeared between Fujin and the seal master. 
Fujin's vacuum bullets hit the shell of the tortoise and were stopped. At the same time, an azure dragon projection appeared between Ken and him. The jutsu hit the dragon but had no impact on him. Fujin frowned as he analyzed, a barrier? At the same time, projections of a vermilion bird and a white tiger were also formed around him. After tanking the jutsus, the projections collapsed and transformed into a barrier around him. The walls of the barrier had the image of those four mythical beasts. A smile formed on his face. Fujin gathered a large amount of chakra while changing his location. Wind release, vacuum cannon jutsu. Fujin shot the powerful vacuum cannon at the wall which had the vermilion bird image. The entire barrier shook, but not a single crack appeared on it. The ninja inside the barrier also looked completely fine. He taunted, this is my strongest barrier. You can keep attacking for days, it won't fall. Your mind control jutsus will also not work against my barrier. Fujin was surprised. He analyzed, this barrier is smaller, but it is even more sturdy than the four violet flames formation. Worse, it doesn't look like it is using his chakra. I won't be able to crack it using shadow clone explosions. Fujin immediately snorted, you are deep within the land of fire. Let me see how long you will keep hiding here. He dispelled his clones and got some chakra back. He sat at some distance from the barrier in case the barrier had any more peculiar means. His eyes began glowing as he started observing the barrier properly. Ken also replicated Fujin's actions and stood in the opposite direction. After some time, the other Yamanaka ninja arrived. He went to Ken to ask him for an update. A few seconds later, Guy and Kakashi arrived. Both were carrying the ones they captured. Guy looked at the barrier and said, I haven't seen such a barrier yet. What is it? Kakashi observed the barrier and replied, Barrier Defense Seal Jutsu, 8 Gate Lockup. It's a wide-range barrier jutsu created by the Uzumaki clan to create a barrier around an entire village. Looks like he has a modified version of it to protect just himself. The seal master's expression became grim after seeing the three Kanoha ninjas arrive. It implied that every other bounty hunter was killed. He replied, as expected of the copy ninja Kakashi. Since you know about the barrier, you know that you wouldn't be able to break it like the four violet flames formation. Kakashi replied, every barrier could be broken. Regardless, this is the land of fire. I could summon hundreds of ninjas and keep a watch on you until you can't maintain the barrier anymore. The seal master laughed and said, hundreds of ninjas just for me? Ha ha ha. I never expected my life to be so precious for you to waste so much manpower on me. Kakashi said, it isn't. You won't be able to imagine the torture you'd be put under for wasting our time. So I'll give you an offer. Surrender now and I will ensure that no harm will come to you. Lord Hokage might even allow you to turn a new page in your life. The seal master was surprised. He thought, I never imagined that Kanoha would offer to recruit me. The offer was alluring. However, his eyes laid on the two Yamanakas and he rejected that idea, no, these two will read my memories. Once they do, they won't allow me to live. He opened another scroll and said, it's a tempting offer. Unfortunately, I can't do it. He made a confrontation hand seal. Immediately, dozens of explosion tags appeared from the scroll. A few stuck to his body while the rest stuck on the four symbols on the barrier. The Kanoha ninjas immediately became alert. In the next moment, all the explosion tags exploded. Fujin immediately flickered away. Kakashi slammed his hands on the ground. Earth release, Earth Dome Jutsu. A dome appeared from the ground and covered him and Guy. At the same time, the last ninja grabbed Yamanaka Ken and escaped underground. The barrier collapsed. The chakra of the seal master and within the barrier fueled the explosion and caused a fire to spread in all four directions. It also caused cracks to spread within the ground around the barrier. Kakashi noticed that the ground under his feet as well as the dome had begun cracking. His expression became grim as he poured chakra into the ground to strengthen it. The two Yamanakas who were escaping underground had it rough. 
As the ground cracked, some heat entered the ground. After flickering a few times, Fujin turned around to see. The fire had spread for almost 300 meters from the explosion spot. He was surprised. What a crazy bastard. That barrier was a trap. He didn't intend to protect himself. He just wanted to use its chakra to amplify the explosions from those tags. He even used all his own chakra to amplify the explosions. Soon, the explosion died down and only the fire remained. A few water dragons appeared in between the fire and moved through the fire and began dousing it. The water also entered into the cracks in the ground. The two Yamanakas sensed it and left the underground. Fujin sensed that they were all fine. So he flickered back towards where Kakashi was. He first looked at the spot of the explosion. There was no sign of any dead body. The seal master's body was completely obliterated. Fujin looked at the two Yamanakas and asked, Are you two all right? Both of them had several burns on their skin. Ken nodded and said, It's fine. It's just minor burns. He looked at Kakashi and asked, Why did that bastard commit suicide? Wouldn't accepting your offer be much better for him? Kakashi replied, More than suicide, it looked like he wanted to burn all the dead bodies. This way, we won't be able to gain any intel from them. Of course, if he managed to kill any of us, that would have been a bonus for him. Ken looked around and frowned, all the dead bodies will have been burned by the fire. We won't be able to read their memories now. It looks like he wanted to hide something crucial. He looked at the two ninjas that Kakashi and Guy had captured and added information that these two wouldn't have. Kakashi nodded and said, yes. I guess he didn't know about this. He took out a scroll and opened it. He made a hand seal and Renzo's body popped out. He said, I had stored his body as he was likely their leader. Read his memories. Yamanaka Ken nodded and immediately got to work. He placed his palm on the forehead of the dead body and inserted his chakra into his head to inspect his memories. Fujin's eyes were glued to him. The Yamanaka clan's ability to read memories of dead bodies was something he had wanted for some time. Unfortunately, he didn't get to visit the TI department frequently. During his time in the Umbu, he had only seen it being done thrice. Fujin analyzed, just like before, the chakra that invades the brain of the dead body is purine chakra. It is almost entirely the opposite of medical ninjutsu. But, how exactly does this work? Despite observing it for the fourth time, he didn't have any idea about the internal workings of the jutsu. Though he had killed hundreds of people, his umbu squad would always be close by. He never got to experiment on the dead bodies. And he had no intention of experimenting on the only dead body still in his possession. Chapter 252 Ken continued reading his memories for a few minutes. Sweat appeared on Ken's body. It was apparent that reading memories from a dead body was very taxing on him. Finally, he let him go. His expression was grim. Kakashi asked, Did you get any information from him? Ken nodded and said, I couldn't read all his memories, but the ones that I could show that this bounty hunting was a scheme made by Kiridikure. Kakashi furrowed his eyebrows. Ken continued, He hadn't gone rogue. Instead, he was given a mission by an elder from the Mizukage faction from Kiridikure. They currently have a huge advantage against the rebels who are hiding. Since they are hiding, the forces of Mizukage are ideal. But, the rebellion means that no one will issue missions there. So to raise funds, they issued him a mission. He was to go rogue, get in touch with other rogue Kiri ninjas and form a bounty hunter group. After collecting the bounties, they would secretly send the majority of the bounty to Kiridikure. That seal master was assigned as his deputy for this mission. Apart from them, all others were actual rogue means who got used. Ken's words left the four Kanoha ninjas speechless. Even after going rogue, those guys were still being made to work for Kiridikure unknowingly. Fujin couldn't help but think, what a scheme! And what shamelessness! Sigh, every time I think that I'm getting too shameless, this world gives me a reality check. These bastards are a hundred times more shameless than me. 
I need to improve myself. Back in Kanoha, a chill passed through the spine of Haruzen. He immediately got alert and observed his surroundings. He didn't notice anything weird and wondered, why did it suddenly feel like someone wanted to take everything from me? Are any of my former students or teammates scheming something? It has been a while since I have paid attention to their movements. Back in the vast forests in the land of fire, Kakashi said, it is a great scheme. The high number of ninjas going rogue should weaken them. But now, they have managed to make use of them instead. I guess that they have also sent guys like him to other villages. He looked at the other Yamanaka ninja and said, you inspect his memories as well. The ninja nodded and got to work. Kakashi looked at Fujin and said, according to our intel, the bounty hunters group shouldn't have been so big. I guess two different groups allied together. We should be able to confirm it after checking their memories. Fujin nodded. He had the same analysis after Renzo threatened him. Kakashi continued, this mission is done, will you be coming back with us? Fujin shook his head and answered, no, I have another mission. I will take my leave. Kakashi nodded. Fujin flickered away. Guy looked at him and said, he is quite strong, Kakashi. There weren't even half the bounty hunters alive by the time we reached. Kakashi nodded. He said, Lord Third is very positive about his prospects. I guess his progress shouldn't be very surprising. Anyways, let's clean up the battlefield. Kakashi and Guy gathered the remains of every burnt dead body. Most of the dead bodies were badly burnt. The only ones who were in decent shape were the ones who had attempted to hide under the earth dome and were killed by Fujin's vacuum bullets. After storing all the bodies, the two Yamanakas used mind body switch jutsu to take over the bodies of the two prisoners so that they wouldn't suddenly attack. The group returned back to Kanoha. After returning, they reported the details of the mission to Haruzen and Shikaku. After analyzing the data, Shikaku let out a sigh and said, despite being in such a mess, they still try to create a mess in other villages. Hiruzen said, it's because they know that no one would retaliate with force. After all, no one wants to enter into their mess. He looked at Kakashi and instructed, deliver the dead bodies to torture and interrogation department. Have them inspect all their memories. Once we can't find any new memories, deliver their bodies to the underground market and claim their bounties. He looked at Shikaku and said, find a way to spread the news of the death of Higashi Renzo and Kiri. It will improve the morale of the rebels. Though I won't be involved directly, the Mizukage would have underestimated us way too much if he thinks that we can't retaliate at all. Also, form a few patrol squads to roam randomly through the country to find traces of any other Rokirigakure ninja. Shikaku and Kakashi nodded and left the office. A frown formed on Haruzen's face as he analyzed, Kumo has already been trying to scheme a lot against us. Though Suna is allied with us, they are growing restless by the day. IWA is silent for now, but once that fence-sitter makes up his mind, they will become extremely problematic. And now even Kiri is making moves. Sigh, these peaceful times might not last very long. In the middle of the desert existed a city that commanded awe and reverence. Amidst the harsh desert environment, this majestic city stood proudly, surrounded by a colossal wall that stretched as far as the eye could see. The towering walls, crafted from sturdy sandstone, created an imposing barrier against the unforgiving desert winds. Samurais clad in desert-hued armor stood vigilant at the city gates. A group of traders approached the towering walls of the city and moved towards the samurais. The samurais noticed their arrival. Among them was Captain Hayashi Ryota who was responsible for the safety of the city gates. One of the traders walked forward and bowed respectfully. The samurais scrutinized the group with a discerning gaze. The trader, dressed in fine desert attire, exuded an air of confidence and respectability. Ryota said, Welcome to the wind capital, esteemed travelers. I am Captain Hayashi Ryota. State your purpose and present your trade permits for inspection. The trader said, I am Takahashi Hiroshi. I have heard about your valor, Captain Ryota. I am pleased to make your acquaintance. 
Ryota's mood improved on being praised. Hiroshi handed him the required documents and said, We are a new traitor's group from the land of Bird. Ryota and the other guards inspected the documents carefully and verified their authenticity. Satisfied with their findings, Captain Ryota returned the permits to Hiroshi and allowed them to enter the city. Ryota said in a diplomatic tone, As honored guests of our city, we trust that you will adhere to our laws and customs during your stay. Please be mindful of the city's regulations and treat our citizens and fellow traders with respect. Enjoy your time in the wind capital and may your business ventures be prosperous. Hiroshi bowed deeply once again and said, We are humbled by your hospitality, Captain Ryota. We shall uphold the highest standards of conduct and contribute positively to the commerce of this remarkable city. Hiroshi and his fellow traders entered the city along with their caravan. As soon as they did, they were immediately captivated by the stunning contrasts and breathtaking sights in the city. The streets wound through the city like intricate mazes and provided shelter from the scorching sun. Buildings of varying heights and styles rose proudly, their architecture inspired by the desert environment. Majestic minarets and ornate domes punctuated the skyline as their golden surfaces glimmered under the brilliant sun. Hiroshi couldn't help but mutter in awe, so beautiful. Ryota smirked and said, everyone who enters this city for the first time feels the same. Hiroshi nodded and replied, it's difficult to feel anything else. Ryota nodded. Hiroshi said, I'd love to keep watching. Unfortunately, some of my goods are perishable. Could you tell me where the markets are situated, Captain Ryota? Ryota nodded and provided him with the information. Hiroshi and the other traders began moving according to his instructions. Soon they left the side of those samurais. Immediately, every trader's expression changed. The awe and captivation disappeared from their faces. Hiroshi said in a neutral voice, sell all of our products. All the traders immediately got to work. Hiroshi kept observing the city. They had goods in bulk. So they found appropriate buyers and sold all their goods at low prices. In a few hours, their entire caravan was empty. Hiroshi took all the money and said aloud, Since we made the dangerous journey successfully and have plenty of money, we should enjoy some time in this village. Of course, in our time here, we will also check which goods are the most appropriate and profitable to trade. So enjoy yourself for the next few months. The traders smiled and rejoiced on getting a long break. They split into groups and left in different directions under the envious gazes of some people. Though trading was very risky, if done successfully, it was very rewarding. Hiroshi left alone and booked a room in one of the most expensive hotels in the wind capital. He stood on the balcony and saw the sunset. A golden hue was cast across the city making it seem even more breathtaking than ever. A smile formed on his face as he thought, in terms of the scenery, the wind capital is leagues ahead of the fire capital. Chapter 253 As the sun set, a bunch of memories started popping up in his mind. He analyzed all the memories and thought, good, all my clones have safely dispelled themselves. No one noticed them. Finally, it's time to begin my mission. One week ago, after eliminating the two groups of bounty hunters, Fujin split off from Kakashi's group and continued his journey forward. However, the fight had exhausted nearly half his chakra. So he decided to take a break in a nearby town. He entered the town after using the transformation jutsu and looked for an ordinary hotel. After renting a room, Fujin opened the scroll Shikaku and handed him and began reading. The scrolls had a lot of details regarding the nobles and the land of wind. It contained a detailed list of all nobles, their families, friends, and their political standings. After a few hours, Fujin let out a sigh. He muttered in his mind, I used to think that the number of ninjas is quite high. But, until I joined the Umbu, I never ever imagined that the number of nobles would be this high. Every major country has at least a couple of thousand people related to the daimyo. Do they spend all their time breeding? And Shikaku's reports have over 500 nobles who he wants to be targeted. Sai, when we talk about wars, everyone only thinks about the three great wars that have happened. 
Meanwhile, everyone is worried about when the Fourth Great Ninja War will happen. But, in reality, the five major villages are at war with each other constantly with no breaks. It's just that these wars don't have a battlefield. Instead, they are fought by the special forces of each village. Instead of clashing openly, the war is about sabotaging others while increasing your own influence. In the last 12 months, I have basically been targeting nobles in the nearby smaller countries who are against Kanoha. Like in the previous mission, we killed the forces of that noble from the land of Waterfall who sided with IWA. The end result of such clashes is to make these nobles favor your village and hate the enemy's villages. And in this competition, Kanoha has a huge advantage. Other than the land of rain, every neighboring country favors Kanoha more than its other neighbors. The superiority of Haruzen and Shikaku's scheming abilities can be seen through this. Of course, there is another big reason. Kanoha has no ambition to claim the lands of other countries. But other countries want Kanoha's lands. However, the smaller countries act as a buffer between them. If some country successfully manages to capture territory within the land of fire, the smaller countries acting as a buffer will also have to be conquered by them or at least some parts of the country would have to be annexed. And if Kanoha couldn't resist them, there's no way any smaller country could resist them. Fujin let out a sigh and thought, when I first read Naruto, I was disgusted by the fact that Kumo tried to kidnap a little girl. If kidnapped, her fate would have been terrible. Just the thought of it was revolting. But, now it doesn't seem very extreme. The chances of kidnapping someone from the Hyuga compound should be close to zero. Perhaps the goal of that kidnapping attempt wasn't to kidnap Hinata but rather to have the kidnapper die in the Hyuga compounds. Perhaps, even if Hayashi didn't kill the kidnapper, as long as he was caught, he'd have committed suicide and died in the Hyuga clan compounds. This way, they would be able to exchange the life of a normal ninja with a strong clan leader. Even though Hayashi preserved his life, Kanoha and the Hyuga clan lost an elite Jounin. In peacetime, that is a great loss. I guess they also wanted to sow discord between the village leadership and the Hyuga clan. After all, by then, the Uchiha clan were already made to live on the outskirts of Kanoha. If the two strongest clans were unsatisfied with the Kanoha leadership, the village would become quite unstable. Even if nothing bad happened, as long as the process of recovery is slowed down, Kanoha would be in trouble when the next great war starts. Fujin let out another sigh, the more I get involved, the more I realize how deep the schemes run in this world. And, for some reason, I have a feeling that soon it will be my turn to play these schemes. If I can't, then I won't be able to achieve much in this life either. Fujin rested the night in that hotel before continuing his journey the next day. He crossed the border and entered the land of rivers under a random disguise. He found an unoccupied cave and entered it. He inscribed a few seals in the cave to provide some protection and to stop and misdirect any attempts of scouting that place. He quickly changed into the attire of Suna Umbu and thought, for the next few months, this will be my disguise while doing shady work. He left the cave and journeyed towards the land of wind. The border of the land of wind was as massive as that of the land of fire. However, unlike Kanoha, they were suffering from a massive budget crunch. In addition, the desert conditions in the land of wind were many times rougher than the green forests in the land of fire. So very few patrolling teams used to patrol the borders. Fujin had no trouble infiltrating the land of wind. He continued moving rapidly across the vast deserts while thinking, though the rough environment makes patrolling difficult, the vast open desert makes hiding very difficult. After traveling a few hundred kilometers into the desert, Fujin took a break and began making a plan. He analyzed, most of my targets are in the wind capital. I will have to begin from there. But, how should I infiltrate it? Should I just sneak in? Fujin calculated his chances of sneaking in successfully. After some time, he rejected that idea, no. I have been to the fire capital a few times. Though the security wasn't as good as Kanoha, it was still very tight. Samurais patrolled the walls and the walls themselves had numerous seals carved in them. Though I could still infiltrate without alarming any seal, it will be incredibly difficult. So, 
I guess my only option is to enter through the city gates. Suddenly, Fujin changed his direction. Instead of traveling towards the wind capital, Fujin began traveling towards the north. After traveling for another day, Fujin stopped and opened a map. He concluded, this should be the route where trading caravans pass through while trading between the land of wind and the land of earth. I'll just wait until I can catch a ride. He carved a seal on the sand and made a hand seal. The seal began sinking into the sand. He repeated the same process at distances of 25 meters dozens of times. Finally, he weaved another hand sign and placed his hand on the ground. Earth Release, Underground Camp Jutsu He poured his chakra into the ground as the rocks and sand began moving. In a few minutes, one small underground room was formed. Fujin inscribed a seal on the wall of this room and thought, Good. Now if anyone passes through this route, the seals will detect the vibrations in the ground and cause this seal to light up. I will wait here for up to a week. If no one shows up, then I will try to actively find a group of travelers instead of just sitting here. Fujin carved some seals to ensure that the room can't be sensed. He entered it and rested while waiting patiently. In the next two days, the seal lit up thrice. Fujin exited the room to observe each time. Unfortunately, all three groups were ninja squads from Suna. Luckily, none of them was sensing when Fujin exited the room. So his location stayed hidden. Finally, on the third day, the seal lit up once again. Fujin sighed and muttered, If it is another group of ninjas, I will kill and impersonate them instead of traders or merchants. He exited the room. Chakra gathered in his eyes as he began observing the chakra signature while staying under the sand. A smile appeared on his face as he thought, finally. A group of sixteen people. Twelve have civilian levels of chakra while four have Chunin levels of chakra. He made a hand seal and his figure disappeared from under the sand. Suddenly, one of the four ninjas turned and looked at where Fujin was. The ninja next to him asked, Did you notice something, Captain? The captain replied, It felt like a breeze suddenly passed through that area. Leave it, I might be imagining it. They continued on their journey. After traveling for around two kilometers, one of the ninjas said, Captain, there is someone ahead. The ninjas got alert. The captain said loudly, Be careful everyone. It might be another bandit group. However, the ninja shook his head and said, No captain. It is only one person and his chakra is very low. So he isn't a ninja. The group traveled forward carefully. After a couple of hundred meters, they saw the person. He was a man in terrible shape. His clothes were torn in multiple places and dyed in blood. He had multiple injuries on his body. He turned his head towards them and hope appeared in his eyes. Chapter 254 The man immediately got up and walked towards the caravan. However, he was limping. The group noticed a deep cut just above his left knee. The man walked to them with tears running down his face and hurriedly begged, Please help me. I am a traitor just like you, but my caravan was attacked by desert bandits. All of us were captured. I luckily managed to escape, but they are still hunting for me. Please hell. However, before he could finish speaking, a kick landed on his chest and sent him flying backwards. A look of shock appeared on the face of the man. He looked at them in disbelief. The four ninjas were wearing headbands that didn't belong to any ninja village. The caravan had a flag of the land of bird country. The man still begged, Please help us and save my friends. If not, at least take me with you. I don't want to die here. One of the ninjas looked at him and asked, What do we do with him, Captain? The captain shook his head and said, It's better to kill him. If he is planted by a bandit group, then we might get in trouble. Behind him, the leader of the traitors, Hiroshi said, Just kill him and get moving. I don't want to delay my first trade. The injured man heard the words carefully. Fear showed on his face. One of the ninjas grinned and walked forward, You heard him. You can say goodbye to your pathetic life. He grabbed a kunai and walked towards the man. 
The man looked at him with terror in his eyes. He raised the kanai and was about to attack when his head was sent flying into the air. The traders and the ninjas, who were looking at the spectacle with ridicule in their eyes, were suddenly shocked. Before they could even react, the heads of the remaining three ninjas were also sent flying. Terror flooded into the minds of each of the twelve traders as they saw the injured man behead the ninjas they hired for their safety. The injured man said in a cold tone, You have died either way, but your actions avoid any feeling of guilt that I might have felt. He suddenly disappeared. Hiroshi saw as every trader began falling down to the ground one by one. Only he was left standing. The injured man, who was now a Shinigami in his eyes, stood in front of him and looked into his eyes. He couldn't move as the man's hand squeezed his neck. Suddenly, the entire world became pitch black. He couldn't even see the arm that was holding his neck. He heard Fujin speaking, If you want to live, tell me every detail about yourself and your trading caravan. Hiroshi was completely terrified. He screamed, I will speak. Please don't kill me. Hiroshi immediately gave him all the details that he wanted. He also took all the documents from Hiroshi. An electric current passed through Hiroshi's body and knocked him out. Fujin walked towards one of the knocked-out traders and lifted him. A current passed through his body and woke him up. Fujin interrogated him to cross-check the information. He repeated the process with all twelve traders. After collecting all the data, Fujin analyzed, I was lucky. This is a perfect group for me to impersonate. It is their first mission, so they shouldn't have any contacts in the wind capital. Not to mention, they come from the land of bird instead of the land of earth. So their backing will be much weaker. In addition, the ninjas they hired don't work for any village. Instead, they work for the mercenary group Kurigane no Sinsen. Though this mercenary group is quite influential, it mostly operates in the countries between the lands of wind and earth. It shouldn't have much sway here. And even if they do, they will be much slower than a ninja village to investigate their missing ninjas. Fujin observed everyone around him and thought it'd be a huge waste to just hide their bodies. He walked towards one of the detached heads and extended his right hand towards it while thinking it should work against detached heads too. Though I am not sure if using them for my first try is a good thing. In Chakra appeared on his palm and poured into the detached head. Fujin controlled the chakra to gently enter the brain. He closed his eyes to properly control the chakra. As chakra surged unhindered, a profound strain befell the brain. The delicate neural pathways, unaccustomed to such a surge, begin to falter and distort under immense pressure. Fujin frowned. He stopped pouring the chakra into his mind and wondered, how the fuck do the Amanakas train? Despite my chakra control, the brain was destroyed so easily. And, I didn't even see a single memory. Do the Yamanaka have secret methods of learning? Or do they test on test subjects before being allowed to use it on alive people? Fujin fell in a thought, as I expected, this is very complicated. Though I know that it requires in chakra, just that isn't enough to learn this jutsu. If I am right, Several generations of Yamanaka clan ninjas probably worked on this to create this secret technique. So I am basically trying to replicate a decades-long process without much information. Right now, I have only two pieces of knowledge. The first is that the chakra has to be pure in and the chakra control has to be very good. The second is that memories aren't stored in just one single part of the brain. They are distributed across multiple brain regions and involve intricate neural networks and connections rather than being confined to a single location. Unfortunately, I have no idea which those regions are. The library didn't have any information regarding this. I am sure my previous world had better information about this. Unfortunately, I hadn't studied biology for years. I simply don't have any memories regarding this. Fujin analyzed for a few minutes before sighing, leave it. I can't think of anything good. I will just experiment on them. Fujin experimented on the three detached heads. The first two had their brains destroyed. On the last one, his chakra control with the Yin chakra became much better. 
he managed to continue invading his brain with Ian Chakra without turning it into mush. However, he didn't get any memories from it. Fujin wondered, do I need to make more modifications to my Ian Chakra or move it in a certain way to read memories? He couldn't say for sure. He looked towards the twelve unconscious traitors and muttered, I hope I have luck with living test subjects. He walked towards one traitor, tied his limbs and woke him up. The traitor woke up terrified. He shouted and begged, but Fujin didn't pay any attention to him. He placed a hand on his head and began inserting Yin Chakra into his head. He delicately controlled his chakra to enter his brain and access the neural networks in his cerebral cortex. However, the man suddenly yelled. Soon, his expression changed. He spoke gibberish and he began making weird faces. Fujin looked at him with a solemn expression, he has become intellectually impaired. Another reason why I should never let anyone try to read my memories. If they wish to harm me, I won't even be able to resist. Fujin continued trying to read his memories until his brain was destroyed and he stopped moving and dropped dead. Fujin experimented on the remaining eleven traitors and all faced the same result. Fujin sighed and began storing everyone's dead bodies and scrolls. He stored the four dead ninjas in one scroll and the twelve dead traitors in another. He placed the scroll of the dead ninjas in the underground room he had created and completely sealed it up. He analyzed, if the mercenary group had any means of tracking them, they would be led here. Even if they find the blood where I killed them, they will only find the blood of these four ninjas. Fujin walked back to the caravan and created shadow clones. They transformed into the eleven traitors while Fujin transformed into Hiroshi. They buried the sand dyed in blood a few meters below the surface and began their journey to the wind capital. Midroot, Fujin made another shadow clone who traveled a few kilometers and buried the scroll with the dead bodies of the traitors deep within the sand. In these vast deserts, the chances of it being found were negligible. Chapter 255 Fujin was enjoying his evening breakfast on his balcony while enjoying the beautiful sunset. He thought, this lifestyle is kinda good. I see why so many ninjas want to be recruited by a daimyo. Unlike the daily life of going through deadly missions and not knowing whether you'd live or not, the life here is just too relaxing and stress-free. Fujin had stayed in the wind capital for a couple of weeks. He spent it relaxing in his luxurious hotel room and sightseeing around the city. He analyzed, there hadn't been any news about anyone looking for Hiroshi or the ninjas protecting them. So I should be able to maintain this identity for some time. He turned his eyes towards a few mansions in the city. They were quite far from his location but still visible. Though he couldn't see every detail, he knew that a few were moving sneakily into those mansions. Just like Fujin, one noble was enjoying his life in one of the mansions Fujin eyed. He was enjoying his luxurious life while thinking, I am so glad that the Demio decided to favor Kanoha instead of Suna. Otherwise, there is no way I would be able to sign such a huge deal with the Kazakage. Once the deal is finalized, money will start rolling into this mansion. Ha ha ha. At that moment, a maid entered the room. She was in her teens and looked very beautiful. The noble, who was in his fifties, lecherously eyed her. She brought a tray filled with various sushi to him and said respectfully, My lord. The noble looked at it and said, It looks delicious. He turned his eyes towards her and said, I am sure it'd taste even better if you feed it to me. He opened his mouth wide open. The maid knew about how perverted he was. Unfortunately, she had no other option. She picked up a piece of sushi and was about to feed him when she saw a red line appearing on his throat. Before she could think, the line split open and blood sprayed out and covered the maid's face and chest. She freaked out and screamed loudly. Immediately, a samurai appeared in the room and asked, Lord Atsushi, what happened? His words were stuck in his mouth as he saw the noble he was supposed to protect lying in his chair with his throat cut open with the maid standing in shock in front of him. He got angry and muttered, Someone dared to kill a person protected by me? They are disrespecting the great name of Asamu. I will kill them. He quickly approached the maid and asked her menacingly, Did you kill him? 
The maid was terrified by his expression. She feared the worst. Unfortunately, there wasn't much she could do. Tears rolled down her cheeks as she said, No, I didn't do it. I was about to feed him when a red line appeared on his neck and split it open. Isamu believed her. He thought, she isn't lying. It looks like the work of a ninja. A wind user to be specific. Did he upset Suna during the negotiations? Or is someone trying to frame Suna? Chakra gathered in his eyes as he began to observe everything in the mansion. Suddenly he discovered, hmm? Since when did someone with so much chakra appear in the mansion? He must be the culprit. Chakra flowed through his sword as he stabbed it into the floor. A hole appeared in the floor and he jumped on the floor below. In front of him was a butler. Isamu looked at him and said, Good disguise. If it was someone else, they'd be fooled. A frown formed on the face of the butler. He asked, What do you mean? However, instead of replying, Isamu swung his sword. A blue sword wave was shot from his sword and approached the butler. The butler immediately moved out of the way, displaying physical skills far beyond what a civilian could display. The samurai moved forward and attacked him with his sword once again. The butler took a kunai and used it to block the sword. Unlike Isamu, he didn't use chakra flow. However, since Isamu's chakra flow wasn't charged with wind nature, his kunai could hold on. However, Isamu used the opportunity to kick his chest. The butler was sent flying backwards and crashed into a wall. His transformation jutsu was dispelled. Isamu saw a ninja wearing a scorpion mask and in the umbu uniform of Sunagakir. His expression became grim. It looked like he was caught in an internal struggle in the land of wind. The ninja got up and said in a cold tone, I didn't expect you to be so good. However, you should have just looked the other way. Now, I will have to kill you as well. Isamu didn't attack and asked, Why did you kill him? The ninja snorted, do you think it is so easy to take advantage of our village? Even your land of iron doesn't have the same standing as our village. Let alone some no-name noble. He raised two fingers. Wind began flowing around them. Isamu once again attacked with his sword. However, the Umbu easily dodged the sword slash. Isamu's eyes widened as four cuts appeared on each of his arms. Two of them were right on his elbow and severed his blood vessels and nerves in it. Isamu suddenly felt weak and dropped his swords. The umbu said, In your next life, don't poke your head into other people's businesses. Wind once again began moving around his two fingers as he pointed them towards the samurai. Though Isamu was wearing armor, a lot of areas on his body weren't protected by it. Dozens of cuts appeared on his legs and neck. Isamu dropped to the ground and lost consciousness. He was no match for the umbu. Having completed his job, the umbu disappeared. After the fighting noises stopped, the servants immediately ran towards where the fighting was happening. To their horror, they noticed Isamu lying in a pool of blood. They immediately ran forward and checked on him. Surprisingly, one maid said, He is still breathing. Call for doctors. Also, inform Lord Atsushi about this. Some servants left hurriedly to call for the personal doctor employed in the mansion. A couple of other servants ran to the upper floor. They were horrified to see that their Lord Atsushi was dead and the maid was lying unconscious. They carried the maid down to be in the same room as Asamu. After laying her down, they went to the basement to inform the family of the noble who had hidden there immediately after hearing the sounds of a battle. The doctor soon arrived. His expression became grim after checking the samurai. He said, his condition is very bad. Go and call for a medical ninja from the hospital. Hurry! A couple of servants nodded and left. The doctor removed Isamu's armor and clothes around the cuts. He provided first aid and stopped the bleeding. Suddenly, loud wailing was heard from the floor above. The family members of the noble were crying due to his loss. After a couple of minutes, his son walked down and saw the doctor treating Isamu while his father was completely ignored. He shouted, How dare you treat others when my father has died? 
leave them to die along with him. His expression became cruel as he said, in fact, all of you should join him too. Fear appeared on the face of all servants. However, the doctor was calm. He continued cleaning the wounds and said without looking at him, Young master, he is a samurai from the land of iron. A proper explanation has to be given every time a samurai dies. If the land of iron finds out that a samurai died because you didn't allow him to be treated, you and your whole family might have to join your father. Even Lord Daimyo won't do anything to save you. His words caused the young master to be covered in sweat. He gritted his teeth and said, I will remember this. He quickly left the room and walked back towards his father. The doctor let out a sigh. He thought, I have completely offended him. Oh well, if I didn't, he'd have killed me anyway. As long as I save Isamu, I will be safe. Soon all the bleeding stopped. The doctor began the blood transfusion to stabilize his condition. He breathed a sigh of relief and said, he will be fine. His words caused relief to spread among the servants in the mansion. The doctor turned his attention towards the maid and inspected her. Soon he got up and said, she has just lost consciousness due to being terrified. She will be fine. The servants tended to both of them while waiting for the medical ninja to arrive. In around an hour, a medical ninja arrived. The doctor exchanged a few words with him and he began inspecting his samu. He nodded his head and said, you have done a great job. He weaved a few hand signs and extended his palms towards Isamu. Mystical Palm Jutsu Chapter 256 Chakra Poured from the Medical Ninja's Hands One by one, he completely healed every cut on Isamu's body. Only some scars were left behind. Soon, Isamu woke up. The memories of nearly dying returned to his mind. He sat straight and began sweating profusely due to fear. The medical ninja noticed his condition and placed his hand on his shoulder and said, Don't worry, you are all right. Do you recall what happened? His words snapped Isamu out of the shock. He looked down at his body and thought, I thought I was dead for sure. The enemy was much stronger than me. I was no match. Did he assume that I was dead and left in a hurry? He turned his eyes towards the medical ninja and became scared once again. He thought, First Asuna Umbu almost kills me and then Asuna Medical Ninja saves me? What the heck are these guys playing at? The medical ninja saw the fear in Isamu's eyes and frowned. It felt as if Isamu was afraid of him. He asked, Who injured you? Having just gotten another chance to live, Isamu didn't wish to risk it again. He replied, I can't say as I didn't see his face. I need to make a report to Lord Daimyo. After all, he killed the noble I was assigned to protect. At the same time, a doubt appeared in his mind, the ninja who attacked me was very well versed in winjutsus. He was a natural at it. But, could it be that someone from another village was impersonating to frame Suna? I was certain that he was from Suna. The only flaw is that he left me alive. After all, it wouldn't make much sense for him to not ensure that I am dead. The only way he would profit is if he is an enemy of Suna and the blame falls on Sunagakir entirely. He thought a lot but couldn't come up with a definite answer. He decided, leave it. I will report the event as it is to the daimyo. I will let daimyo make the decision. He was about to get up when the doctor softly said, Lord, we need your help. Isamu squinted his eyes and looked at him. The doctor informed the actions of the young master. Anger appeared in Isamu's eyes. However, he couldn't take action directly. He said loudly, Anyone who wants to leave this mansion can do so along with me. I will ask Lord Daimyo to ensure that you don't suffer injustice. Smiles and relief appeared on everyone's faces. They were about to leave the mansion when another samurai appeared in front of them. Isamu noticed him and quickly bowed down, Lord Hajime. Hajime was in charge of all samurais in the wind capital. He was also the strongest samurai in the wind capital. Hajime nodded and said, I received a report that noble Atsushi was assassinated. Is it true, Isamu? Isamu nodded, yes. I am ashamed. 
Hajime said, I trust that you gave your all, Isamu. So give me the exact details of what happened. Isamu didn't want to speak in front of everyone. He said, this. Lord Hajime, can we speak in private? Hajime nodded. Both walked into one of the many rooms in the mansion. Hajime said, speak. Isamu quickly reported the details of his clash along with his analysis. He ended by saying, all evidence points towards Sunagakir. However, I still have a nagging suspicion that something else might be happening. Hajime nodded and said, good analysis. I might have sided with you if not for other events that have happened the same time you fought. Isamu furrowed his eyebrows. Hajime continued, Atsushi wasn't the only noble who was targeted. Nine others were killed at the same time. In three cases, the culprits were able to escape undetected. Including you, seven samurais fought them. Unfortunately, five are already dead. Apart from you, only one is alive. But his condition is critical. Isamu's eyes widened. His back became covered in sweat. He muttered, I was lucky that he didn't check whether I was alive or dead. Hajime nodded. He added, everyone was injured with blades made of wind. This is a rather commonly used technique among the Jounans of Sunagakir. Though other villages could replicate it, sending ten expert wind users on the same mission is quite unlikely. Regardless, Daimyo is pissed at Sunagakir. Our country might also take some actions to avenge the death of our five comrades. Isamu had a bitter expression. He said, everyone can see that the daimyo has been upset with them since the time they lost in the Third Great Ninja War. We were unfortunately the ones to be caught in between them. Hajime agreed and said, yes. But, we can't take any decision regarding this. I have to meet with daimyo. You take care of your health. He was about to leave when Isamu stopped him and informed him about the actions of Atsushi's son. Hajime frowned and said, Leave the mansion and take everyone with you. I'll ask Daimyo to take appropriate actions for them. A family that treats people like this will fall no matter how rich or influential they are. He left the mansion. Following him, Isamu and every commoner employed in the mansion left, only leaving Atsushi's stunned family in the mansion. Back in the hotel, Fujin received the memories of his ten clones. He analyzed, everything went as planned. Now it's time to be patient. Throughout the night, samurais kept moving around the city. The security had become very tight. Many sudden inspections were being carried out. However, Fujin wasn't affected. It wasn't surprising as the number of civilians far exceeded the number of samurais and ninjas working under the wind daimyo. He did sense numerous chakra fields covering him. However, no one detected anything strange about him. These acts made the city quite tense. The next morning, two pieces of information spread through the city. The first one caused panic and restlessness among the civilian population. After all, ten nobles were murdered in broad daylight. If nobles who were protected by samurais weren't safe, then how could common people feel safe? However, the second news made everyone feel peculiar and amused them. Rumors floated in the city that a noble's family threatened to execute all servants. So everyone serving that family quit and left the mansion. The daimyo himself had given assurances that these people wouldn't be harmed. In addition, no new workers signed up to serve that family due to the bad reputation it gained, making them a joke in the wind capital. As the culprit behind the assassinations, Fujin was sitting relaxed in his room. He analyzed, these ten were all very close to Sunagakir according to the scrolls. Now that they are dead and Suna is the first suspect, their families will stop relying on Suna. Since the land of wind and fire are allied, Kanoha will become their new reliance soon. Even if they don't ally with Kanoha and continue the same level of interaction with Suna, it isn't actually our loss as just the status quo is maintained. In addition, the daimyo and remaining nobles will now be very alert against Sunagakir. Though they can't pin the blame on Suna, seeds of doubt will take root in their minds. Of course, just this isn't enough. I'll have to keep providing water to these seeds to create the required effect. 
numerous plans and schemes kept running through Fujin's mind. For quite some time, the wind capital was fated to remain restless. Chapter 257, Sunagakir, Kazakage Building A ninja was hurrying inside the Kazakage Building. Without waiting to knock and get permission, he opened the door and said loudly, Lord Raza, we have an important matter. Raza frowned. He was in a meeting. He looked at them and said, we will continue the talks later. Everyone nodded and left the meeting. Raza looked with annoyance and asked, what is the rush? Didn't you know that I was in an important meeting? The ninja replied, I am sorry, but this is important, Lord Raza. Ten nobles in the wind capital have died. Five samurais have also died. And we are the prime suspect. Raza frowned and asked, What did you say? The ninja handed him a scroll. Raza opened and began reading. The ninja said, It is suspected that all were killed using the blade of wind jutsu. And since all ten murders happened at the same time, they don't think any other village could have done this. Raza's expression became grim. He thought, Wind Daimyo's support for us has been decreasing continuously since the end of the Third War. I had just managed to stabilize our standing and was about to pull out of the alliance with Kanoha, but this happened. It will push the Daimyo even further away from us. His mood worsened as he cursed, which bastard is scheming against me? Kiri shouldn't be involved in this. So it should be either Haruzen or Inoki. But which one? He kept analyzing, the important matter is that ten ninjas simultaneously used Blade of Wind Jutsu. Is one of them building a specialist unit of wind? Raza thought for a bit and concluded, no, Blade of Wind is a Jounin level Jutsu. I doubt any of them would be willing to send ten of them here. The most likely possibility is that Wind Sword Jutsu was used. Gathering ten users of that Jutsu wouldn't be difficult for Konoha or IWA. Among the two of them, Kanoha is the most suspicious. If their number of wind users increases, their destructiveness on the battlefield will go up a few notches. But, for Haruzen to do this, did he discover my attempts to break the alliance? If so, this wouldn't be his only move. Raza's analysis was on point. Fujin's clones had all used wind sword jutsu to kill or injure their targets. However, Raza still didn't consider the point of someone using shadow clones. So he overestimated the number of attackers by a factor of ten. He looked at the ninja in front of him and said, Call Baki here. The ninja nodded and left. In a few minutes, Baki arrived. Raza tossed the scroll over to him and said, Read. Baki nodded and began reading. His expression became grim. Raza said, I want you to lead a squad of twenty ninjas to the wind capital. Find who the culprit is and clear our name. If you can't find the culprit, then stay there and ensure that no more incidents occur. At the same time, make sure that our reputation among the nobles and the wind capital improves. I suspect that Kanoha is behind this incident, but we can't rule out Awabakura either. They may want us to suspect Kanoha and break our alliance. So be on guard against both of them. Baki nodded, yes, Lord Kazakage. He immediately left and began preparations to leave. In a couple of hours, Baki along with nineteen ninjas at the rank of Chunin and above left towards the wind capital. Wind capital. Fujin was still staying in the same hotel. Due to being one of the most luxurious hotels in the wind capital, the impact of the stricter security and frequent checks wasn't felt much there. However, a samurai still visited to ask him some standard questions before leaving without suspecting anything. Fujin didn't make any moves in these two days. He thought, though I could still kill some targets irrespective of how much security the samurais provide, it won't help my mission. On one hand, the daimyo will begin considering why Suna is attacking despite being the prime suspect. So their suspicion of Suna will decrease instead of increase. On the other hand, if I overdo it, Daimyo and the other nobles might get terrified of Suna. They might stop increasing relations with Kanoha and obediently support Suna. I am sure Raza might just go ahead and begin killing the nobles himself as well until the Daimyo capitulates, taking full opportunity of my blunder. 
so my best course of action is to keep striking at regular intervals. Hmm. Fujin's attention was suddenly attracted. He got up and went to the balcony and looked at one of the entrances to the city. Though he wasn't actively sensing, he could feel that a group of ninjas with strong chakras were coming towards the city. He wondered, did Raza send a few ninjas? A smile appeared on his face. He thought, good, I was getting bored. Though this mission is quite relaxing, I don't want to do it much longer. After all, I can't train at all while staying here. The longer I stay here, the more time I will be wasting. Unfortunately, this mission requires me to stay here for around six months. But, if I can do a great job, I'll be able to leave early. Not to mention, this city doesn't deserve its name. Wind capital my ass. I have sent dozens of clones to find and steal any wind crystals here. Unfortunately, they have none. I had planned to steal the entire treasury of it, but I never thought they won't have a single one. What a waste. Fujin sighed and eliminated that thought. He had felt enough heartache over the last week due to this matter. He turned his attention towards the Suna ninjas and waited in anticipation for them to arrive. A few minutes later, Baki and his group entered the wind capital. His arrival immediately gained everyone's attention. Due to the incidents and the rumors, the common people were quite afraid of them. Even the samurais and other guards were alert against them. The moods of Suna ninjas became grim on seeing how much the public perception was against them. Seeing the circumstances, they immediately traveled towards the daimyo's estate. However, the entrance of the daimyo's estate was guarded by a dozen samurais led by Hajime. Baki greeted with a smile, Hajime-san, it's good to meet you again. I am here to deliver a message from Lord Kazakage to Lord Daimyo. Hajime replied with a smile as well, it is good to see you as well, Baki. I would have loved to escort you in. Unfortunately, Lord Daimyo is busy with important meetings due to recent events and has asked to not be disturbed. I'll have to politely ask you to wait here until he allows for visitors. Baki and the Suna ninjas frowned. The Daimyo was trying to humiliate them. Baki said, All right, I will wait here until Lord Daimyo sends a message. The Suna ninjas following Baki knew of the circumstances. So none spoke anything despite the blatant disrespect. Baki analyzed, a power play. The daimyo intends to show his displeasure by making us wait here. The longer we are made to wait, the more he is displeased. Still, he is also disrespecting our Kazakage. Baki looked at the ninjas behind him. They had run nonstop from Sunagakir to Wind Capital. He said, you guys can leave and have some rest. I will meet up after meeting Lord Daimyo. The ninjas nodded and left. Hajime was surprised. He analyzed, letting the ninjas leave signifies that he isn't here to fight. However, on the other hand, it also could be seen as an insult to the daimyo as he isn't making his subordinates wait patiently for the daimyo. Oh well, it is none of my business whether he worships or disrespects the daimyo as long as he doesn't attack. Baki and the rest had arrived in the wind capital in the morning. However, despite the sun being right on top of their heads, the daimyo still hadn't called Baki in. He kept waiting outside daimyo's estate until the sun began setting. Finally, when the sun was about to set, a messenger came out of the estate and whispered a message to Hajime. Hajime looked at Baki and said, Lord daimyo is finally done with his meetings. You can meet him now, Baki. Baki's mood was terrible. He was made to wait outside for nearly half a day. They didn't even bother providing him with any food, water, or even a chair. He walked in thinking, what a terrible mission I accepted. Raza-sama should have sent a diplomat along with me. Chapter 258 Baki entered the wind daimyo's office. It was a large circular room with a circular table at the center of the room. The daimyo was sitting on the chair exactly opposite Baki's location. Baki bowed respectfully and said, Greetings, Lord Daimyo. Lord Kazakage wanted to send you a message. He handed a scroll to the Daimyo. The Daimyo didn't speak a word and took the scroll and began reading. The scroll expressed condolences on the recent deaths. 
It also mentioned that Raza speculated that these attacks were done by Kanahadakur or Iwagakur. Baki said, Lord Kazakage heard about the recent assassinations and was concerned about the safety of everyone in the wind capital. He sent me here to investigate the assassinations and increase the safety of the wind capital. Neither Baki nor the scroll mentioned anything about clearing Suna's name. No words were needed for that. The daimyo replied while watching Baki carefully, the recent events have alarmed me. So I have reached a deal with the Land of Iron to send 200 more samurais here. Unfortunately, I don't have any access budget for it. So it will have to come out of the budget assigned to Sunagakir. Baki frowned. He said, Lord Dai. However, he was cut off by the wind daimyo, who said, Save your breath. My meetings today were all about this matter. All my advisors and ministers have agreed upon it. I will send an official letter to Raza soon. Baki knew that speaking any more would be pointless. He turned around and said, All right. I will start investigating the assassinations. He left without bidding any farewells. The daimyo saw him leave and let out a sigh while thinking, these warmongers keep getting more and more power-hungry. I had advised them against starting the Third Great Ninja War. But they completely ignored me and started it without my knowledge or permission. In the end, they lost so badly that they were forced into an alliance with Kanoha. Even then, they still haven't learned their lessons. The daimyo snorted and decided, if they want to continue being arrogant, so be it. He looked at Hajime and said, send that letter to Mifune. Hajime nodded and left the room. After leaving, Baki's mood was terrible. He could see that the daimyo was intent on making Suna pay for the recent assassinations. He muttered, at this rate, Lord Raza might decide to kill him instead of trying to come to terms with him. He met with the other nineteen ninjas. Soon they began investigating the deaths. After inspecting all the dead bodies, Baki concluded numerous clues. He analyzed, all fifteen bodies have very similar injuries. It's as if the same person has killed them. Or at the very least, all of them were probably trained by the same master. The wounds are definitely from wind blades. But the same effect could also be achieved by the wind sword jutsu. So it is likely that ten chunins had attacked instead of the speculated ten jounins. This alone should be enough to get rid of most of the suspicions from us. But, Baki frowned as he recalled his conversation with the wind daimyo and Hajime's attitude. He thought, unfortunately, the daimyo seems to be intent on making us pay. He won't pay any attention to this matter unless he has no other choice. In fact, even if we catch the culprits, he might still think that it is us framing someone else. Suddenly, Baki had an idea. He realized, the only way to completely remove all suspicions would be to catch the culprits in this city and fight them openly. As long as they use Winjutsus, no one will be able to blame Suna. The only issue here is that the fighting in the city could cause a lot of damage to the city. Baki's expression hardened as he decided, but, seeing how the Daimya treated us, I don't need to be concerned about such damages. As long as the culprits are from IWA or Kanoha, the daimyo will have no choice but to readjust the budgets and closely align himself back with us. Now, I just hope that those cowards haven't run away. The cowards, who Baki had referred to, was sitting in one of the restaurants where he could occasionally notice the Sunagakir ninjas. Numerous thoughts were running through his mind and numerous plans were being created. Fujin heard all the talks happening in the restaurant and outside. He thought, so twenty people were sent here just for me, huh? Looks like they didn't suspect shadow clones. And their leader is Baki. A smirk formed on Fujin's face, still, this is making it so easier for me. I have already seen six faces other than Baki. The next time, I will transform into them, ha ha. I wonder what Raza's thoughts would be if he received a message that the very ninjas he sent to investigate were being accused of murder. For the next couple of weeks, Baki and his squad searched the entire wind capital to find the culprits. Unfortunately, they didn't find anyone. In these two weeks, no new incident occurred. The wind daimyo and Hajime became more and more certain that the assassinations were carried out by the Sunagakir. Hajime wondered, 
Couldn't Suna come up with a better scheme? First they kill nobles and samurais here and then they put up a charade of trying to desperately look for the culprit. Next, they will say that they haven't found any culprit and hence will station some troops here permanently for protection. Even a child could see through this scheme. As Hajime predicted, after two weeks of desperately looking for the culprits, Baki stopped. He and his unit decided to stay there to stop the next wave of attacks. Another week and a half passed by peacefully. Most of the common citizens had begun forgetting about the incident earlier and moved on with their lives. Even the Suna ninjas and the samurai had stopped maintaining full alertness. In one of the numerous mansions in the wind capital, a teenage girl was watering plants in her room while singing merrily. Suddenly, she felt a pain in the back of her neck. Instantly, she lost consciousness and began falling down. However, a hand held her and stopped her from falling to the ground. At the same time, the door of the room opened. A middle-aged man walked in saying, Kohei, how many times should I te? Who are you? The man suddenly became stunned to see his daughter lying unconscious in the arms of an unknown Suna ninja. Memories of the ten assassinations surfaced in his mind. He was about to yell when the Suna ninja suddenly appeared in front of him and grabbed his mouth and said, Scream and both you and your daughter will die. The man felt an intense bloodlust from the ninja. Without letting the man speak, the ninja said, Did you think that you could double-cross us by forming a secret deal with Amage Cure? The man's eyes widened. The ninja was amused as well. He thought, I just made up a lie. To think that it would be true. The man wanted to scream that his deal with Amage Cure wasn't harmful to Sunagakure in any way. On the contrary, it might benefit Sunagakure in the long term. However, he could not speak. The ninja was still grabbing his mouth so tightly that his cheeks had begun bleeding. The ninja said, as this is just your first offense, I will only take the life of your daughter. The man's eyes widened. He began struggling, but he was no match for the ninja. The ninja continued, if you continue to betray us, or if you tell anyone about this interaction, then you and your family will be eliminated. The ninja grabbed the neck of the unconscious girl and strangled her till it popped. The man struggled helplessly, but he could only see his daughter die in front of his eyes. Tears rolled down his eyes. The ninja tossed the man away and disappeared. Rage and sorrow were visible in the man's eyes. He screamed, Kohei! His screams alerted the entire mansion. Immediately a samurai and a few others came running. They saw their lord sobbing with the dead body of his daughter in his arms. Her mother saw her dead daughter and began crying in disbelief and pain as well. She cried, Who did this, Kojiro? Kojiro's eyes reddened. He said hatefully, Sunagakure. I will never forgive them. He looked at the samurai and said, I want to meet Lord Daimyo. Come with me. But first, call a few more of your comrades to protect my family. The samurai nodded and immediately got to work. After ensuring sufficient protection, Kojiro along with a samurai began moving towards the daimyo's estate. However, he wasn't alone. Eleven more nobles were also walking towards the daimyo's estate in rage and sorrow. Chapter 259 Fujin received all the memories and sighed, I don't mind killing the greedy nobles. None of them have their hands clean. But killing innocent ones always leaves a bad taste. Though the training in Umbu wasn't as messed up as rude training, it still was quite dark. Every new Umbu was made to kill a few innocent people on missions by the Umbu captains. Of course, their deaths would benefit Konoha in some way, but they themselves didn't harm Konoha or anyone else. Hence no one would think that they deserved death. Under normal circumstances, every new Umbu would be made to do this within a month of joining the Umbu. However, since Fujin's group was much younger with ages of just 12 and 13, they were asked to do this on a mission around six months after joining and after they had already completed a few missions. Despite not liking it, all three did it. After the first time, the Umbu commander would ensure that every once in a while, the Umbu ninjas would receive a mission that would include killing innocent civilians. It would be asked of them in a very subtle manner. 
the method was the complete opposite of the root. Eventually, after years of serving in the umbu, the umbu ninjas would begin considering this as normal. Fujin, despite his intelligence and knowledge about the Naruto world, didn't notice this subtle scheme. But, to be fair, he wasn't the only one. Every umbu ninja, including the likes of Kakashi and Itachi, was subtly influenced over the years. However, since Fujin's time in the umbu wasn't very long, he wasn't influenced to an extreme end and would avoid it if he had the option. Of course, if anyone couldn't do this, they were allowed to leave the umbu. However, the instances of someone leaving umbu, for this reason, were very low. The main reason was that Hiruzen would be very careful while selecting ninjas into the umbu ranks. This was why someone like my guy was never invited into the umbu. Daimyo's Estate Twelve nobles accompanied by twelve samurais arrived in Daimyo's office. All reported the assassination angrily and demanded to the Daimyo to take action against Suna ninjas and the village as well. The entire room was in complete chaos. The wind Daimyo sighed. He wondered, what are these lunatics doing? Do they want to rebel against me? Or is it really someone else who is pushing the blame on them? The wind Daimyo was confused. At the same time, he was a bit fearful. After all, even though he held the authority, in terms of power, he was no match for the Kazakage. If the Kazakage decided to kill him, it wouldn't matter how many samurais he hired to protect himself. However, he shook his head and concluded, No, if Raza attacks me, then he will have to face retaliation from the other daimyos. Though their kages don't have to listen to them, they will as they could all plunder Sunagakir together and divide the benefits among themselves. The only fear is if three or more kage decided to revolt against their daimyo. In that case, we will be history. However, the other kages haven't shown any such indications yet. So Raza would not dare to make a move against me yet. Though he didn't want to take action, he couldn't let the grievances of the twelve nobles go unanswered. He instructed, call Baki and the other Sunagakir ninjas. Hajime, increase the defenses of the estate. Hajime nodded and said, it will be done, Lord Daimyo. He immediately got to work. Soon, over fifty samurais arrived at the Daimyo's mansion and took positions. Hajime stayed by the wind Daimyo's side. Baki received the message. He frowned and wondered, what now? Does the daimyo have any problems with us staying here? He gathered all his subordinates and went towards the daimyo's estate. Fujin was sitting in a restaurant near daimyo's estate using Hiroshi's appearance. He noticed the twenty Suna ninjas running towards the estate. He wondered, will they be imprisoned? Or will Baki manage to convince the daimyo? Sigh, I want to watch their meeting. It'll be fun for sure. Baki and the rest entered the estate. A frown formed on Baki's face. The remaining Suna ninjas also became alert. They could see that the number of samurais in the mansion had increased a lot. They walked to Daimyo's office. As soon as they did, the eyes of the nobles widened. Kojiro pointed at one ninja and screamed, it was him. This bastard killed my daughter. I want him dead. The other eleven nobles also screamed at the same time while pointing towards other ninjas. The room became complete chaos once again and was drowned in their screams. The Sanagakir ninjas were dumbfounded at the accusations. Baki had a bad feeling. The daimyo commanded, quiet down. Soon, the entire room became quiet. However, the nobles kept looking at the Sanagakir ninjas with hateful gazes. If looks could have killed, then all Sunagakir ninjas would have already been dead. Daimyo said, How would you explain this, Baki? Baki replied, I have no idea what you or they are talking about, Lord Daimyo. The Daimyo frowned. He analyzed, from his expression, it looks like he really doesn't know anything. The faces of others are clueless as well. But, do they really not know anything or are just acting? He said, Do you really not know? Twelve of your subordinates assassinated family members of these nobles. And you say you have no idea. Has the Kazakage decided to break all ties with me? Baki's bad feelings increased. 
He quickly replied, That's impossible. Why will we kill them? He looked at the nobles and identified a few. He added, Some of them have a good relationship with our village. We have no reason to destroy our ties with them. Kojiro screamed, You found out about my trade deals with Amage Kira. You killed my daughter to make me stop doing that despite that trade deal having no adverse impact on Sunagakir. Another noble screamed, Bastard, I don't even have any trade deals with any other country. Still this lunatic falsely accused me and killed my wife. The Suna ninjas immediately defended themselves and said that they didn't kill anyone. Soon, a verbal argument broke out. However, Baki was silent. He was sweating as he realized, don't tell me. The previous attackers kept hiding in the city until we dropped our guard down. In the meantime, they must have seen us and decided to disguise themselves as us to kill their next target. Additionally, there were two more attackers this time. The previous time, we were only suspected due to the use of the Winjutsu. However, this time, their suspicion will be entirely on us. Due to the rage of losing a loved one, they won't even listen to any explanations. Baki stopped his subordinates and said, Lord Daimyo, you know that ninjas are able to transform into others. I believe that the culprits of the previous assassinations disguised as us so that our relations will deteriorate further. Kojiro snorted, sure they can transform. But can they replicate their voice as well? Even if they can, how can they replicate his voice so perfectly? Even if someone transformed, it will have to be someone from your group. Baki was stunned. He muttered to himself, Don't tell me that we interrogated all the culprits and still didn't notice them? How else could they replicate our voice? However, Baki shook his head and said, We have been very active in the wind capital recently. It isn't surprising that they could have overheard us. Kojiro's anger kept soaring. He said, Good, good. So what you mean to say is that you are so incompetent that not only could you find the previous culprits, but instead you allowed them to completely disguise themselves as you? And you call yourself a ninja? This insult angered many of the Sunagakir ninjas. They immediately argued back and said how competent and capable they were. Kojiro replied while pointing at a ninja, If that's the case, then my daughter was murdered by none other than him. The Sunagakir ninjas were left speechless. Though they were much stronger in strength, when it came to debating, they were no match for the nobles who spent all their time scheming for benefits. After all, not every ninja could scheme or argue as well as Akage could. Baki stepped in once again and said loudly, This is a pointless argument. I can assure you that none of my ninjas were involved. He looked at the nobles and said, One by one, point out the ninjas you saw in your mansions and at what time. I will ask them where they were at that time and we will verify. That will prove that my men are innocent. Before the nobles could say anything, the daimyo nodded, All right, let's do that. The nobles complained but the daimyo said, We will first have to know the truth. Your loved ones won't rest in peace if the real murderers roam free while we punish the ones who didn't. Chapter 260 Since the daimyo had made his decision, the nobles quieted down. Soon, the twelve ninjas whom Fujin impersonated were being questioned. They all stated where and with whom they were and what they were doing. The samurais began verifying all the information and cross-checking it with people who could vouch that they were indeed in those locations. Eleven ninjas were around other people and hence they had multiple alibis. However, one ninja was hiding and doing an undercover task. Hence no one noticed him during that time. So despite telling his location, he had no alibi. The locations of the remaining eight ninjas were also asked as the nobles mentioned that they could have transformed. Even among them, except one, all had good alibis. The Suna ninjas left no stone unturned in order to clear their name. All proof indicated that the Suna ninjas were innocent and were framed. The nobles went quiet. Though two ninjas didn't have any alibi, the rest had them so they weren't sure anymore. However, they didn't want to give up. After all, their loved ones were killed in front of their eyes. If they assumed that someone else was the culprit, then they would never get justice. After all, 
the killers of the previous incident were still roaming free. No matter how much the families of the dead nobles cried and created a ruckus, they didn't get the justice they deserved. Suddenly, one noble recalled something. He quickly said, Can't ninjas use clones? What if they stayed there while their clones did their dirty work for them? After all, we can't put up a fight against clones either. Baki and the Suna ninjas were put under pressure once again. Baki said, according to what you described, the ninjas who attacked you had solid bodies. We use wind clones who don't have solid bodies and are easy to be dispelled. If your killers were clones, then they would be shadow clones of Kana Adakur or rock clones of Awabakur. None of us know how to do those clones. Hajime raised his eyebrows. He could counter Baki's point, but he didn't, as he recalled the scroll he received, Lord Miffian asked me not to take sides in this matter as long as no one is fighting. Though I don't like how Suna is behaving, I should let it go as it is in my business. In order to pacify the Land of Iron, Raza had reached a deal privately with them and compensated them appropriately despite not having committed the crime. As a result, Baki was saved from being pushed further into the corner by Hajime. One of the nobles asked, how can you prove that you can't create those types of clones? Baki was annoyed. He asked, How can you prove that we do? The noble didn't back off and replied, You can't prove that you can't create those types of clones. And two of your ninjas were still missing at the moment of the murders. Perhaps these two are the only ones who can create those types of clones and hence were missing. So you guys still are the most suspicious ones. Baki showed an annoyed expression. He argued, Do you think a ninja can create clones at will? Do you even know how much chakra is needed to create one? Despite showing an irritated expression, Baki was relieved. He thought, Good. From certainty, they have backed off to just suspicions. They entered another debate which lasted fifteen minutes. Finally, the daimyo said, Enough. You have made your point, Baki. But Yusuna ninjas are still the most suspicious ones. For the time being, I will be placing the twelve ninjas they saw and the missing ninja under arrest. As for the rest, you will be accompanied by samurais at all times. Baki's expression became ugly. He said, Lord Daimyo, you can't. However, the Daimyo interrupted him and said, Calm down. They will only be placed under house arrest and all thirteen ninjas will stay together. So you don't need to worry about them being treated unfairly. If you want, you can visit them daily. I'll send a letter to Raza and ask him to come here before this matter explodes beyond the point where we can resolve it. Baki analyzed for a few seconds and agreed to those terms. He gave some instructions to the thirteen ninjas and left the estate with the remaining six Suna ninjas. The remaining thirteen Suna ninjas were placed in a large room with samurais watching over them. Fujin noticed the seven ninjas leaving and began analyzing, only seven, left the estate? Meaning that thirteen are still in the estate. But I only impersonated twelve of them. After all, I heard only their voices and have no idea how the rest sounded. Did someone else also try the same tactic coincidentally? What exactly happened inside? Fujin kept analyzing but couldn't be certain. He concluded, since only seven came out, I am sure that they weren't let go scot-free. But since they seem fine, no conflict should have taken place. Meaning that Baki and the daimyo came to some agreement. Looks like I will have to wait for information to be released or for rumors to spread. Fujin got up and began leaving. He sighed and muttered to himself, why is everyone so smart? It'd have been so easy if they accepted the events as presented to them and just suspected Sunagakir blindly. I could have returned to Kanoha by now if they did so and their troubles would also end. Fujin returned to his hotel room and waited patiently. He knew that the next few days would be very tense in the wind capital. The wind daimyo soon sent a message to the Kazakage informing him about the recent events and asking him to come to the wind capital city. At the same time, Baki also sent a message to Raza informing him of everything that happened in detail. Sunagakir Unlike Fujin who was calmly bidding for time, Raza was absolutely livid. Raza crushed the scroll in his hand and cursed angrily, What the hell? 
who does he think he is? However, his advisors quickly said, Please calm yourself, Lord Kazakage. We are not in any position to make any move against Lord Daimyo. If something were to happen to him, all other villages would attack us like vultures. Raza calmed down and snorted, I will go and make a visit. You too, come with me. Also, bring our best censors along. The advisors nodded. They began gathering the forces and preparing to leave. Raza was disappointed in Baki. He wondered, what the hell is Baki doing? How could he allow things to deteriorate so much under his watch? Are the enemies so good that he is completely helpless? Not knowing the answers, Raza left Sunagakir along with two advisors, two censors, and four Umbu ninjas. At the same time, ten squads of Umbu left Sunagakir and began following Raza's group from a distance. In total, forty-six ninjas headed towards the Wind Capital City. Wind Capital Back in Wind Capital, rumors had begun flying around the city. These were being spread by the twelve nobles who were affected. Once again, the entire city began gossiping. Fujin heard a bunch of rumors as well. However, unlike a normal citizen, he noticed a bunch of inconsistencies. He analyzed, the rumors say that Daimyo has decided to punish the evil Suna ninjas. But I doubt that would be the case. Otherwise, Baki wouldn't have withdrawn peacefully. I guess the rumors are being spread by those nobles so that the daimyo is forced into taking action. But, why has the daimyo not made any statement? It's almost as if the daimyo wants these rumors to be known all through the city. Unlike Fujin, who was analyzing calmly, Baki and his subordinates were panicking. Baki too arrived at the same conclusion as Fujin. However, he had more information than Fujin. He realized, the daimyo isn't crushing these rumors as he wants a public perception to be built against Sunagakir. This way, when Lord Raza arrives, he will be under a lot of pressure. However, despite noticing daimyo's scheme, Baki couldn't do anything. After all, he was being watched by samurais at all times. The rumors would continue spreading unrestricted. At the same time, they would be exaggerated to ridiculous extents. However, after some time, all the rumors would be silenced by one piece of news, the fourth Kazakage had arrived at the wind capital city. Chapter 261 Irrespective of the rumors and politics, the Kazakage was still the leader of Sunagakir. He was one of the five people who stood at the top of the ninja world. As such, he was looked at with awe and reverence throughout the land of wind. Immediately people flocked over to the place the Kazakage was walking through most threw the rumors to the back of their minds. However, a few became alert. If the rumors were true, then it could mean trouble. After all, the Kazakage himself had to come to the wind capital city to clear up the matter. Raza continued walking through the streets slowly. He was followed by two advisors and two censors. The Umbu had stopped outside the city. As soon as the news of his arrival spread, people began rushing towards him. At first, only a few people were on the side of the street. However, in a few minutes, both sides of the streets were jam-packed. Raza looked at the people surrounding the streets with a smile. He could have hurried through to the daimyo's estate. However, he didn't as this was a good opportunity to show that he had public support and make the daimyo think twice about alienating him any further. Among the numerous people watching him was Fujin. Unlike his previously relaxed state of mind, he was very tense. He thought, shit, why the fuck did he show up? Granted I created a mess, but that shouldn't have been enough to call Akage here, right? Fujin wasn't concerned when Baki arrived as he was confident of escaping even if Baki somehow discovered him. However, if Raza was to find him, Fujin didn't have much confidence in his ability to run away. The resultant fight was sure to give away his identity as well. However, despite being tense, Fujin wasn't panicking as he knew he won't go around looking for the culprits. That would be unbecoming of Akage. I just have to avoid making any moves while he is in the city. His expression hardened as he decided, of course. Once he leaves, I will create a mess and leave the city for good. In the wind capital, 
Fujin wasn't the only one who was on alert. There were four more people whose expressions were ugly. One of them cursed, which bastard is acting so brazenly? How can I do my promotion mission when the Kazakage is in the city? Shit! I should have left when the samurais and the Suna ninjas had calmed down. A few Kanoha Umbu were in this city as well for the promotion mission. However, they all had to stop acting after Fujin killed ten nobles. Most of them had escaped the city in the week before Fujin made his second move. Only four had decided to continue their mission in this city. However, Fujin's actions endangered all of them. Just like Fujin, they decided to maintain a low profile as well. Along with Kanoha Umbu, there were dozens of other spies and undercover ninjas operating in the Land of Wind from every other village. They too cursed the bastard who operated in such a high-profile manner. Raza continued his journey towards the daimyo's estate. Baki had met up with him midroute and informed him about the rumors. Raza maintained a smile on his face, however, his mood was gloomy. He was extremely upset with the daimyo. Under everyone's gaze, he entered the daimyo's estate. Fujin sighed, I really need an inside man. How am I supposed to act when I have no idea what deal is taking place between them? Of course, Fujin could try to have his clones infiltrate the estate, but it would be very risky. If alerted, the daimyo would know that someone other than Raza is active in the wind capital city. That would be counterproductive for Fujin and would cause his previous efforts to go to waste. Fujin entered a restaurant and waited for Raza to leave the estate. However, he didn't expect to gain much, though he is younger and probably much more foolish, he is still a kage like that old fox. I doubt I'd see anything from his expression. But, since there are so many people here, one additional guy staring at him shouldn't alarm him. I might as well wait and see. Inside Daimyo's office, Raza and the wind Daimyo entered an intense debate. Raza was upset at how the daimyo had consistently cut his budget and placed his ninjas under house arrest. Meanwhile, the daimyo was upset at the blatant killings of his nobles. After a couple of hours of intense discussion, both finally reached a consensus. The daimyo said, All right. For the next twelve months, I won't lower your budget any further. However, you will have to ensure the safety of the nobles and the wind capital. Raza noticed an opportunity and immediately said, All right, you can issue missions for protection in Sunagakir. I will reserve up to 1,000 ninjas who will be ready to move out on notice. Unlike Kanoha, which was suffering from a shortage of manpower, Suna had plenty of spare manpower. Though their total number of ninjas was far lesser than Kanoha, the number of missions they received was very less compared to Kanoha. So many ninjas didn't have any work to do. Raza wanted to use this opportunity to alleviate some of that problem. However, the daimyo shook his head and said, No. That won't work. You will have to deploy the ninjas by yourself to ensure their safety. You won't receive any payments for this. Raza frowned. He said, How can that work? How will I even be able to afford that? The daimyo replied, Your budget has sufficient funds to be diverted here. Besides, most people in this city think that Sunagakir was behind the recent wave of murders. The nobles all think that you were behind the murders as well. So how can they even be willing to hire Sunagakir ninjas for protection? You will have to deploy ninjas in this city without any missions and ensure the safety of all the nobles. In time, they will forget about this event and their trust in Sunagakir will increase. If you don't, then don't expect a single mission from the Wind City. And if any more nobles or their families die and you are the suspect, then they will put pressure on me to reduce your budget. Raza's frown kept deepening. He wasn't sure how to respond. After all, both options were bad for Sunagakir. One of the old advisors sitting next to him said, Lord Daimyo, just like you, we also have to answer to public pressure. I understand your point of view, but please also understand our troubles. How about we find a common ground and you pay us an annual fee to deploy our ninjas in the Wind City permanently? The daimyo thought for a bit and nodded. After haggling for a bit, the old advisor managed to get 1.5 million rio per month from the daimyo. However, Raza wasn't happy. 
The amount was in no way even comparable to the amount of money that Sonagakir would have received if the nobles had issued missions. Unfortunately, he had no other choice. He nodded and said, All right. However, I have another condition. If there are no more incidents, then I want you to increase this amount next year by a huge amount. The daimyo nodded and said, That is fair. We will renegotiate the terms next year. The two talked for a bit before leaving. The thirteen ninjas that were kept under house arrest were allowed to leave with the Kazakage. However, instead of returning to Suna, Raza stayed in the city. He looked at two censors and commanded, Roam around the city in disguises. Check if there are any spies or troublemakers and eliminate them. They nodded and left. The news that the Kazakage has decided to stay in the city spread like wildfire. Every spy in the city, no matter from which village they were, immediately went into hiding. They employed every means they had to suppress their chakra levels to civilian levels and stayed hidden within the houses. Fujin stayed in his hotel as well. He had no intention to try his luck against Raza. However, he began analyzing, I made a Kage move. Will this make my mission a success? After all, Amir Chunin forced a Kage to make a move. Fujin thought for a bit and realized, no, there are two ways to see this. If I was being tested on my ability to make an impact, then this feat would be a very good one. However, my mission is to create a divide between the Wind Daimyo and the Kazakage. If this meeting results in their differences being resolved, then my mission would be a failure. Fujin sighed and muttered, what a mess. He decided, no more undercover missions for me. Though playing the game of chess is fun, I'd much rather just kill all my targets and return to training. Now that I think about it, it's been almost two months since I used the elemental training rooms. Hiruzen for sure would suspect that I was the one who kept draining the wind crystals. Oh well. It's not like he can complain. Even if he discovers, he will stay quiet so that I don't begin using them openly and without any restraints. The two censors Raza brought with him kept roaming in the city for three days. Fujin felt chakra fields sensing him several times. In these three days, the two censors found thirteen spies and undercover agents. However, they were all from smaller villages. No one from the other major villages was caught by them. The Sonagakir ninjas quickly made a move on them and neutralized them one by one. Their fights caused some property damage to the city. Unfortunately, none of them were wind users. So Sonagakir couldn't pin the blame on them. After three days, the two censors met Raza and said, Apologies, Lord Kazakage. We couldn't sense the culprits who did the assassinations. Raza replied, It's fine. If they didn't have the confidence to hide, they wouldn't have done something so outrageous in the first place. Anyways, begin preparations to leave. You and Baki will stay back here. I'll send some Ambu to coordinate with you in secret. At that instant, a group of twelve ninjas approached the city. The samurais guarding the city were already on full alert due to the recent events. They immediately noticed them. The group wasn't aware of the recent events in the city and approached the guards. Hayashi Ryota put one hand on the hilt of his sword and said loudly, Halt! State your name and purpose. The ninjas immediately stopped. One of them said, I am Oda Seiji. I come from Kurigane no Sensen mercenary group. Around a couple of months ago, a squad of our mercenaries was hired to escort a trading group to the city. But since then, we haven't heard anything from them. So we came here to investigate. Chapter 262 the mercenary group from which the real Hiroshi had hired protection had arrived in the wind capital city to investigate the reason why their comrades didn't return for almost two months. Ryota had handled several such cases in the past. In the majority of cases, this was a result of those squads being killed in action. He replied, I see. Can you tell me the names of the ninjas and the traitors? Seiji nodded and informed him of the names of his ninjas. He added, they were tasked to guard a mercenary group led by Takahashi Hiroshi. Ryota nodded and passed the details to a few civilians who used to sit with them. After a while, one person said, 
Ryota-sama. The ninja names they mentioned haven't arrived here. Seiji heard it and let out a sigh. He had expected this result. Suddenly, another person said, Takahashi Hiroshi and his trader group had arrived in this city 51 days ago. You were the one who accepted them, Ryota-sama. The mercenary group were surprised to hear this information. Ryota took the document and read it. He said, yeah, I have some memories. This group was very polite. Seiji squinted his eyes and asked, but if our members are missing, how can they have arrived here unharmed? Ryota shrugged and replied, how would I know? Seiji said, we want to meet with Hiroshi and question him. However, Ryota shook his head and said, unfortunately, I can't allow that. Once a trader or a merchant arrives in the city, he is our guest. We cannot allow him to be harassed. Seiji frowned. He withdrew a bag and handed it to Ryota secretly and asked, Can we meet up with him now? Ryota took a quick look inside the bag. It had around 100,000 Ryo. He smiled and said, Sure. How can I deny our esteemed guests? The mercenaries maintained their smile but scoffed internally at his morals. Meanwhile, the other samurais and civilians guarding the gate were joyous. After all, they too would receive a share. Ryota sent a samurai to find and bring Hiroshi to the gate. An hour later, a samurai knocked on the door. Fujin was surprised. He wondered, are they still finding the culprits? He opened the door and politely greeted, Hello. How may I help you? The samurai looked at him and said, Hayashi Ryota, the samurai who you met while entering the city wants to meet you. Please come with me. Fujin frowned. He didn't understand what it was about. He asked, Why? And why didn't he come here? The samurai said, He is busy and can't leave the city gates. That's why he sent me. As for the reason, you will have to ask him. He began walking. Fujin followed while thinking, What the hell is this about? Did they figure out that I was the culprit? No, that doesn't make sense. A lot more people would show up if they did. Hell, Raza might come himself. Fortunately, the samurai wasn't walking in the direction of where Raza was staying. Though suspicious, Fujin followed thinking, it doesn't matter what he is planning. As long as Raza isn't involved, I'll be able to get away. They arrived at the city gates. Ryota looked at Hiroshi and warmly said, We meet again, Hiroshi. Did you enjoy the city? Fujin nodded and said, Yes. I have fallen in love with the city. I can't seem to want to leave it. Ha ha. But, why did you call me? Ryota pointed at a group of ninjas who were walking towards them and said, These are from the mercenary group Kirigane no Sensen. They want to ask you about the ninjas who took the mission of protecting you. Ryota looked at Fujin meaningfully. After all, there were no ninjas protecting his group. And he hadn't mentioned them when they arrived. Fujin was surprised. He thought, I see. They have finally come to investigate. Sign, such bad timing. If they had arrived after Raza left, I would have had so many more options. Looks like this identity can't be used anymore. Though it is probably not a bad thing to leave the city now. Raza and Daimyo should have come to some sort of a deal. So if I make a move now, the Daimyo will lean more towards believing that someone is setting him up. Seiji approached Fujin and said sternly, Hiroshi, I am Oda Seiji from Kirigin no Sensen. Can tell me why your group arrived in the city without the squad assigned to protect you? Unlike Ryota, Seiji was much more aggressive. Fujin walked back a couple of steps and showed a fearful expression. Ryota took a step in between them to remind Seiji that this was the wind capital city. Seiji stopped but still stared at Fujin. Fujin answered with a hint of fear in his voice, On our route, we encountered an injured man. He said that his group was attacked by bandits and asked for our help. The ninjas we hired initially refused the injured man. But the man promised to give them all his profits from the goods that he was going to trade. That made them change their mind. Two of the ninjas followed the man while the remaining two escorted us to the city. However, 
since we didn't hear from those two ninjas again, the other two got worried. So after this city was in sight, they left us and went back to look for them. I don't know what happened after that. Seiji frowned. He analyzed, seeing how scared he is, I doubt he is lying. Besides, we are a mercenary organization. People chasing after more money is very common in our line of work. Did they fall into a trap? And why did the remaining two chase after them? No, something doesn't add up. He asked, where did you find that man? Fujin replied, around four days journey from here. Seiji replied, okay. You will come with us and take us to that place and help us find them. Fujin immediately said, no. The man was in a very bad state. I don't want to end up like him. Seiji replied, you won't. We will be there with you. However, Fujin kept saying no. When Seiji was about to get aggressive, Fujin said, this is the wind capital. You can't forcefully take me from here. Seiji frowned and looked at Ryota who looked to be on Fujin's side. He said, help me out, brother. I will make sure that he is safe and that you are compensated. Fujin immediately wondered, compensated? Ryota nodded and looked at Fujin and said, Hiroshi, you don't need to be worried. With twelve ninjas, even I won't be able to do anything to them. So the bandits won't pose a threat to you. In addition, you need to save the ninjas who brought you here safely. Or at the very least, you should get justice for them. Seeing that everyone was against him, Fujin's face became very ugly. He reluctantly nodded, all right. The samurais and the mercenaries smiled. After all, Hiroshi was just an ordinary trader. How could he disobey them? Seiji secretly passed another hundred thousand ryo to Ryota. Fujin obviously noticed it and decided, in the future, if I decide to steal or plunder, I will definitely start with the land of iron. In terms of cash flow, that will definitely be the richest country in this world. This wasn't the first time Fujin had seen an honorable samurai act in this manner. Almost every samurai working for daimyo or in capital cities was very liberal when it came to accepting bribes. In addition, the daimyos also paid them a lot for the protection they provided. In addition, they were also the largest suppliers of basic ninja tools and chakra metal weapons and also mined the last few remaining elemental crystal mines. So a lot of money keeps getting funneled continuously into the land of iron. They were about to leave when suddenly a commotion was heard. The entire group looked back to see the Kazakage walking towards the city gate along with a few Sunagakir ninjas. Everyone immediately became tense. They quickly moved out of the way and stood on one side of the road respectfully. Raza passed through the gate without paying any attention to them. The mercenary group sighed in relief. However, Raza suddenly stopped and glanced towards the mercenary group and thought, Weird, why do I get a peculiar feeling from this group? Raza didn't sense anything from this group. However, he just felt as if something about them was off. Chapter 263 one of Raza's advisors asked, What's the matter, Lord Kazakage? Raza turned around and continued walking. He asked, Who are those people? Though his voice wasn't soft, Fujin and the mercenaries didn't hear it due to the distance between them. The advisor answered, They are wearing the headband of the mercenary group Kuragain no Sensen. It is the group that is active in the countries between us and Earth. Is there any issue with them? Raza replied, it's just a feeling. Send three Umbu groups to chase after them. I have a feeling that we will find something important by trailing them. The advisor nodded. The mercenary group had become very tense and nervous when Raza glanced at them. Even Fujin was the same. He didn't have any desire whatsoever to face Raza. Especially when they were surrounded by deserts. When Raza turned around and continued walking, the mercenaries finally began breathing again. Fujin also became visibly relaxed. He decided, all right, no more mess in this city. Though unlikely, if this is his clone and his main body is hiding inside the city, I will be in deep trouble. After Raza left their line of sight, the mercenary group immediately left the wind capital. 
one of them carried Fujin on his back so that they would be able to move faster. For once, Fujin didn't object. After Raza's group moved a sufficient distance from the city, forty Umbu ninjas appeared in front of them. Raza immediately assigned tasks to them. Three squads of Umbu chased after the Kuragain no sense and mercenaries. For squads were tasked to sneak into the wind capital and keep an eye on the city from the shadows. They would coordinate with Baki to catch all undercover enemy ninjas in the city. The last three squads would keep an eye on the surroundings of the wind capital and keep track of the people traveling in and out of the city. Raza and the advisors immediately began traveling back to Sunagakir. The mercenary group continued without knowing that they were being followed. Since Fujin couldn't activate his chakra field, even he was unaware. Fujin acted like he was helpless and obediently guided them towards the location. After traveling for nearly half a day, the group arrived at the spot where Fujin had killed their members. Fujin said, This is the spot where we met that man. He was sitting here and was covered in blood. Seiji looked at Fujin. Fujin looked very tired and sleepy. The mercenaries didn't find it odd as it was late at night and they had traveled for twelve hours straight. Seiji asked, Are you completely sure? Fujin looked nervous and said, I am confident. However, this is a never-ending desert. Everything looks the same. So I can't be 100% sure. Seiji looked sinisterly and said, You better hope that we find them. Otherwise, you will have hell to pay. Even your family won't be spared. Fujin's face became nervous and said, I am sure that we met that man around here. Seiji looked around and said, Everyone, investigate the nearby area. See if you can find any tracks. Everyone nodded and began looking. The group had a couple of sensors. They spread their chakra fields and began investigating. For a couple of minutes, they didn't find anything. Fujin observed them. The nervousness on his face faded away. He decided, it's time. He was about to flicker when the eyes of one of the sensors widened. He shouted at the top of his lungs, everyone, gather together. Fujin hadn't used his chakra yet. He was surprised and stopped his plans. Immediately, all twelve ninjas gathered next to each other. Seiji asked, What did you sense? The censor said loudly, We have been led into an ambush. Seiji and others looked at Fujin and stared at him. Fujin was dumbfounded. He thought, The one who is supposed to ambush you is me. Who else is here? Did those four I killed become zombies? Seiji grabbed Fujin's collar and cursed, Hiroshi, you dare lead us into an ambush? Fujin became alert. He could have killed Seiji, but he was on guard against who their censor had sensed. He said, I have no idea about any ambush. At the same time, he raised his guard to the max. If Seiji or anyone else would have any thoughts of killing him, he would retaliate. Before Seiji could retort or take action, twelve Ambu ninjas of Sunagakure appeared in front of them. One of them said, I wonder what Kuragain no Sensen ninjas are searching for in the land of wind. He took a look at Fujin and added, That too with a civilian leading you. Seiji replied, Our squad that was assigned to protect them went missing. We are investigating them. The Ambu ninja said, Nice story. I will have to ask you to surrender without a struggle. Otherwise, it won't end well for you. A glint appeared in Fujin's eyes. He thought, good. These two can fight each other. No one will waste their time on a civilian. Once one of them wins, I will kill the survivors. However, suddenly his eyes widened. Seiji grabbed Fujin with more force and said, interrogate the civilian. You can verify our story from him. He lifted Fujin and threw him at the Suna Umbu ninjas. Fujin shouted in panic, Wait, don't do this. Bastard, you promised my safety. However, he was still sent flying towards the Umbu. He cursed, Shit, I wanted to take advantage of their fight and kill them all. But he pushed me to the center of it. The lead Umbu smirked behind his mask and grabbed a kunai. He swiped it at Fujin while keeping his eyes on the mercenaries and saying, Do you think that you can get away by using a civilian as a distra? 
Suddenly, one of the Umbu ninjas shouted, Be careful. Fujin was just one meter away from the Umbu who was swinging a kunai at him when he opened his mouth and exhaled extremely sharp winds on the unsuspecting Suna ninjas. The attention of the Suna ninjas was on the mercenaries. The attack caught them off guard. The lead Umbu ninja was hit head on. The wind slashed through his neck and beheaded him. Both his detached head and body had several deep cuts from which blood sprayed out like fountains. Nine more ninjas suffered a similar fate. They fell with their eyes wide open, not expecting to die so suddenly on a simple mission. Only the umbu who shouted and the umbu next to him jumped backwards in time to dodge the attack. Fujin noticed them in the air and flickered, appearing behind them in the blink of an eye. Both grabbed their kunai and turned around to face him. The mercenary group was dumbfounded. They had examined Fujin before leaving and hadn't found anything suspicious about him. They saw Fujin open his mouth and shot multiple air bullets. The last two Suna Umbu had their bodies riddled with holes. Both fell down dead like the rest of their comrades. Having killed all the Suna ninjas, Fujin turned his gaze towards the mercenaries. In an instant, everyone grabbed their weapons and watched Fujin with grim expressions. The Suna group who they were afraid of was slaughtered with ease by the traitor they forcefully brought along with them. Seiji asked, Who are you? And why did you hire one of our squads if you are so strong? Seiji obviously realized that the person in front of him was in disguise. However, he wasn't if he had disguised as Hiroshi all along or if he had replaced Hiroshi later. He decided to act oblivious to leave an escape for himself. Fujin realized it and thought, good attitude. Unfortunately, you shouldn't have taken the initiative to bring me out of the city. Without a word, Fujin disappeared. Their censor immediately shouted, on our right. Everyone turned their heads, only to see a gigantic wind dragon heading towards them. They immediately dispersed. The dragon tackled the spot they were standing at and exploded, causing winds to spread through the area. The winds immediately sent the sand flying in the air. Not only did it lower the visibility in the area, the sand would enter the eyes of anyone who would keep them open. Unlike Fujin who could sense, their group had just one sensor. Without the ability to see and knowing how strong and treacherous their enemy was immediately caused panic to spread. In the dust cover, Fujin flickered behind the mercenary who had shouted his position. The mercenary turned around and shouted, He is here. He immediately jumped backwards while keeping a kunai in front of him defensively. However, Fujin just took a step forward and swung his sword at the mercenary. The mercenary tried defending, but the sword cut straight through his kunai and split him into two. Without the censor, the remaining mercenaries were left blind in the desert. Fujin killed them all with extreme ease in just a couple of minutes. Chapter 264 the winds died down and the sand settled back in the desert slowly. The blood was automatically buried under the sand. Fujin had already stored all 24 dead bodies and scrolls. He also collected the scroll containing the dead bodies of the four ninjas who were protecting Hiroshi's trading group. He analyzed, with 12 mercenaries and the same number of Suna Umbu missing, the deserts will soon become very chaotic. Returning to wind capital will be pointless and very risky. I should eliminate a few targets who are outside the city quickly and return to Kanoha. Having made his decision, Fujin began moving towards his targets. Ten minutes after Fujin left, a squad of Sanagakir ninjas arrived where the fighting had taken place. One of the Chunin said, It doesn't look like anyone was here, Captain Yura. Yura frowned and said, It looked like there was a huge battle here. It should have just ended. Inspect the area. We may find some clues. Since Yura was the team leader, everyone obediently followed his instructions. For half an hour, they didn't find anything. Suddenly, one of the ninjas shouted, Everyone, come here. Immediately, everyone approached him. He had dug the sand a few meters and was standing in a hole. As soon as they reached him, everyone's face became solemn. The sand was dyed red in blood. And it wasn't just a little bit either. One of the ninjas commented, So much blood-soaked sand. How many people were killed here? 
The spot they were standing on was where Fujin had killed ten of the twelve Anbu ninjas from Suna. Though he had collected their bodies, the blood had seeped into the desert. Fujin didn't bother getting rid of it as it would require a lot of effort and time without providing him with any benefits. Yura said, it looks like someone killed a bunch of people here. They didn't bother cleaning up all the evidence thinking that no one would find it there. Unfortunately, they didn't think that we would sense their battle and come investigate so quickly. Unknown to the Suna ninjas, it was their good luck that the killer didn't waste time clearing all the evidence. Otherwise, they would have run into Fujin and joined their comrades on the trip to the afterlife. One of Yura's teammates countered, but who would be so brazen in our country? I think it might be the work of someone from our village. That is why they weren't concerned about others finding out. Yura nodded and said, could be. Regardless, collect as much of this blood-soaked sand as you can. Others will keep scouting this area. If it was an intense battle, then everyone wouldn't die in the same place. We will carry the blood samples to Suna. If it was done by someone else, then it will help the village a lot. His team immediately got to work. They spent over half a day searching the entire area and managed to collect blood samples of all 24 ninjas who were killed. Of course, they didn't know that and kept searching for hours despite finding all the blood samples. Finally, at noon the next day, they stopped searching and continued their journey to Sunagakir. At the same time, Fujin was running across the desert. He let out a sigh and muttered, This country is too damn big. Though the land of wind didn't have many resources, in terms of land area, it was the largest country in the ninja world. The deserts went on for thousands of kilometers to the west. Due to this, the country was incredibly difficult to be invaded. It was one of the factors why Kanoha didn't push into the land of wind despite inflicting grave damage on Suna in every major war. The large size of the country meant that there were some cities in the west that were very far from the land of fire. Due to their geographical location, they had no choice but to be completely subservient to Sunagakir. Kanoha and the other villages had zero influence in this area. So Shikaku wanted to weaken Suna's influence by targeting cities and towns in this area. Yura's squad traveled a few hours through the desert towards Sunagakir when they encountered another squad. Yura noticed them and immediately stopped and greeted respectfully Elder Monabu. Elder Monabu was in his fifties and a member of the Sunagakir Council. He had an illustrious career and made many contributions during the Second and Third Great Ninja Wars. So Yura was very respectful. Monabu didn't bother making any small talk and asked, Yura, you are coming from the land of bird, right? Did you see any Ambu or mercenaries on your way here? Yura shook his head and said, No, but the place we passed through had a huge battle. We probably missed it by less than fifteen minutes. We didn't see anyone there but a lot of blood was spilled there. We estimated that at least eighteen people were gravely injured. Monabu frowned. He had been dispatched by Raza after they lost communication with that group of Umbu. He analyzed, Kazakage-sama said that he sent three squads of Umbu to chase them and the mercenary group had twelve ninjas and one civilian. Eighteen grave injuries could mean that one of the two forces was wiped out. Suddenly, he had a very bad feeling. He muttered to himself, if our Umbu won, they would have returned or at least sent a message. Does that mean that they lost to merely mercenaries? But how could our Umbu lose to mercenaries? And how did they avoid Yura's group? Did they escape into the desert instead of continuing their journey? Monabu asked, Yura, did you spot any tracks leading the battlefield? Yura shook his head. Monabu frowned and asked for the blood samples. He took it from Yura and handed it to one of his subordinates and said, Carry this back to Sunagakir and have them inspect the blood. Also, ask Lord Kazakage to prepare multiple units. We may need to scout the entire desert. Yura, you and your squad lead us to the spot where you notice the combat. Yura replied, but we have to hand over the mission report. Monabu instructed, pass it to him. This could be an emergency. I might need all the help that I can get. Yura nodded and said, all right, elder. He handed another scroll to him and they began their journey back. 
Yura's squad had already consumed soldier pills. So they could continue running. The group returned to the spot where Yura had collected the blood-soaked sand. They investigated a lot but didn't find anything substantial. Around the same time, Raza received Manabu's message. He immediately reached the same conclusion as Manabu and frowned. He muttered, first the issue with the daimyo and now twelve umbu went missing? What is happening in my country? He immediately got to work and began arranging more squads to reinforce Manabu while analyzing, looks like my suspicion on the mercenary group was right. But, that group didn't look strong enough to take on my umbu. Was someone hiding their strength? Or did I underestimate the goals of the group creating a mess in the wind capital city? Raza overcalculated as he didn't have a clue about Fujin. His umbu died just because they were unlucky enough to encounter him. Since they had no success, Monabu's group began moving towards the wind capital city to investigate the reason for the appearance of the mercenary group. At the same time, they wanted to investigate the civilian with them. After another half a day, they finally arrived in the wind capital city. Monabu quickly moved towards the city gate where they were spotted and found Ryota. Despite not being under Sunagakir, Ryota greeted the elder warmly. Monabu directly asked, Tell us about the mercenaries from Kuragin no Sinsen with whom you were talking a few days ago. Ryota was surprised by the question. He said, They came here over two days ago when the Kazakage left the city. They were investigating their four-man squad that went missing while escorting a trader group. Their circumstances were quite weird as the trader group made it to the city without any harm but all the four ninjas were missing. Monabu frowned and said, The trader group is very suspicious. Ryota nodded and informed him about the remaining details. He ended by saying, The trader Hiroshi was worried about their safety. So he volunteered to go with them to tell them where they saw the man. Ryota lied with a straight face. Instead of saying that he was forced, he said that Hiroshi volunteered. However, this lie helped Monabu as he became even more suspicious of Hiroshi. He said, Give me the details of where Hiroshi stayed. Also, gather the remaining eleven traders and have them meet me. Ryota was about to say no as Monabu had no right to order him around. However, Monabu added, I have a suspicion that this group might have something to do with the recent murders in the city. Ryota became serious and immediately nodded. He asked his subordinates and informed them about the hotel where Hiroshi stayed. As for others, he would need some time. Monabu nodded and began moving towards the hotel. He muttered, Twelve traitors, twelve assassins, twelve mercenaries. I think we are finally getting some clues. Chapter 265 As they were walking, Yura asked, Elder, what assassinations took place in the Wind Capital City? Yura and his groups weren't in the Land of Wind when Fujin was creating a mess. So they were unaware. Manabu's subordinates filled them up. Yura and his subordinates began sweating having realized how much trouble their village was in. After hearing the circumstances, they couldn't help but suspect that their own village was behind the assassinations. They understood how others would have felt. The group reached the hotel where Fujin had stayed and entered his room. The room was impeccably clean. They began investigating the room. After half an hour, every single one had an ugly face. One of Yura's subordinates said, There is nothing here that could point us to him at all. It's as if no one has lived here for months. Another said, But the hotel staff said that he lived here for over seven weeks. A third ninja commented, Maybe the hotel does such a good job cleaning that all evidence is wiped out. However, one of Monabu's subordinates shook his head and said, No. No matter how well they clean, their scent gets left behind. But there is no scent in these rooms. This guy is not a civilian for sure. He should be a well-trained Umbu ninja from some country. Everyone agreed with his analysis. Yura added, If he is, then the other traders should be as well. And they didn't leave the city. We can catch them and clear our village's name. Monabu nodded and said, Baki is leading our ninjas in this city. Let's meet up with him. He must have an appropriate plan for when we catch the culprits. Everyone nodded and left. When Baki received the news, 
he was elated. He had been under a lot of stress for the last few weeks. No matter how much he worked, he never found any clue. The entire job was a dead end. Since Manabu cracked the case, he immediately deployed his ninjas in the city to find the remaining eleven traitors. Unfortunately for Baki, even this clue was a dead end. They searched nonstop for two days. However, no matter how much they looked, they didn't even catch a whiff of those eleven traitors. It was as if they had long disappeared from the city. No one even remembered their faces. Only a few merchants who earned big profits from their trade recalled them. But they hadn't seen them again for almost two months. So their memories were useless for Suna ninjas. Baki sighed and muttered, I should have known that it wouldn't be this easy. Manabu nodded and said, they probably changed their disguises after entering the city. He looked in the direction of the city gate and added, Fortunately, we can soon be able to inspect every citizen in this city. Manabu's words confused the Suna ninjas other than Baki. Baki and Manabu moved towards the city walls and jumped on top of it. The other Suna ninjas followed them. As soon as they saw the sight outside, their eyes widened. Most were too stunned to speak. Finally, one muttered, This is insane. Outside the walls were numerous figures running towards the city gates. A total of 334 ninjas were sent by Raza to keep the Wind City safe in accordance with his deal with the Wind Daimyo. Yura asked in surprise, Did Lord Kazakage send these many ninjas to help us search the deserts? Baki replied, No. They will be stationed in the Wind Capital to prevent such incidents in the future. It was a deal between Lord Kazakage and the Daimyo to settle our differences. Seeing that these were their reinforcements, the Suna ninjas were elated. Excitement coursed through their bodies. With such numbers, finding spies would become extremely easy. Sunagakir ninjas received a warm welcome. Baki immediately made arrangements for everyone. After settling them, Baki immediately began acting on his plan. He cooperated with the city guards to get records of every citizen officially living in the city. He informed the ninjas of their task. He planned to inspect each and every person in the city. He wanted to find any person living in the city who was unregistered. That could help him find the eleven traders who were under different disguises. At the same time, he planned to deploy sensors throughout the city. Those spies could disguise themselves as civilians, completely hiding from sensors inside the city would be much more difficult. Especially since there were a few extremely capable sensors with him. Unfortunately, before Baki could begin his search, another Suna ninja arrived in the wind capital and rushed straight to Baki and handed him a scroll. Baki opened and read it. His eyes widened and his expression became very grim. Manabu was surprised. He asked, What does the scroll say? Baki handed him the scroll. Manabu read it and immediately became angry. He cursed loudly, which heinous bastard did this? The Suna ninjas became curious. However, the messenger said, Elder Manabu, Lord Kazakage has asked you to travel to Sabakwetsu. Yura will assist you. In addition, five squads of Umbu and thirty squads of varying strengths have moved out of our village and are currently heading towards Sabakwetsu. Manabu nodded. He and Yura along with their squads left immediately. Another scroll with a similar message reached the hands of the daimyo. He too became solemn. Soon, the news spread throughout the city causing panic to spread. Daimyo did his best to quell the panic. His assurances calmed the citizens of the Wind City and brought stability back to the city. Twelve hours ago, Fujin traveled for over three days through the desert to finally reach the city called Sabakwetsu. He let out a sigh and muttered, the distance between this city and Sunagakir is larger than the distance between Konoha and Sunagakir. Though Fujin took a few breaks, he wasn't a fan of traveling for so long through non-stop desert. He couldn't help but wonder, in these three days, I encountered two sandstorms. They didn't affect me due to my expertise in wind release but I can't help but wonder how civilians even trade across these huge and treacherous deserts. Fujin began inspecting the defenses of the city from the outside while recalling the information about the city mentioned in the scrolls provided by Shikaku. 
Sabaquetsu was a mid-sized city in the far west of the land of the wind. Though it wasn't the largest city, it was one of the most important cities for one critical reason. The city was surrounded by numerous oases and received a decent amount of rainfall every year. Due to this, it had the highest agricultural production in the entire land of wind. Overall, around 60% of the total agricultural production in the land of wind would be obtained from this city. Due to this, it provided food to all the cities and villages in this region, thus saving the land of wind a lot of trouble to transport food across the vast desert. In addition, it also sent some food supplies to the wind capital and Sunagakir and helped them reduce dependence on other countries for food. For this reason, Sunagakir permanently deployed eight squads to protect the city. In addition, one elite Jaunin would always be deployed in the city. Fujin observed the defenses and analyzed, though the city is important, the defenses aren't very high. The reason for this is that Sunagakir doesn't expect anyone to hit them so far away. In addition, the samurais won't protect this place because of how far into the desert it is. Still, the city does have an elite Jaunin. Killing him would be troublesome. Especially if there are Jaunins to reinforce him. Unless I can take him by surprise like those on Bu. Fujin analyzed and shook his head, no, that would be difficult. If I fight him and fail to kill him, then he will gain a lot of my information. It would be troublesome if they get enough information to calculate later on that it was me. I shouldn't use my summons or vacuum techniques in my fight unless I am sure that I can kill all who see me use them. The same for my famous swords. Probably best if I avoid using my swords completely. The city had two entrances and was surrounded by huge walls. Each entrance had two ninjas watching over it. The walls did have seals inscribed in them, but they weren't as complicated as the wind capital city walls. Fujin planned, I could enter the city through the gates by using disguises of one of the people who leave the city to work in the fields. However, if they follow a certain routine, then entering at odd times will raise suspicions. Fujin thought for a bit and decided, leave it, it's late at night. They won't leave the city for hours. I'll try to infiltrate directly. If I fail or am detected, I'll just escape and replace one of the citizens working outside. Fujin began working on the seals. He was a bit excited as he had never yet attempted to dismantle the seals of an entire city. The most fun he had with seals was messing with Haruzen in the wind training rooms and the Umbu training facilities. Chapter 266 Fujin spent a few hours studying the seals on one section of the wall. Due to hiding his chakra and the massive length of the wall, he wasn't detected or seen by anyone. Finally, the sun rose. And at the same time, a smile appeared on Fujin's face. He muttered, it's cracked. He summarized, these seals are inscribed by a grandmaster. However, the wall is huge. Whoever inscribed it wasn't very dedicated and did the bare minimum to ensure the safety of the city. However, even if he had been serious, I would have managed to break through. Though I would have needed a lot more time. Hmm, maybe while I return, I should swing by the wind capital and leave a few clones to try to break through the seals there. It would be a good test. Fujin entered the city and transformed into one of the people he saw in wind capital. Fujin didn't waste much time and directly began visiting the important locations. He thought to himself, for ninjas were at the gates. There should be 28 more ninjas in the city. I wonder if they are also deployed or are resting in the city. Fujin's guess was accurate. The ninjas in the city were divided into three groups. The first group of 12 ninjas were responsible for keeping an eye on the city gates and eight-hour shifts. The next group of 12 ninjas were also responsible for protecting two crucial locations. The last group of eight ninjas and one elite Jaunin would stay on standby in case an emergency occurred. Of course, due to how peaceful the city was, every one of them had gotten complacent. Fujin walked towards his target. Soon, a huge fortified structure with sturdy walls that were designed to withstand not only the harsh desert conditions but also any attack by enemy ninjas became visible. This sturdy structure was one of the two provision depots in Sabakwetsu. It stored a vast amount of harvested food grains and other food items that could be stored. 
These depots served as a lifeline for the entire western region of the country. Fujin didn't sense any chakra field active around him or the provision depot. So chakra gathered in his eyes and observed inside the depot. He observed, so this place has only two ninjas. I guess the other depot also has two ninjas overlooking them. But what exactly are these guys doing? I can feel that both of them are very tense. Fujin was curious, but he didn't care much. He decided, it doesn't matter. They are only chunins. His expression became serious as he observed the seals inscribed on the depot walls. He muttered to himself, the seals are much better than outside city walls. And I can't keep studying this one for hours. Looks like it's time for the dynamic entry. Chakra gathered around his fist. The people who were walking around him were surprised and immediately looked towards Fujin. They noticed that his right fist was glowing. One kid said, Mom, look. His hand is glowing. Another kid asked, How can I do that, Mom? The people were just normal civilians. They hadn't seen ninjas in action. Suddenly, Fujin disappeared. Though the walls had very good protection, the same couldn't be said about the doors. Fujin punched the door and smashed it into pieces. The two Suna ninjas inside the depot were playing a game of cards. Suddenly, they heard a loud noise and felt the entire depot shaking. The noise generated by the impact of the punch traveled hundreds of meters through the city. The people who were watching the glowing fist curiously became terrified. They immediately ran away. At the same time, the elite Jounin and the other ninjas in the city became alert. Fourteen ninjas along with the elite Jounin immediately began moving towards the depot. The two ninjas inside the depot got up and grabbed their kunai. However, Fujin flickered next to one of them. The ninja immediately swung his kunai at Fujin, however, Fujin was much faster. A punch landed on the ninja's face and blew him up. Fujin had enhanced the punch with chakra as well. Blood, flesh, bones and insides of the brain hit the face of the second ninja. His horror knew no bounds. One second he was playing a game of cards with his friend, and in the next second his friend's brain was blown up. Fortunately or unfortunately, his misery was short-lived. Fujin fired an air bullet through his throat and ended his life as well. Fujin immediately flickered towards where the grains and other food items were stored. It was easy to find. Fujin knocked the door down and immediately spat a fireball on it. The entire room was lit on fire. However, this wasn't the only grain storage in the depot. There were seven other such rooms. Fujin immediately began lighting them on fire as well. The elite Jounin appeared in front of the depot and was horrified to see smoke coming out of the depot. Fujin had set fire to three food storage facilities. Another ninja appeared next to him and asked, Captain Hitoshi, what are your orders? Hitoshi quickly commanded, there should be an intruder inside. I will douse the fire. You guys stop him. Don't let him set fire to every storage facility. He immediately jumped in the smoke. Five ninjas followed him in. The remaining Sunagakir ninjas in the city kept arriving every few seconds and went into the burning depot. Fujin had set fire to five storage facilities when the Suna ninjas spotted him. Hitoshi immediately made hand signs. For water clones appeared next to him. He and the water clones headed towards the five rooms from where smoke was appearing. The other ninja immediately ran towards Fujin. One of the Jounin screamed hatefully, How dare you burn the only source of food for the hundreds of thousands of people living here? Another ninja shouted in rage, I will skin you alive. Two threw shurikens at Fujin while the other three weaved hand signs. Fujin dodged the shurikens, but the assault had just started. Wind release, air bullet jutsu. Wind release, wind gale wolf jutsu. Wind release, wind sword jutsu. Eight air bullets, three wind wolves and multiple blades of wind move one after another towards Fujin. Chakra gathered in Fujin's eyes. He immediately flickered out of the way and dodged every air bullet. He gathered chakra in his mouth. Wind release, infinite breakthrough jutsu. 
he exhaled a wind current from his mouth. However, instead of the destructive attack, he exhaled an extremely gentle wind current. The blades of winds entered the wind current and were redirected. They moved towards the doors of the remaining storage facilities and cut through them. Seeing their attack destroy portions of their food supply made their hearts ache in pain. At the same time, their hatred towards Fujin increased even more. Lastly, the three wolves entered the wind flow. However, the wind flow was too strong for them to continue. One dispersed directly while the remaining two were sent crashing into the walls and finally dispersed. However, Fujin's position didn't improve much as three more Suna ninjas had arrived. Half of the eight ninjas were Jounins. Fujin's odds kept getting worse. One of the Suna ninjas slammed his hands on the ground. Immediately the ground rose and interrupted the wind flow he had created. Immediately, the remaining seven ninjas pounced on Fujin. Dozens of shurikens and multiple wind jutsus were launched at Fujin. Fujin dodged while counterattacking, but the Suna ninjas kept attacking without caring about their chakra reserves. Fujin kept dodging as he sensed four more ninjas entering the depot. He frowned, killing them in a short time isn't possible without using vacuum jutsus. I need a distraction. He weaved a hand sign as he continued dodging the attacks. Fire release, fire dragon flame bullet jutsu. At the same time, one of the Suna Jounins too completed his hand signs. Wind release, wind dragon jutsu. Two massive 30 meters long dragons appeared in the depot. However, seeing the fire dragon made the Suna ninjas very nervous. The wind dragon collided with the fire dragon who didn't make any move. The impact of the collision destroyed the fire dragon. The Suna ninjas were surprised at how quickly it was defeated. However, their eyes widened in horror as the wind generated by the wind dragon carried the flames everywhere inside the depot. The doors to the storage facilities that were destroyed earlier let all the fire enter inside. The last remaining food grains that were safe inside the depot began burning. The ninjas attacked while cursing Fujin with every foul word and curse they knew. However, Fujin kept dodging and counterattacking without responding. At the same time, Hitoshi and his clones doused the fire in all five rooms. However, their expressions weren't good. Hitoshi muttered, even though I doused the fire, all the food items have gotten wet. I am not sure how long it will last. He and his clones left the rooms. Fujin noticed that the smoke coming from those five rooms had turned into water vapor. A smile appeared on Fujin's face as he decided, it's time. Chapter 267 A Massive Chakra Appeared Around Fujin The sudden spike in chakra shocked the Suna ninjas. Without giving them any time, Fujin attacked. Wind Release, Infinite Breakthrough Jutsu Unlike the previous version, this jutsu was as destructive as it could possibly be. The Suna ninja, who considered themselves unmatched in wind jutsus, were dumbfounded by the scale and destructiveness of this attack. The attack left giant scars on the sturdy walls of the provision depot. The Suna ninjas were blown apart as well. Two ninjas had their throats sliced by the sharp winds. Another had his eyes pierced. One had his left arm sliced off. The winds also moved into the eight storage facilities. Hitoshi and his clones were caught off guard. All four water clones were dispelled, leaving just Hitoshi in one of the rooms. He quickly weaved a hand seal. Water release, water prison jutsu. A sphere of water surrounded him and saved him from the impact of the winds. While the Suna ninjas were struggling, a shadow clone appeared next to Fujin. Fire release, searing migraine jutsu. He wasted no time in releasing a massive fire into the winds generated by infinite breakthrough. The fire spread began spreading instantly. The winds carried the fire to each and every corner of the depot. Hitoshi watched in anger and helplessness as an even bigger fire entered his room. The three storage rooms that had just small fires were set ablaze. Every food grain was burned up. The five rooms where Hitoshi and his clones had doused the fire were set ablaze once again with even more intensity. Worse, of the fourteen Suna ninjas that were fighting Fujin, twelve were set on fire as well. 
Only two managed to use defensive jutsus in time. Fujin noticed the destruction and decided that should be sufficient. He immediately flickered out of the depot. Two Suna ninjas were rushing towards the depot when Fujin suddenly appeared in front of them. Both grabbed the weapons and asked, Who are you? Fujin looked at them without replying and began building up his chakra. The two Suna ninjas prepared themselves for a fight. However, Fujin suddenly disappeared. He used wind instantaneous body jutsu to flicker directly to the city walls and left the city. One of the ninjas shouted, Where did he go? He couldn't even follow Fujin's movement. He was about to look for Fujin when the ninja next to him shouted, Leave him. First, help douse this fire. The ninja stopped and focused back on the fire. However, before they could do anything, Hitoshi completed weaving hand signs. He poured over 80% of his remaining chakra into the jutsu. Water release, great waterfall jutsu. He released a massive amount of water. The water first flooded the room he was in. A massive amount of water was converted into water vapor, but the fire was doused. The water flowed out towards the remaining depot from the door. The Suna ninjas who were on fire immediately ran towards the water and dived in. In a minute, the water entered all the storage rooms in the depot. The ninjas that were outside the depot immediately jumped out of the way as hot water rushed out like a flood. Hitoshi walked out of his room. His expression was ugly. He noticed the burns on his subordinates. He realized he was a censor. If he had done this attack when I was dousing the fire, I could have stopped it. But he timed it perfectly when I lowered my guards slightly after dousing the fires. He looked at the two ninjas standing outside and asked, Did you see anyone leave? The ninja nodded, Yes, Captain. We saw a man flicker away in a hurry. We wanted to give chase, but decided that saving the depot was more important. Hitoshi sighed and said, It's fine. Even if you gave chase, you have probably been killed. Arrange the two medical ninjas to heal the injured. I'll watch over the other depot. This one is ruined. He flickered away towards the other depot while being worried, I hope he doesn't attack the second depot as well. But if he does, I'll abandon the grains and focus on killing him. However, my chakra is very low right now. It will be a very difficult battle. In a few seconds, he arrived at the second provision depot. No attack had taken place there. The two ninjas stationed were on high alert. Hitoshi sighed in relief. He analyzed, since he didn't show up here, he should be very low on chakra after using the combination jutsu by himself. He frowned and asked himself, should I have abandoned the provision depot and attacked him instead? I would have had a good chance of killing him. He thought for a bit and shook his head, no. If I had done that, all my subordinates would have died in the fire. And I would have no guarantee of killing him. Besides, if he has any allies, he could have lured me into a trap. Hitoshi cleared up his thoughts and began passing instructions. The security of the second provision depot was increased manyfold. Ten ninjas were deployed to defend it. At the same time, medical ninjas began treating the injured ninjas. Hitoshi tallied his losses and sighed. Four ninjas were killed in the fight. Two of them were Jounins. All the food stored in that provision depot was destroyed. So in a few minutes, they lost half of their food supply. It was certain to put an immense strain on the land of wind. Hitoshi wrote reports and sent messages to the Kazakage and the wind daimyo. Meanwhile, Fujin had long left the vicinity of the city. After leaving the city, he kept using wind instantaneous body jutsu continuously to escape over 10 kilometers away. Finally, he took a break and thought, that was rough. Bastards came at me with everything they had. Fortunately, the elite Jounin was more focused on salvaging the grains. He let out a sigh and thought, no wonder Sunagakure attacked Kanoha a few years from now. Shikaku and Haruzen are two crazy bastards. In order to increase the dependence of the land of wind on the land of fire, they decided to burn half the food supply in the western parts of this country. Now the land of wind will have no option but to import massive amounts of food from the land of fire. 
the sudden rise in demand would also raise the cost of food items. And it will hence result in restricting the budget of Sunagakir. At the very least, Suna shouldn't expect any budget increases anytime soon. Especially if Shikaku keeps up these tactics. In fact, they will have to spend their own budget to buy food. If Raza were to figure out that these incidents were done by Kanoha, he would definitely want to attack Kanoha even if he didn't have any solid proof. Only the disruption caused by a war will allow him to reset the ties between the land of wind and fire and force the wind daimyo to cooperate entirely with him. Still, Shikaku wasn't too heartless. The scrolls clearly indicate to just destroy one depot and to not destroy any more if one had already been destroyed. If he had planned to destroy the second depot as well, then these people would have been very hopeless. It would have been a tragedy. Thousands of people would have died due to food shortages. The daimyo's position might have become unstable if people died in large numbers due to food shortages. But now, the food they have will be sufficient for them to survive until sufficient food is imported. In the end, not only will this region not experience any tragedy, but the people here will be grateful to Kanoha and the wind daimyo for helping them so quickly. On the other hand, Raza and Sanagakir would be hated as their ninjas were too incompetent to protect their food supply. In fact, Raza will be forced to increase the number of ninjas protecting this city by at least two times. A good scheme indeed. Despite not telling him, Fujin was able to discover Shikaku's real intentions through his instructions. Fujin smirked and muttered, Raza will be in a real mess soon. He he. If I didn't have to maintain my disguise, I'd have loved to lure him here and fight a few rounds with him after securing my retreat. Though I won't stand a chance, the opportunities to fight against S-rank ninjas are just too rare. As Fujin expected, Raza had a terrible headache. The bad news kept arriving one after another in his office. He had just sent a considerable force towards the west when two more reports arrived at his table. He read them both multiple times and his expression got uglier every time. The first report came from the hospital in Suna. The doctors had checked the blood samples Yura sent back and stated that it was blood samples of 24 different people. The second was sent by Baki. He informed Raza about Manabu's investigation and about Hiroshi and the eleven traders that came to Wine Capital along with him. Chapter 268 Raza studied the two reports as he calculated 24 different blood samples. The group had 25 different people. Meaning that except one, everyone got injured. But who stayed uninjured? After calculating more, Raza concluded, it isn't someone from my umbu. Since they didn't contact me again, it is safe that all twelve of them were killed. This implies that the mercenaries had someone very strong hidden in their ranks who could eliminate all twelve Umbu without allowing anyone to escape. His eyes fell on the second report as he analyzed further, that person could very well be this Hiroshi fellow. Either he was with the mercenaries and lured the Umbu into a trap. Or the more fearsome scenario, that guy killed all Umbu and mercenaries by himself. But, how strong would he need to be to kill 24 ninjas who were at least at the Chunin level by himself? Raza shook his head and corrected his line of thinking, no, he could have caught them off guard by using his disguise. However, even in that case, this person needs to be at the elite Jounin level. The 11 traders who came along with him were nowhere to be found. Though Baki hasn't completed his search yet, it should be a hopeless search. Because, if this Hiroshi is at the elite Jounin level, then the remaining traders could have been his clones. No, his shadow clones. Probably the assassins were his clones as well. The person who attacked Sabakwetsu should be him as well. Raza's expression became very ugly as he muttered, Kanoha sent an elite Jounin to create a mess in my country so brazenly. They want to increase our dependence on them so that we are forced to stay in an alliance with them. Just like Fujin, Raza could see the impact of destroying just one of the two provision depots in the west. The scenario was just too favorable to Kanoha. Unfortunately, he had no proof to give to the daimyo or the public. However, despite the absence of any proof, he was certain that Kanoha was behind it. Within a day, he sent messages to every noble in the west who supported him. In addition, 
he dispatched another 200 ninjas to the western parts of the country. Fujin had no idea that he would soon be hunted all across the vast deserts. However, the reinforcements were very far away. Traveling across the desert needed three days. During this time, Fujin had eliminated another noble who supported Raza completely. Raza's mood worsened even further after receiving the news. In a rage, he shouted, Does Kanoha want to go to war? He looked at his assistant and commanded, Call every council member in the village for an emergency meeting. The assistant nodded and got to work. Within half an hour, most of the council members arrived. Raza informed them about the situation and his calculations. Every council member agreed with his calculations. Raza stated, Kanoha seems to be hell-bent on making life difficult for us. We have to retaliate. However, his words caused a wave of silence to spread through the room. After half a minute of silence, one council member commented, We have no way to retaliate. Since the Uchiha massacre, Kanoha has increased their defenses multiple times. The number of their ninjas moving in the land of fire has increased multiple times. We will have to send either a league jounin or a squad of jounins to be able to achieve something significant. And once they succeed, Kanoha will hunt them until they are killed. In addition, they have the Amanaka clan. Not only will our ninjas be killed, but their memories will also be read. And if Kanoha uses that information to convince the wind daimyo, then our budget will be restricted even further. The other council members agreed with him. Raza also frowned. He had a very low number of elite jounins. He didn't want to send them to their deaths. In addition, their deaths would hurt Suna in multiple ways. Silence spread through the room. The only eligible name they could think of who wasn't already exceeding 50 years in age was Baki. But Baki was helpless in dealing with the situation in the wind capital. If he messed up after entering the land of fire, they would lose one of their strongest fighters. None of them wanted to risk this. Finally, one of the council members suggested, in my opinion, we should focus on killing the elite Jaunin that has infiltrated our country. If we kill him, Kanoha will feel heartache at losing him. After all, the value of an elite Jaunin exceeds more than a hundred chunins. Especially considering that he is a very good user of wind jutsus. No country needs wind affinity ninjas more than Kanoha. Everyone immediately agreed with him. The meeting ended without deciding on any good plan to hurt Kanoha. Raza sighed in disappointment as he too couldn't think of any good method to retaliate. He just hatefully looked in the west. Around the same time, Kanoha received intel about the recent happenings in the Land of Wind. Hiruzen read the reports with a weird expression and called Shikaku. Shikaku received the scroll from Hiruzen. His expression also became weird. Hiruzen chuckled and said, You messed up. You should have defined the mission parameters properly. Shikaku sighed and muttered, Ten nobles, twelve family members of nobles, four ninjas, and one food storage depot. Does he intend to start a war? He let out another sigh and said softly, What a drag. I told him that it is the promotion mission for Umbu captain. Why is he acting like he wants to become the Umbu commander? Hiruzen let out another chuckle. Shikaku looked at him and said, This isn't a laughing matter. He has acted so many times that Suno will definitely suspect us. Even if he didn't leave any evidence, they will still want to retaliate. Hiruzen nodded and said, Fortify our defenses. Set up traps for any enemy squads who would want to create a mess in our country. In addition, prepare yourself for more such news. After all, he has just reached the western side of the Land of Wind. Hiruzen wasn't worried about Suna's retaliation. Instead, he wanted to use the opportunity to kill their elite troops. As long as Suna's strength was kept in check, they wouldn't try to break the alliance openly. Shikaku sighed and said, We also need to know what deal Raza and Wind Daimyo reached. This wasn't what we wanted. If they resolved their differences, then all our efforts would be pointless. ALS He suddenly stopped speaking and looked at Hiruzen and asked, Why do I have to do it? Hiruzen had asked him to do a very tedious task in such a smooth manner that he didn't even consider refusing it. 
However, he had no will to spend a lot of time working on it. Hiruzen replied, Because you were the one who messed up. Shikaku retorted, You were in the room as well. Hiruzen nodded and said, But you were the one to pass the orders. Both entered into a staring contest. After a minute, Shikaku sighed and got to work. As soon as the door closed, Hiruzen chuckled once again. He looked at the reports once again and thought, I should have expected this. But it's all right. Suno was becoming too arrogant. If they aren't reined in, they will soon become more chaotic and break off the alliance. Once that happens, the fourth great ninja war will just be a matter of time. Hiruzen got up and looked out at his window at the stone faces. He let out a sigh as he thought, finally, our strength has recovered. Once I officially promote the current crop of ninjas to Jown in rank, our numbers will have reached sufficient levels officially. However, we still need a few years of peace for this generation of ninjas to fully mature. Then we can afford to enter another war. As he looked at the stone faces, tiredness could be seen on his face. However, suddenly he squinted his eyes and chakra gathered in them. He noticed someone sneakily moving on the Hokage monuments. But, soon he let out a long sigh and muttered, I am getting too old for this shit. I should have dumped this kid on his perverted godfather. The entire village suddenly noticed that the Hokage monuments were painted and made to look hilarious. Soon, Iruka noticed it as well and began chasing after Naruto. While Kanoha was peaceful and joyous, the situation in the western territories of the Land of Wind was heating up. 148 Sanagakir ninjas arrived in the city of Sabakwetsu. Manabu, Yura and two more ninjas met up with Hitoshi who told them every detail regarding their short clash with Fujin. Manabu analyzed and said, Kazekage-sama's analysis seems to be on point. This is most likely the same guy. Odaka added, an elite Jounin from Kanoha. We have to catch him and give him the most painful death imaginable. But, he scratched his chin and asked, how do we find him in these vast deserts? Yura looked at Odaka and replied, he seems to be targeting the nobles that favor our village. We just have to study his movements and discover his next target. Then we can set up an ambush for him. Odaka looked at Yura carefully. Odaka was one of the few elite Jounins in Suna and a council member as well. He was quite senior as well. Along with Manabu, he was one of the two leaders of the Suna ninjas that arrived in Sabakwetsu. He said, good good. You are good, Yura. It's good to see promising ninjas in the next generation. The last member of their group was an Umbu captain who was assigned as the leader of the twenty Umbu ninjas. He was wearing an eagle mask. He said, let's lay down a map and analyze his movements. We also need to analyze his abilities. Then we can set a trap. The group nodded and entered Hitoshi's office. Chapter 269 After entering his office, Hitoshi laid down a map on a table. All five ninjas stood around it. Odaka asked, Eagle, what do you recommend? Eagle took a marker and circled Sabakwetsu and a nearby town and said, he first burned a provision depot in Sabakwetsu and then killed a noble in this town. The nearest town from there is Karinchi. But that town doesn't have any noble. So according to my estimations, his target could either be the city of Shunkudo or the town of Kaganjima. But, it is difficult to say which one. Manabu and Odaka began analyzing. After a couple of minutes, Manabu sighed and said, it's impossible to say which one he will target. We will split up and guard both cities. Yura and I will go to Shankudo while Odaka and Eagle will go to Kaganjima. Hitoshi, you stay in this city and ensure that the last provision depot stays safe. We will leave 20 additional ninjas with you. The remaining will be divided equally among us. Odama, Hitoshi, and Eagle nodded. They agreed with Manabu's plan. They quickly began discussing which ninja squads would join their groups. Suddenly, Manabu noticed something amiss and looked at Yura. Yura was still staring at the map and didn't say a word. Manabu asked, Is something the matter, Yura? Yura snapped out of his thoughts. He said, I have a different take on this, 
Elder Monabu. Monabu said, Explain. Yura said, If we split up, our chances of killing him will decrease. And, if we move to those cities, then he might notice our movements and avoid hitting them altogether. In that case, our deployment will be a waste and he might annoy us further by randomly targeting other nobles forcing us to split into smaller groups. In addition, he should already have a good lead on us. If he kills that noble before we even reach, then we won't be able to do anything and might get exposed for nothing. His words made others frown. They had considered these points but not in this detail as they didn't see any other option. Monabu asked, What do you suggest? Yura said, Let's abandon these two nobles. The eyes of the four ninjas widened at how casually Yura asked to sacrifice the two nobles. Yura pointed at a city on the map and said, After he kills the nobles in Shankudo and Kaganjima, he will target the noble living in Mizunashi City. While he is busy killing those two nobles, we can move around this territory and set up a giant trap in Mizunashi before he reaches there. We will hide inside and around the city using Fuinjutsu. When he attacks, we can all surround and kill him. Yura's plan surprised them. They thought about his words and agreed more and more with him. Though two nobles would die, the sacrifice would be worth it if they killed him. It was an exchange they were more than willing to make. Odaka looked at Yura in a new light. He thought, I was just teasing him earlier for pointing out the obvious. But, he is indeed good. This level of talent should be in the council. Monabu said, That is a good plan. Much better than mine for sure. Hitoshi added, Good plan, but there is one flaw. The ninjas deployed at the city gates didn't notice any anomalies or anything strange. So I speculate that he entered the city without alerting the seals inscribed here. Yura replied, I considered that. But this city is very big and was guarded by just four ninjas at the entrances. So he would have had opportunities to study the seals. But in Mizunashi, he will be able to sense us only if he is a sensor and activates his chakra field. However, doing so while attempting assassination will be very stupid. So he won't do it. Yura's explanation made sense. Everyone agreed. He added, in addition, the time would allow for the backup sent by Kazakage-sama to arrive. So we can even set up a perimeter in the desert to stop him in case he somehow manages to escape. Either way, the battlefield will unfold as we want. Monabu said, yes. Hunting him will begin easier if backup arrives before we set a trap for him. I'll communicate with them. You guys finalize the plans. Monabu quickly left. The rest quickly finalized the details of their trap. In the end, they decided to leave 30 ninjas in the city. They will not only aid in the defense of the provision depot but would also be responsible for ensuring that the fact that so many ninjas arrived in Sabaquetsa doesn't get leaked outside the city. Within an hour, 118 ninjas led by Monabu and Odaka left the city of Sabaquetsu. They moved around the town of Kaganjima and moved towards the city of Mizunashi. As Yura calculated, Fujin had made his move. Just after they left Sabakwetsu, Fujin killed the noble in Kaganjima and quickly began moving towards Shankudo. As he moved, Fujin analyzed, as expected, the nobles are being heavily protected. But, there wasn't any Jounin level ninja protecting him. I guess Raza wasn't able to send reinforcements so quickly. Or perhaps, the other Umbu who are supposed to be on a promotion mission are also making a mess and forcing Raza to deploy his ninjas everywhere. I can't be sure which one is the case, but it is better to assume the first one. My next target will probably be the last one without any significant protection. Within a few hours, he arrived outside Shunkudo. His eyes glowed as he observed the walls of the city. He muttered, this one has no seals to protect it either. I am disappointed at how lazy Sunagakir has been. Granted these cities are far in the west, but is it really so much work to just ask a few Injutsu Grandmaster to visit all these cities and bless the city by carving a few seals? With no seals to block his path, Fujin just entered the city normally while maintaining a disguise. He casually walked into the city while moving towards Noble's mansion. After a few minutes, he arrived outside the mansion. 
he hid in a corner where no one would see him and muttered, all these nobles live right at the center of the city. I don't even have to make any effort to find them. Fujin sighed. His mission had been progressing too smoothly. He was itching for a good fight. Of course, he wouldn't seek it if his enemies didn't act smart enough and allowed him to do his job without any resistance. His eyes glowed as he observed the mansion. He analyzed eight ninjas. Two at Chunin level and six at Jinan. Raza is awfully slow. Are they planning to lower my guard by giving me easy kills? He made a hand sign. Earth release, Earth military movement jutsu. Fujin disappeared into the ground and entered the mansion. None of the eight ninjas were censors and Fujin was suppressing and hiding his chakra. So no one detected him. Fujin moved directly towards the central room where Fujin had detected three people. Two of them were ninjas while the third one was a civilian. This was the room where the noble was hiding. He was sitting in a chair while the two ninjas stood next to him. He nervously asked the ninjas standing next to him, Lord Kazuo, how long do we have to keep hiding here? Kazuo was the chunin in charge of the defense of this remote city. He replied respectfully, Don't worry, Lord Toshio. Reinforcements from our village will arrive soon. Toshio was still very worried. Kazuo assured him, We are here with you as well, Lord Toshio. Live or die, we will join you. So don't worry. The noble nodded. For some reason, he looked to be very fearful of Kazuo. Suddenly, all three of them looked ahead. A head popped out of the ground. In the blink of an eye, an entire person appeared. Toshio was horrified. Kazuo and the other ninja also had solemn expressions. However, both had determined expressions. They seemed to have accepted their fate. They quickly grabbed their kunai and took a fighting stance. Kazuo asked, Who are you? Fujin didn't bother replying and shot an air bullet at Toshio. The Suna ninjas couldn't even react when the bullet hit Toshio's chest. Toshio's eyes widened. Time slowed down as he felt the pain in his chest. He knew that the Suna ninjas wouldn't be a match for the intruder, but he didn't expect to be killed so quickly. However, instead of sorrow or horror, a gentle smile appeared on his face as he looked at Fujin. His smile surprised Fujin. It was the first time he had seen a noble accept death with a smile on his face. Toshio thought, my time has come. But my family will live a life of comfort and luxury. He closed his eyes and accepted his death with a gentle smile on his face. Chapter 270 Fujin was stunned by the smile on Toshio's face. Despite being the killer, he noticed no hatred in Toshio's eyes for him. There was just relief alongside some reluctance. Thoughts clashed at the speed of light in Fujin's brain trying to make sense of this bizarre scenario. He muttered to himself, What the hell? Kazuo and his subordinate noticed Fujin's momentary lapse of concentration. Both immediately jumped at Fujin to kill him. However, Fujin was well aware of his surroundings. He stepped to his left and got out of the Jinan's range. He caught Kazuo's arm and kicked him in the abdomen and sent him flying into the wall. He crashed into the wall and fell on the ground and began vomiting blood. The Jinan landed and moved towards Fujin again. However, all he saw was a fist coming straight at him. Fujin's chakra-enhanced fist landed on his face and blew it off his head. Kazuo gathered himself and was about to get up when a kick landed on his side and sent him rolling on the floor while vomiting more blood. Numerous ribs had cracked. Fujin didn't attack anymore and asked in a plain voice, Who was that man? Kazuo finally managed to get on his knees. He looked at Fujin hatefully and shouted angrily, You killed the kind noble Toshio. A demon like you will rot in hell. Fujin snorted, Save your lives for yourself. I have killed way too many nobles to not identify one. Who was he? Kazuo's eyes widened. However, he immediately put on an angry face and cursed, First you kill our noble and then talk bullshit? Just kill me and be done with it. I will wait for you in the deepest layers of hell. Fujin didn't attack him and said, Good play. I feel stupid for not considering such a simple trick. 
You knew I was going to come here. So you hid the real noble and used a body double. Cool trick. Kazuo's eyes widened once again. Thoughts ran through his mind trying to find the optimal reply. He wanted to convince Fujin that he killed the real noble. However, he realized that he wouldn't be able to do so. The more he lied, the more Fujin would be convinced. A grin broke on Kazuo's face. He spoke loudly with pride, that's right. How does it feel to be tricked by the oldest trick in the book? Ha 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 ha. Fujin didn't mind his taunt. He wasn't petty enough to not give credit where credit was due. It was a fact that he was fooled. If the body double hadn't smiled kindly and behaved like any normal human being, he would have been fooled successfully. He replied plainly, Unfortunately, your plan has failed. Kazuo replied with that huge grin still plastered on his face, It hasn't. Even if you realize the plan, there isn't anything you can do. You don't know where the noble is hiding. No one other than me does. And I will never say it. You want to kill the noble? Then you will have to kill every single person in this city. No, you will also have to scout the entire desert to check if he has been hidden outside the city. And you will also have to kill everyone in every village in the vicinity of this city. Tell me, did your motherfucking masters from Kanoha permit you to commit such atrocities? Ha ha ha. He continued laughing loudly continuously. Fujin chuckled, You think I'm from Kanoha? Good. How about we make a deal? I will let you and your friends live. In exchange, you will tell me the location of the noble. You can even tell Raza that the killer is from Kanoha. Fujin's words stopped Kazuo's laughter. He became confused and wondered, is he not from Kanoha? Wouldn't that mean that someone else is trying to start a war between Kanoha and Suna? No! I shouldn't doubt Raza's intelligence. He might be saying this just to confuse me. He began laughing and said, No. You can torture me however you want. I still won't tell you. He thought, if I can delay him here until the reinforcements arrive, then I can drag him to hell with me. Fujin's eyes turned towards the door of the room. He sensed multiple ninjas running towards the room. The fighting earlier generated some noise that attracted them. A couple of shadow clones popped next to him and left to confront those ninjas. Fujin said, Unfortunately, torturing isn't my forte. Killing is. Don't worry, I'll let you die in knowing what will happen in the future. After I kill you, I will torture the noble's family in public. That should make him crawl out of his hiding spot. Kazuo continued laughing and said, Do it. Fujin noticed how unaffected he was and concluded, As I expected. They're fakes as well. Fujin had no clue who the noble was or how he looked. He entertained Kazuo for so long just to get whatever information he could. Now he had received most of the information he needed. He raised two fingers. Wind began flowing around them. Kazuo's eyes widened as he realized, Wind Sword Jutsu. I guess this is it for me. Sucks that he never came close to me. I hope he got overconfident and got closer to torture me or beat me up. He closed his eyes and made the confrontation hand seal. Immediately, multiple tags on his body lit up. He looked at Fujin with a crazed look in his eyes and shouted, I will drag you to hell. However, Fujin was unmoved. Blades of wind shot out from around his fingers and hit every single explosive tag stuck to Kazuo's body. Every single explosive tag was destroyed before it could explode. The wind blades also left multiple deep cuts on Kazuo. Kazuo was stunned. Even if he couldn't kill Fujin, he expected to at least injure him. However, he never expected such a result. Fujin said, I respect your intelligence and bravery. I'd have allowed you to die in the way you want, but I need this mansion. Kazuo's eyes widened as he saw Fujin transform into him. Fujin said, Rest in peace. A wind blade sliced Kazuo's throat. However, his eyes were glued to Fujin. As his brain slowly stopped working, numerous questions arose in his mind, How did he know I would explode? Why does he keep speaking in such a plain monotonous tone? 
why didn't he get angry no matter how much I taunted him? And why does his face show no emotions at all? Unfortunately, he wouldn't get any answers. He closed his eyes and died without knowing the name or the real face of his killer. Fujin looked at him and sighed, ashamed that his strength was so weak. Had he been stronger, his name might have been famous throughout the ninja world. Fujin concentrated on his chakra. Eight shadow clones appeared. One shadow clone took the disguise of the jinn and he killed while one dispelled itself. The two shadow clones Fujin had created earlier received the memories and dispelled themselves. Fujin and his clones received their memories. Four shadow clones transformed into the four ninjas that the clones killed. While the last two clones dived into the ground and moved towards the basement. The last two Suna ninjas were hiding there to protect the fake family of the noble. Fujin looked at the person who was disguised as the noble and wondered, why did he smile in such a way? What sort of life would one have to experience to smile at his killer without any hate? Fujin analyzed for a bit but couldn't come up with a definite answer. After all, he had no idea who the man was and what his life story was. Fujin extended his hand towards his head. Yin Chakra poured out of his hand and entered the dead man's brain. The Yin Chakra gently began falling through his neurons. Fujin kept at it for three minutes before the dead man's brain started to break down. Fujin frowned and muttered to himself, I thought that the desire to truly know the memories could be a factor in reading memories. I guess not. Fujin sighed and gave up. He was very interested in knowing his backstory but had no means to know it. He stored the dead body. Two days ago, the news of the destruction of one provision depot had spread throughout Shunkudo. The people were very worried. Meanwhile, Toshio was concerned for his life. He thought, if this is done by the same organization that killed nobles and their families in Wind Capital, then I could be on their hit list. No, my family is in danger as well. He immediately began thinking of a plan to ensure his survival but couldn't come up with any plan. Meanwhile, Kazuo received a message from Sunagakir. He read the scroll and sighed thinking, Raza has lost a lot of influence due to these recent murders. Whoever is doing this must be crazy strong. He doesn't even care about our lives and just wants the noble to stay safe. Kazuo's impression of Raza degraded a lot. However, as a loyal ninja, he was willing to sacrifice his life for his country. He wondered, but how do I keep Toshio safe? He thought for a long time before coming up with a decent plan. He walked towards Tishio's office while sighing, with this method, this old fellow will live. But I will survive only if I am extremely lucky. This really sucks. Chapter 271 Kazuo entered Toshio's office and said loudly, Everyone, leave. I need to talk with Toshio-sama alone. All the servants immediately left. Toshio was stressed thinking about ways to live. He looked at Kazuo with a hopeful look on his face while thinking, maybe he can think of something. As soon as everyone left and the doors were locked, Toshio said, It's good you came, Kazuo. I was about to find you as well. I have never been so stressed in my life. Kazuo nodded and asked, Worried about the assassination? Toshio nodded. Kazuo replied, You don't need to be worried. Lord Kazakage has asked me to ensure that you and your family stay safe. A look of relief appeared on Toshio's face. He asked, Did you think of a way? Kazuo nodded and replied, Yes. Listen carefully. You and your family will move out of the mansion. All four of you will stay under disguise by using makeup, wearing ordinary clothes and moving to live in an ordinary house in the city. You won't have any servants or guards. No one other than me will be aware of your location. In the meantime, decoys will have to be arranged to replace you and your family. If the assassin attacks, that decoy will die. As long as the decoy doesn't blow up your cover, you will get to live and the assassin will go away. If your cover is blown, then you will have to stay hidden for a long time until that assassin gives up. I'll probably not be alive by then, so your survival will entirely depend on you. Toshio became excited after hearing the plan. However, 
He hid his excitement and put up a sad face and asked, Do you have to risk your life? Kazuo easily saw through the fake concern and said, It's the life of a ninja. Stop wasting time and prepare to move out and arrange for decoys. I am not sure how much time we have. Toshio replied, I already have decoys in mind. I'll arrange them for my family. However, I need your help to bring the one for me here. His name is Tetsuo. Toshio gave him the address of Tetsuo and explained his circumstances to Kazuo. Kazuo nodded and left. Toshio immediately got to work. He made three people disguise themselves as his wife and sons and asked them to stay in the basement. They knew the consequences of disobeying him and agreed. At the same time, Kazuo reached the outskirts of the city. He searched for a bit and saw an old house. Outside, a middle-aged man was sitting. He looked very tired and sick. Kazuo approached him and asked, Are you Tetsuo? Tetsuo was surprised. He looked at Kazuo and immediately recognized him. His eyes widened as he got up in a hurry and bowed down, Lord Kazuo. It's an honor that you know my name. Kazuo nodded and said, Come with me, Toshio-sama has instructions for you. Without waiting for his approval, Kazuo turned around and began walking. Tetsuo immediately followed. However, he was confused and wondered, what would Lord Kazuo and Lord Toshio want from someone like me? Tetsuo's current state was horrible. His body was weak and he would frequently fall ill. Due to this, he couldn't work continuously and most of what he earned would be spent in the hospital. So his family's financial condition was very poor. And he was in a lot of debt. He wanted a good life for his family, but no matter how much he tried, it seemed like the entire world was against him. They walked into the mansion. Tetsuo received a lot of curious gazes, making him feel uncomfortable. He did his best to ignore them. He followed Kazuo into Toshio's office and immediately paid respects to Toshio. Toshio put up a kind smile and said, Get up. Tetsuo got up and asked, I wonder why you called me here, Lord? Toshio got up and walked past Tetsuo. He looked through the window and asked, Are you aware of the recent wave of assassinations, Tetsuo? Tetsuo nodded. Toshio sighed and said, I am afraid that I too will be targeted by him. I called you here as I have an important job for you. He turned around and looked into Tetsuo's eyes and said, I am willing to die. However, if I die, then our whole city will suffer. My children aren't capable enough to run a city yet. So I want you to disguise as me and take my place in the mansion. His words shocked Tetsuo. Tetsuo involuntarily stepped back. But he crashed into Kazuo and fell to the ground. He looked at Kazuo who was staring straight into his eyes. Tetsuo became frightened as he felt that if he said no, Kazuo would kill him. He immediately looked at Toshio and said, Lord, I have a wife and two young children. Without me, they will become fatherless and no one will be able to look after them or feed them. I would have loved to sacrifice myself for our city but I just can't leave my family alone. Kazuo frowned. If Tetsuo was reluctant, then he wouldn't work as a decoy. Toshio looked at Kazuo and said, It's fine Kazuo. Not everyone can give their lives for the city. He painted Kazuo as the bad guy in Tetsuo's mind while showing himself to be a very just ruler. He looked back at Tetsuo and said, Tetsuo, I am aware of your family conditions as well as your medical health. If you say no, I won't force you, but hear me out first. Tetsuo nodded. Toshio said, If you take my place, Kazuo and the other ninjas will be responsible for your safety. You won't die until they are alive. Irrespective of whether we get attacked or not, as long as you live, I'll reward you abundantly. I will clear all your debt, give you a stable job in the mansion and get the best doctors for you to improve your health. He let out a sigh and said, But if our luck is bad and you die, I will take care of your family. I will clear their debt and give them so much money that even your next nine generations won't be able to spend it. Hearing the offer, Tetsuo went silent. He was well aware that he wasn't capable of providing for his family. But he loved his family and didn't want to leave them. He fell into deep thought. 
Toshio and Kazuo didn't disturb him. After 20 minutes of struggling, Tetsuo let out a sigh and thought, even if they protect me, I doubt they could stop the assassin. But irrespective of whether I live or not, my family will be taken care of. Though they will be sad about losing me, their sadness will fade away with time. And they will live a fulfilling life. Besides, my death isn't fixed. If my luck changes for once, I will live and my family will not need to worry about money. He got up. Kazuo looked into his eyes and was surprised. He thought, what determination! At the same time, he looked at Toshio and thought, this guy might be a scum, but he understands the human heart very well. In order to ensure that his family lived a good life, Tetsuo was determined to risk his life. No matter what, he wouldn't fail this mission. Tetsuo said, Lord, I am willing to be your decoy. Toshio nodded and said, Shankudo City will remember your bravery. Kazuo will instruct you further. Kazuo nodded and left the room with Tetsuo. As soon as they left, a cruel smile appeared on Toshio's face. He thought, it's hilarious how gullible these fools are. Take care of his family? He he. If he lives, I'll kill him so that no one will know that I hid in the face of danger. If he dies, then I'll burn his body and never tell anyone that he died. His family will think that he just abandoned them. As for what happens to them, how is that my concern? Unfortunately for Tetsuo, even in his final moments, the world still stood against him. He died without being able to provide his family with what he desired. A slash in, I was initially planning to summarize this flashback in a single para without much detail, but I wanted to see how it'll be if I decided to show his backstory instead of just telling it in a single para. Would like to hear your feedback on this. In the future, would you prefer I expand certain summaries in this way, or would you prefer if I just summarized it in one to two paragraphs and moved on with the story? Let me know. Present. Fujin put his thoughts about the man behind him and sighed, what a mess. Just when I thought that the mission was too easy, its difficulty rises to an insane level. Despite complaining, a smile could be seen on his face. He enjoyed fighting intellectually. He thought, I don't know who created this plan, but it's time to dismantle it. I'd have just killed the noble and left. But now, I will make this plan backfire splendidly on Sunagakir. But I need to be careful. I have to prepare an escape route in case Suna sends reinforcements. Thoughts ran rapidly through Fujin's brain as he calculated a devious scheme. Chapter 272 Fujin's clones entered the basement and killed the last two Suna ninjas in the city. The people who were disguising themselves as Toshio's family were horrified. They immediately began screaming and begged, Please let us live. I promise we won't tell anyone what happened here. Despite the fear, they didn't expose that they weren't related to Toshio. They knew that if they did, their families would suffer for generations and Toshio would kill them even if the assassin didn't. Fujin's clones ignored their screams. One clone weaved a few hand seals. Bufura no Akiri Aijutsu. Terror could be seen on their faces. However, nothing happened. The look of terror faded away and instead, they became confused. Some wondered, did his jutsu fail? Suddenly, they got a weird feeling. They felt a slight squirming in their stomach. In an instant, that squirming turned into a sharp pain. They felt as if their stomach was infested by hundreds of maggots. The maggots began eating their way from inside their bodies. The sharp pain soon turned into agony as they felt every mouth ripping and eating the skin, tissue, and tendons. Everyone held their stomach while screaming in pain and horror as the two clones watched. One person couldn't take it anymore and yelled at the top of his lungs. The people around him looked at him. Their eyes widened in horror as his stomach was torn open and hundreds of maggots spilled out and began writhing on the ground. Soon, they too faced similar fates. Fujin's clones watched as every one of them fell unconscious. However, there were no maggots on the ground, no blood and no torn stomachs. The attack was just a Jinjutsu. Bufura no Akiri Jutsu was one of the Jinjutsus Fujin learned during his time in the Umbu. 
it was a very disgusting jutsu. However, against a ninja, its usage was limited. Any experienced ninja would know that they are in a jinjutsu and disrupt their chakra. So its main usage was to disturb the enemy by causing a weird feeling and pain in their stomachs and use that disruption to attack them. Of course, there was one exception. This jinjutsu was disgustingly effective when used by the Aburame clan ninjas. Fujin's clone thought, now they won't wake up for a while. Though I could have used a different jinjutsu, this one ensures that they won't wake up for at least half a day. In addition, the horror they experienced will force their brains to forget about this event and the events before they went unconscious. This will make it very difficult for Suna to get the exact information from them. Fujin could have just killed them. But he had killed too many innocent people during this mission. If he could avoid killing more, he would take that option. The clones transformed into the two Suna ninjas they killed, stored their bodies, and returned to Fujin. Fujin had finished completing his plan. Sixteen shadow clones popped around him. However, one immediately dispersed. The plan immediately was transmitted to all the remaining shadow clones. The fifteen new clones immediately transformed into random people Fujin came across and flickered out. Eight clones rushed out of the city. They spread away at equal distances and formed a perimeter. All of them activated their chakra fields simultaneously, monitoring the city from all sides. If reinforcements from Suna arrive, they would send the message back to Fujin, who would withdraw immediately. The remaining seven clones mixed with the common people in the city. Inside the mansion, Fujin and his clones, disguised as Suna ninjas, left the room. The servants in the mansion were all hiding in fear after the sounds of the fighting spread throughout the mansion. Though the sounds had stopped, they weren't sure who won. Seeing the Suna ninjas walk around the mansion relieved them. Fujin's clones looked at them and said, The assassin is killed. You can relax. The servants all smiled. One said loudly, I knew that any assassin couldn't kill Sunagakir ninjas. We are the strongest ninja village. Fujin's clone chuckled and asked, Is that so? Then why were you hiding? The servant immediately became nervous. He thought, Shit, I was just trying to get in their good books. Why is he making it difficult for me? The servants around him also stared at him. They were quite sick of his bootlicking ability. The servant said while stuttering, I, I, I was. Fujin's clone chuckled again and said, It's fine. I have a job for you guys. Leave the mansion and spread the message. The assassin who kept killing the nobles is dead. There will be a huge announcement made. So everyone, who can, should arrive around the mansion. The servant immediately said, I will immediately inform everybody. The others also nodded. Fujin's clone added, If you find others hiding, inform them as well. They agreed and left. Fujin's clones found the others who were hiding and gave them the same job. Meanwhile, Fujin began going through items in the mansion. After searching for a bit, he found a photo album. Looking at he muttered, So this is how this noble called Toshio looks. And this is his family. Though, trying to look for him actively will be pointless as he should be wearing a disguise to hide from civilians. Fujin created another shadow clone and dispelled it. The memories transferred to all his clones. The seven clones that had mixed among the civilians began to keep an eye out in case they saw someone who looked familiar. The news spread through the city quickly. The news that an assassin was killing the nobles was already well known. To know that the assassin was killed in their city was a matter of joy and pride. Within minutes, thousands of people crowded around the mansion. Fujin watched it and wondered, will this be sufficient to make the noble crawl out of his hiding spot? Fujin and his clones scanned the crowd for two minutes. Unfortunately, they couldn't spot him. Fujin, who had transformed into Kazuo, stepped forward. He said in a loud voice, Quiet down. Kazuo was well known in the city. The crowd went silent. Fujin continued saying, An hour ago, Toshio-sama was attacked by that scum assassin. Unfortunately, he encountered me. 
The crowd listened in anticipation as Fujin looked at them. He shouted, I killed that coward. The crowd instantly erupted in joy. The entire mansion was drowned in roars. The cheers were heard throughout the city. The ones who couldn't make it regretted not being there. However, they were cheerful as well. Fujin waited for the noise to lower and said loudly, Tonight, the entire city will celebrate. So come to the mansion in the evening. We will have the largest buffet ever. When the fireworks go off, drop everything you are doing and come here to celebrate. The crowd cheered even louder. Long live Toshio-sama. Kazuo-sama is mighty. Such slogans were shouted continuously. Fujin looked around with a smile on his face and slowly retreated into the mansion. The crowd lingered for a while before leaving. The news of a buffet spread through the city. Everyone was happy, except one person. Toshio was sitting in a restaurant. A lot of makeup was applied to his face. The people in the restaurant couldn't recognize him. A frown formed on his face as he cursed, Why is Kazuo spending my money? His face became ugly at the thought of his money being wasted on commoners. He wondered, Should I return to the mansion? That bastard has already killed the assassin. So why didn't he call me back? He thought for a bit and decided, No. I have cooperated with Kazuo for a long time. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt for now. As for the money, I can earn it back in no time. He got up and began leaving the restaurant. As soon as he did, he heard two people speaking. One guy said, Hey, did you hear? Toshio-sama hid in the city while a decoy took his place. I didn't expect Toshio-sama to be so cowardly. His friend replied, Yes. I was very disappointed. I had higher expectations from Toshio-sama. The first guy said, Yeah, everyone is disappointed. I heard that Lord Daimyo is upset with Toshio-sama. And a new noble would be elected. His friend nodded and said, Yes. I hope Kazuo-sama becomes our new noble. Under him, we might become the strongest city in the West. The first guy chuckled and said, I say the decoy should become the new noble. After all, he has the guts and the will to sacrifice himself for us. That's how a noble should be. The two continued talking while moving away. Toshio's face became very ugly. He almost lashed out at the two but controlled himself. He thought in rage, I should have known. That bastard tricked me. He is using this opportunity to usurp my power. Chapter 273 Toshio began walking towards where his family was hiding. En route, he heard similar words being spoken by everyone around him. They talked about how cowardly he was or how gallant Kazuo was or both. He became angrier and angrier. He took a good look at each and every face that talked bad about him and memorized their faces. Right after announcing a buffet, the seven shadow clones of Fujin that had mixed among the citizens began spreading rumors. They spread like wildfire. Since Toshio wasn't present during the announcements, people began believing that it was true. In addition, a few knew Toshio's real face and how greedy and selfish he was. They helped fan the rumors. Within a couple of hours, nearly everyone had heard those rumors and were discussing them. That is why Toshio heard them so easily. Toshio entered an ordinary-looking house. As soon as he did, two teenage boys and a middle-aged lady looked at him. They immediately noticed his foul mood. One of his sons asked, Did something happen, father? We heard that Kazuo won and the assassin is dead, so why are you upset? Toshio cursed, that bastard Kazuo has double-crossed me. He is using this to increase his own reputation while ruining mine. He has sights on my position. I'll be going to the mansion right now and put a stop to his plans. You three stay here until I return to get you. Toshio's wife said, Be careful, dear. I am feeling very uneasy. Toshio nodded and said confidently, Don't worry. He may be a ninja, but he can't do anything to me. Otherwise, the Lord Daimyo will ask for his head. His wife and sons nodded and prayed for his health. Toshio began walking towards the mansion while still wearing his disguise. 
He planned, as long as I enter the mansion under disguise, no one will be able to confirm these rumors. I'll dismiss these rumors as foul propaganda and blame it on the ones I saw shit talking about me. Kazuo, you might be stronger than me, but you are a child compared to me when it comes to scheming. He reached the mansion and became enraged once again. The mansion servers were busy arranging tables and chairs inside as well as outside the mansion to prepare for a huge buffet. In a rage, he began walking towards the mansion. At first, no one paid attention to him. However, when he neared the mansion gate, one of Fujin's clone's eyes landed on him. Fujin's clone observed him and wondered, why is this guy so angry? And he is bottling it all up. Fujin's clone tilted his head and wondered, if people could blow up in a rage, I wonder if he'd create a bigger explosion than Daidara? As Toshio entered the castle, the maids and servants finally reacted. One maid was standing quite close to him and carrying some plates. She walked towards him and said, the buffet will be in the evening. Don't come here so early. Don't worry, we will have enough food for everyone. Though the maid spoke politely, Toshio could feel the disdain in her voice. His face became even uglier. He said in a deep voice, Do you dare stop me? The maid was shocked. Though she couldn't identify from his face, she recognized his voice. She observed his physique and identified him immediately. She dropped the plates in horror and walked backwards. She exclaimed, Toshio-sama? Her words were heard clearly by everyone. They had the same thought the rumors were true. Toshio knew that he would get exposed, but since everyone here worked under him, he knew how to ensure that they stayed quiet. He looked around everywhere and said in a grim voice, if a word of this is leaked out, you will have to face the consequences. I don't need to tell you the consequences, do I? Not a single person spoke. They were all scared. However, suddenly a voice was heard, Toshio-sama, why are you angry? Come in. Toshio turned his head in the direction of the voice and saw Kazuo inside the mansion. He snorted and went in. Fujin led him into his office. Toshio followed him but was confused. He thought, something feels off about Kazuo. It's like he isn't being himself. Toshio analyzed but didn't understand why Kazuo was acting this way. Fuji knew that his disguise as Kazuo wouldn't be perfect. After all, he had only seen him for a small time. He could replicate his appearance perfectly. He talked with Kazuo for so long before killing to learn how Kazuo spoke. Unfortunately, Kazuo spoke in a very enraged tone. So he didn't know how he talked or acted normally. So this disguise was barely usable. Fortunately, Fujin was only using it to fool common people. So though a few did find something odd, they didn't consider it too much. Fujin and Toshio entered the office. Once they were alone, Toshio angrily shouted, Kazuo? Why did you spread those rumors? You bastard. I paid you so much over the years and you still dare to have greed towards my post? Fujin just chuckled in response. His brazen attitude enraged Toshio even further. However, before he could speak another word, Kazuo disappeared and he felt a blow to the back of his head. He immediately dropped unconscious. Fujin muttered softly, begin the fireworks. His clone nodded and disappeared. Outside the mansion, the servants continued working quietly. They looked like a very disciplined workforce. However, if anyone were to take a closer look, they would notice that the servants were extremely scared. Everyone had grim faces. A servant prayed, I hope no one here is foolish enough to leak the truth. Otherwise, that vile person will skin us all alive. As they were working, suddenly a loud sound was heard. Everyone looked up at the sky. They were stunned. Despite the sun still being out, they could see a colorful explosion in the sky. They heard some more voices. They looked around to see more fireworks heading towards the sky. The fireworks erupted with a resounding crack, scattering vibrant fragments around the bright canvas above. The people in the city were wrapping up their work in a hurry so as to be free during the buffet when they noticed the fireworks. Soon, most of the people in the city were entranced by it. 
the unexpected daytime pyrotechnics left the crowd astonished. The explosions unleashed an array of colors and transformed the sky into a living tapestry of vivid blues, radiant reds, and shimmering gold. Each explosion brightened the mood of the citizens and raised their hope for their futures. A young girl's wide eyes locked onto the mesmerizing display. In joy and wonder, she tugged her mother's sleeve and exclaimed, Mom, look! It is so beautiful! Most kids had similar reactions. They all wanted to go there. However, the adults were puzzled. They wondered, didn't Kazuo-sama say that the buffet will be in the evening? Why is he calling us now? However, the crowd also had some simpletons and foodies. They thought, it is the royal buffet. I guess they are inviting us for the royal starters. With watery mouths, they immediately began rushing towards the mansion, unaware of the tragedy awaiting them. Within minutes, the mansion was surrounded by people once again. The numbers instantly reached hundreds and soon crossed a thousand. They noticed that the servants working in the mansion were arranging tables and chairs, but couldn't see any food nearby. However, they waited patiently and eagerly. Fujin waited for a few minutes for the crowd to become substantially larger. Finally, he stepped out of the mansion. He had a plain expression on his face. He walked towards the mansion gate and slammed his hands on the ground. Earth release, earth wall jutsu. Instead of a vast wall, a small pillar of one meter length and breadth but with a height of ten meters rose from the ground. Fujin jumped on it. The crowd was still noisy. He looked around and squinted his eyes. Immediately, a thick bloodlust emanated from Fujin. It spread towards the people. The bloodlust terrified them. Immediately, everyone looked at him in terror. The crowd went silent. They looked at Fujin with fear and wondered, why is Kazuo-sama doing this? Isn't he supposed to be our hero? Fujin observed the crowds and was satisfied with the reaction. The bloodlust terrified the civilians without harming them. He said loudly, Lord Kazakage has investigated the assassin who killed the nobles and Sunagakure's ninjas. He discovered that he was aided by some traitors. As soon as he said it, one of Fujin's clones flickered next to him and handed him Toshio's unconscious body. The people's eyes widened as they realized what was going on. Fujin said, Toshio was that traitor. He provided the assassin with critical and classified information. Hence, Lord Kazakage has decided that he is to be executed. Chapter 274 Everyone's Eyes Widened A few who were well-learned and were close to Toshio wondered, Wait, Lord Kazakage has no authority to punish nobles. Only Lord Daimyo has. What is going on? They wanted to voice their opinion. But the bloodlust made them terrified to even open their mouths. A sword appeared in Fujin's hands. His clone held Toshio properly and offered Fujin his neck. Fujin swung his sword. With one swing of his blade, Toshio was beheaded. The crowd watched with complex expressions. They didn't know what to feel. On one hand, they were happy that a traitor had been killed. Perhaps if they weren't suppressed by the bloodlust, they would have even cheered. On the other hand, though Toshio wasn't a good person, he had properly propagated himself to be one. So the number of people aware of his real face was very low. Only the recent rumors tarnished his reputation considerably. They stayed silent and hoped that this nightmare would be over. However, Fujin's next words destroyed all their hopes. Fujin said, Lord Kazakage is very upset over how the noble of Shankudo has caused the deaths of tens of Sunagakure ninjas. As a punishment, all the ninjas deployed to protect the city will be withdrawn. From this moment onwards, this city won't have any protection from us. The civilians were terrified. Their city was deep in the desert. The climate here was very harsh. So they didn't suffer from any bandit attacks as no bandit group would operate here. However, the city frequently had to face deadly sandstorms. The help of ninjas during this time was indispensable. Without their aid to activate the seals and warn everyone in time, many people would die. 
The ninjas would also aid a lot after the storm had passed the city in order to restore the city and ensure that it functioned properly. Fujin withdrew his bloodlust and said with a sigh, Though I don't want to leave here by yourself, I can't disobey my leader. I wish you will. The people shouted, No! Please don't leave us, he. However, their words were stuck in their mouths as Fujin and his clone disappeared. Only Toshio's headless body was left on the stone platform. They looked around and the remaining Suna ninjas had disappeared as well. Immediately, terror invaded the minds of everyone present. Chaos spread as everyone discussed what to do without any proper plan. Many began talking about leaving the city. A few rushed into the mansion and began stealing expensive items and money, while the rest rushed to their families. After leaving the city, Fujin dispelled all of his clones except one. Memories entered his brain. He analyzed them all and frowned. He thought, what the hell? None of my clones detected any Suna ninja moving towards this city. Where are Sunagakir ninjas? Did Raza decide to abandon the West thinking that they have no choice but to obey him? But that doesn't make any sense. He should have been sending ninjas here desperately. Fujin looked towards the east and wondered, did Shikaku or some other village stir up huge trouble? Only that would explain such a reaction. But what sort of trouble would they have to stir to make Raza incapable of sending ninjas here? Fujin began analyzing. However, he couldn't come up with any explanation other than war. He wondered, is there a war happening? But I don't recall any major wars happening at this time other than the civil war in Kiri. Should I withdraw and check out the circumstances there? Fujin analyzed more before deciding, no. I'll head over to the next city. If there is no one protecting it, I'll withdraw and check out the circumstances around Suna and Wind Capital. Else I'll decide after seeing what sort of arrangements Raza has made for the West. Fujin rested for some time to recover his chakra and moved towards the city of Mizunashi. Back in Shankudo, the news spread throughout the city. The entire city was in a panic. The news also reached Toshio's family. They were immediately engulfed by grief and rage. His wife cursed loudly, Kazuo, Raza. I will never let this go. Did you forget that my family is related to Daimyo as well? Her sons calmed her down saying, Softly mother. It will be troublesome if someone hears us. They might take out the hate of father on us. She controlled herself. With tears running down her cheeks, she said, We will leave this city under this disguise and travel to Wind Capital however we can. Only then we can get your father justice. Her sons nodded. They immediately began making preparations. A few influential people stepped forward to control the panic and instilled some sense of discipline and control in the city. The city calmed down a bit. After discussing and making proper arrangements, most of the city decided to leave the city the next day. The next morning, over 80% of the citizens decided to leave the city. Toshio's family also mixed with them. They began traveling across the treacherous deserts and moved towards the nearby cities, towns, and villages. Around the same time, Fujin reached Mizunashi City. Suddenly, his last clone dispelled himself and he received his memories. A smile formed on his face as he thought, as I expected. A vast number of people there will begin migrating. After all, who would want to stay in a dying city? Now, when they enter nearby cities, they will spread the events that happened in their city. Soon, the news will spread like wildfire throughout the land of wind. The news that Raza ordered the execution of a noble and left a city with tens of thousands of people to fend for themselves. Even though the cities in the east have no option but to stay subservient to Suna, they will become very suspicious of Raza's intention. And irrespective of what deal the wind daimyo and Raza made, they will enter into conflict once again. After all, that noble's family is still alive. As long as they reach the daimyo, another round of hostilities will begin. Even if they don't manage to, the news alone will make the other nobles pressurize the daimyo. Eventually, some of the people that migrated will migrate to the cities in the east. When they do, Raza's reputation will be hit even further. 
he will have to take a hell lot of effort to be able to recover his lost reputation. However, the bad will among the ones who suffered will last for decades. If Shikaku and Hiruzen don't promote me after this and give me access to that section A of the library, I'll make them experience a similar hell. Though I guess they are too smart to make such a silly mistake. Fujin turned his thoughts towards the city in front of him. His eyes were glowing. He muttered, another city without any active seals protecting them. That said, the last assassination was fun. I wonder if this city will make it interesting for me as well. He took a step forward as wind covered his entire body. Before he could land his step, he disappeared from his spot and entered the city. He began walking casually towards the center of the city as usual. As expected, it also had a mansion at the center of the city. Fujin stood in a secluded corner and wondered, what should I do if this noble is also hiding while a decoy is taking his spot? Doing the same trick twice won't be feasible. After all, many would be suspicious of what I pulled in Shunkudo. The same thing happening in two cities will reduce the suspicion on Raza and people will suspect foul play. So it will be counterproductive. Fujin thought for a bit and gave up, leave it. I'll just kill whoever is acting to be the noble and the Suna ninjas protecting him. Though I should be careful. Kazuo was willing to blow himself up. However, if he had used something original or unpredictable, then I could have had some trouble. As he was deciding, he felt eyes on himself. He turned his head and saw a man approaching him. He laughed awkwardly and asked, Young man, can you tell me where the flower shop is? I lost my way around here, ha ha ha. Fuji nodded and said, Sure. Travel three streets down this road. Then take a right and then the second left. You'll find the most famous flower shop in this city. The man quickly said, Thank you, young man. You saved me. He quickly left. Fujin watched his back. But this time, he didn't dare to use his chakra. He thought, suspicious. I didn't sense any chakra from him, but something about him feels off. He approached me right after I used some chakra. Fujin turned around and left in the opposite direction. The man didn't look back at Fujin and continued walking while thinking, I didn't expect him to know where the flower shop is. Did he just luckily come across the flower shop? Or is he an old spy? But why would someone place a spy in this remote city? Unless... Chapter 275 The man was none other than the elite Jounin, Odaka. He was hanging around the mansion under the disguise of an old man when he felt some chakra being used by Fujin so he decided to check him out. However, Fujin gave him the answer spontaneously. Odaka looked at another young man around him and asked once again, Young man, I want to buy flowers for my wife. It's our anniversary. Can you tell me where the flower shop is? The boy politely answered, Just enter this street. The fifth shop on the right is a flower shop. Odaka raised his eyebrows. It wasn't the same location that Fujin mentioned. He pointed at a street a bit farther from his location and asked, Young man, I was told that the flower shop is in that street after taking the second left. The boy followed his finger. After hearing his words, a look of disgust appeared on his face. He looked at Odaka and said with disgust, Scums like you deserve to burn in hell. He quickly left, leaving Odaka dumbfounded. He wondered, what the hell did that young man point me to? He looked back at where he saw Fujin, but Fujin was nowhere to be seen. He looked in another direction and his eyes met with one of the umbu who was hiding. Odaka pointed towards where he had met up with Fujin. The umbu nodded and left. Meanwhile, Odaka was interested in where Fujin had pointed him. So he quickly moved towards it. As soon as he did, his face turned red and he became angry. He let out a laugh and said loudly, Good one, boy. You got me. The people around were startled by the loud voice. They looked at him like he was a crazy pervert and maintained a safe distance from him. Odaka was staring at a brothel. In fact, there were multiple brothels and sex toy shops on that street. He immediately left. Fujin, of course, had no idea what was here. 
He just gave random directions so that no one would think he is new in the city and get suspicious. Even if there was no flower shop there, the person would just assume that they were pranked and curse him without suspecting anything. However, Odaka was not just some person. And he didn't approach Fujin due to coincidence. He immediately turned around and began moving to see what the umbu could have discovered. However, when he reached the mansion again, an explosion happened inside it. Odaka quickly turned his attention towards the mansion as he heard the sound of the explosion. He wondered, did the assassin attack? He quickly entered the mansion. So did a dozen other jounin level ninjas. When he was observing the mansion, Fujin had already noticed how many ninjas were inside the mansion. He spotted nine ninjas among which three were at Chunin level and six were merely jinnins. Just like in the previous city, the noble was hiding in one room with two ninjas protecting him while his family was hiding underground. He decided to take the same approach. In the central room in the mansion, the decoy was sitting dressed as the noble. Two Chunins stood next to him facing opposite directions in case there was a sneak attack. This room had a lot of artifacts. Large animals made of wood were placed in the room. The decoy was very nervous. He didn't have the same conviction as Tetsuo. Even the ninjas were very nervous. They were already informed that an attack was just a matter of time. They had heard about the invincible record of the assassin and didn't want to end up dead too. So they resolutely followed all the instructions given by Yura. As they were waiting, a head popped out from the ground. The decoy was spooked and immediately shouted in terror, He's here. He's here! The other ninja turned around while the one facing Fujin immediately threw the kunai he was holding at Fujin and jumped back. So did the other ninja. Fujin's entire body left the ground. He observed the kunai closely as it had an explosion tag attached to it. He immediately shot an air bullet at it. However, before the air bullet could hit the kunai, the explosion tag exploded. Fujin instantly jumped back and refined his chakra into wind while wondering, what the hell? Why did it explode so far away from me? Wind release, infinite breakthrough jutsu. The amount of chakra used for performing the jutsu was very low as he didn't want to blow up the mansion. The wind generated by the jutsu instantly blew away the smoke. In addition, a few wind blades were also fired. They hit the decoy and killed him on the spot. However, the two Suna ninjas had moved sufficiently away to dodge the wind blades. As the smoke cleared, Fujin noticed that the Suna ninjas had backed to the wall while the noble was dead. A frown formed on his face as he saw the two Suna chunins. They were both wearing a gas mask to cover the nose and mouth. Fujin frowned and asked, The explosion tag contained poison? The Suna ninjas began laughing. One said, that's right. Did you think that no one could stop you? The other said, this is a newly created poison. Your antidotes won't help you. Ha ha ha. If you want to live, surrender now. Fujin frowned. His eyes widened as he suddenly sensed thirteen strong chakras approaching the room. He looked at the Sunachunans and said, good trap. He immediately disappeared from their line of sight. The Suna ninjas were surprised. One exclaimed, Where did H? His question was cut short as a punch pierced through his chest. His partner turned his head and saw in horror as a punch came straight at his face. He was too slow to even react. His last thought was, So fast. The punch landed on his face and killed him as well. Immediately, the door was smashed as three Jounins entered the room. Soon after, the walls were knocked out and even more Jounins entered. Odaka was the last one to enter. They surrounded Fujin from all directions. All of them had consumed the antidote and hence weren't concerned about the poison in the air. However, their expressions became ugly on seeing the dead Chunins. Fujin observed them and thought, 13 Jounins. No, 12 Jounins and an elite Jounin. Now that's a good trap. A smile formed on his face. The Suna ninjas were surprised by his smile. It was as if he had caught them in a trap instead of what the actual situation was. Odaka stepped forward and said, 
I never expected that you would smile in this situation. Though, I guess it isn't strange considering what you achieved. I really admire how many headaches you gave to Lord Kazakage. I saw a few of his hair turn gray within a month. Ha ha ha. Fujin was puzzled by his attitude. Odaka spoke casually as if he was meeting an old friend instead of an enemy. However, his eyes widened as he sensed dozens of ninjas heading towards them. He realized, I see. He is just wasting time. As expected of someone so old. Odaka chuckled and said, You sense them, huh? It doesn't matter. With the poison you inhaled, you will die the most painful and gruesome death. To be honest, I am very interested in knowing who you are. I wonder if you can satisfy this old man's request now or if I will have to wait until you die. Fujin let out a chuckle and said, We will have to see who will die and who will live. He took a step forward and suddenly disappeared. Odaka's eyes widened. He shouted, Be careful. He is fast. Fujin appeared in front of a jounin. He was holding a kunai in each hand. He immediately stabbed towards the jounin's heart. The jounin immediately jumped backwards. The ones next to him immediately attacked Fujin. Fujin stopped his attack and used his two kunais to block their attacks. However, the ninjas in front of him weaved hand signs. Wind release, air bullet jutsu. Fujin immediately pushed the attackers away and got out of the way. The bullets passed harmlessly and pierced through the walls. The Jounin frowned as those rogue bullets could hit some of their reinforcements. Odaka observed Fujin and analyzed with a frown on his face, hmm, he is faster and stronger than an average Jounin. Even among elite Jounins, his speed and physical strength might be at the very top. But, why is the poison not slowing him down? Is this his capability after being slowed or does the poison not affect him for some reason? Odaka was taking Fujin lightly as his death was certain. But now he became doubtful. He immediately became very serious. As soon as Fujin landed in another spot, he was once again attacked by three Jounins. Fujin blocked their attacks and tried attacking back, but they dodged him with perfect teamwork. Suddenly, all three backed away. Fujin's eyes widened as he noticed two ninjas building up their chakra while weaving hand signs. He wondered, do they not care about the mansion? He instantly backed off and concentrated his chakra as well. Wind release, wind dragon jutsu. Two massive wind dragons formed and dived at Fujin. However, Fujin wasn't much concerned. He had already deduced the jutsu by looking at their hand signs. Wind release, infinite breakthrough jutsu. He poured 20% of his chakra into the jutsu. Extremely strong winds were breathed by Fujin. It hit the two wind dragons and dispersed it. The Suna Jounins had grim expressions. They had the same thought, is he from the land of wind or are we? They all used their respective defensive moves. The walls of the mansion began collapsing. Fujin was about to pour even more chakra into the jutsu and cause maximum damage to the Suna ninjas by dismantling their defensive jutsus when he suddenly jumped towards his right and looked behind. His eyes widened as he saw the wooden horse behind him open its mouth wide and shoot hundreds of needles at him. Fujin continued blowing the infinite breakthrough, but this time, he used it towards his left so that his body would be pushed to his right. However, it was too late. A few needles grazed his left hand and two needles pierced his left arm and stayed stuck in it. Fujin cursed, shit. Chapter 276 Chakra gathered in Fujin's eyes as he noticed the chakra threads controlling the wooden horse. He traced them back and his eyes landed on Odaka. He thought, a puppet master. I guess these needles are poisoned as well. I don't have much time. Seeing Fujin get hit improved the morale of the Suna Jounins who were getting overwhelmed. Odaka also sighed in relief. However, Fujin's eyes quickly scanned through the Suna Jounins and finally settled on one guy. He decided, this one. Though the winds were still flowing strongly in the mansion, Fujin flickered and appeared next to him. The Jounin immediately moved backwards while swiping his kunai at Fujin. 
Fujin dropped the kunai in his hand and stopped his opponent by grabbing his wrist. At the same time, the ninjas nearby threw shurikens at Fujin from close range. A sigh escaped Fujin's mouth as he thought, sucks that they didn't come close. In the very next moment, he exploded. The eyes of the jounin whose arm was being grabbed widened in horror. He couldn't use any jutsu to defend himself nor could he get away. His left arm was blown up. The explosion hit his body, burning his eyes and face. He was launched across the room and crashed into a wall. The shurikens that were thrown at Fujin were also launched back due to the explosion. However, everyone dodged them easily. But not a single person had a happy expression. Outside the mansion, people were going with their lives as usual. A few people who were around the mansion noticed the sounds of explosions and clashes inside the mansion and began wondering what was happening. Suddenly, a massive explosion occurred. A corner of the mansion was blown up. Pieces of stone and concrete were sent flying for hundreds of meters in the city and crashed into a few unlucky houses and stores. Immediately, everyone began looking at the mansion which stood at the center of the city. These included the ninjas that were hiding in the city, the civilians, and a young man sitting in a cafe. The young man's eyes glowed as he observed the mansion while going through the memories he received. A smirk formed on his face as he thought, not bad. Not bad at all. They set up a very good trap. The previous easy missions were indeed to lower my guard. If it was someone careless or arrogant, this trap would have been very successful. Now then. The young man was none other than Fujin. When Odaka approached him, Fujin had already finished observing the mansion and sent a shadow clone into the ground to attack the mansion. Fujin's eyes moved rapidly as he spotted four Umbu ninjas who were observing him from different locations. At the moment of the explosion, they stopped looking at him and watched the mansion. Fujin took the opportunity and flickered immediately. He appeared behind an Umbu ninja and pierced a kunai through his throat. Before the umbu could realize that someone killed him, he flickered behind the next umbu ninja and repeated the same. The umbu were located quite far away from each other. So they didn't notice their comrades falling. However, they had a job to spy on Fujin. They turned their attention back to him only to notice him not being in his spot. They immediately became alert. However, another one of them was killed by Fujin. The final Umbu noticed someone killing a fellow Umbu member through the corner of his eye. He was shocked. He immediately grabbed his kunai. Fujin flickered once again and appeared behind the last Umbu. The Umbu quickly turned around and used his kunai to stop Fujin's attack. The two kunai clashed creating a loud sound. Inside the mansion, one Jounin asked, Did he die? As the dust began settling, Odaka walked ahead and said with a grim expression, I guess not. He was a shadow clone. No wonder the poison had no effect on him. The Jounins immediately went silent. Finally, one asked, Did we get toyed with by a mere clone? Everyone knew the answer, but everyone was silent. Suddenly, their silence was broken by the loud sound of two kunai clashing. Everyone looked out of the hole the explosion had created and noticed an umbu ninja fighting with someone. Fujin was surprised by the loudness of the sound. He wondered, is his kunai made of something that creates a loud noise? But what's the use of such a loud kunai? The Suna umbu sighed in relief. He thought, I'm glad I kept this kunai with me for emergencies. Now everyone will know that he is here. However, his relief was short-lived. Fujin shot an air bullet at his forehead at point blank. The umbu had no time to dodge. A hole was left in his forehead as he dropped dead. However, the loud sound had done its job. Over a hundred ninjas were staring at Fujin. The Jounins led by Odaka immediately flickered towards Fujin. Yura and his subordinates were close to Fujin as well. They quickly moved towards him as well. Fujin watched them as his body was enveloped in wind. Odaka's eyes widened. Dozens of poison needles appeared in his hands and he threw them all at Fujin. However, before they could reach him, Fujin had already disappeared. The Jounins all landed where Fujin was standing. 
Immediately wind enveloped them as well as they weaved hand seals and cursed. Do you think only you know the wind instantaneous body jutsu? Immediately, all the Jounins used the same jutsu and began their chase. Apart from these twelve, the others in the city who could use that jutsu began the chase as well. Fujin turned around and noticed a few dozen ninjas chasing after him. He thought, the area around the city is a complete desert. There is nothing that can hide me. If this was the land of fire, they wouldn't even know where to chase me. Still, it's fine. The chase depends on the expertise in this jutsu and stamina. I'll just keep running until they can't keep up anymore. Fujin looked ahead and continued running. Apart from this, he had another choice. That was to use shadow clones and split in different directions. It would force the Suna ninjas to split up as well. He could then hunt them one by one. Fujin did think of this idea, but he dismissed it immediately. He thought, though I could kill a good number of them, it's too risky. My shadow clones can't be poisoned, but I can be. I'd prefer to not get poisoned in this desert. After all, poison is Suna's speciality. Though it wasn't a match for Tsunade, I'm no Tsunade. Avoiding getting poisoned is the only method for me. Over the last couple of years, Fujin's knowledge about medical jutsus, the human body and poisons had increased a lot. But he wasn't arrogant enough to think that it would be anywhere close to competing against Suna. The Suna ninjas chasing Fujin had already split into groups. At the forefront was Manabu. Behind him were Yura, Odaka, and Eagle. The Jounins were behind them in smaller groups of their own. Though they could use the jutsu, the amount of time needed and the distance they could cover was different for everyone. Every Suna ninja had a grim face as they noticed Fujin getting further and further away at every second. One of the Jounins cursed, what the hell? How does he flicker by more than a kilometer every time? And why does his jutsu activate instantly? The one next to him muttered, it's almost as if the wind gods have all blessed him. They weren't the only ones with that thought. Manabu was upset as well. He was one of the strongest wind users in Sunagakir. He was quite prideful about his expertise in wind manipulation. He thought, if not for the magnet Kekiai Jinkai, even Raza wouldn't be a match for my wind release. Who is this ninja? Fujin used the jutsu ten times consecutively. He was about to use it again when he suddenly stopped and disrupted his chakra. Immediately, the scene in front of him changed. A dozen ninjas appeared in front of him. He was alarmed by the situation and wondered, why the hell would they set up an ambush all the way out here? Manabu, Odaka, and the rest noticed it and sighed in relief. The reinforcements sent by Raza had arrived when Fujin was wasting time in Shankudo City. Manabu thought, he finally encountered one of the squads. I was afraid he was going to run straight through the net we set up. After all, how could anyone catch anyone who moves a kilometer with every step? However, it looks like he has used up all his luck. Of all the squads to encounter, he encountered that monster. Chapter 277 The Twelve Suna Ninjas Stared at Fujin The one standing at the front and who set up the Jinjutsu was Susumu, an elite Jounin. He chuckled and said, You must have had horrible luck to encounter us. After today, even your bones won't remain. The others chuckled as well. Fujin didn't bother arguing against them. After all, he could see the reason why they were so cocky. It was a young boy, standing in the midst of their ranks. The boy had fair skin, short, spiky and red hair and emerald green eyes with dark rings giving him a distinct look. In addition, there was a gourd on his back, which was too big for his size. Fujin thought, facing Gara in a desert full of sand. Indeed, my luck would have been horrible had he been older. However, at this age, is Raza out of his mind sending his ten-year-old kid and Suna's only Jinchuriki against me? If I didn't already know the future, I'd be very tempted to kill him right here. And unless he released Shikaku, I doubt he'd have any chance of survival either. Unlike Fujin, Gara didn't waste any time thinking. Sand poured out of his gourd and immediately moved towards Fujin. Fujin was about to flicker when he felt something unusual. 
he immediately disrupted his chakra and moved out of the way while looking at Susumu. Susumu grinned and said, With me here, you should forget about being able to escape. Garasama, attack without restraint. I'll ensure that he can't escape. Gara ignored his words and kept attacking. Fujin dodged while thinking, annoying. He uses Jinjutsu right when I am about to use a Jutsu. Though I can break it right away, it's dangerous. After all, who knows how I will use the Jutsu when under a Jinjutsu. This level of Jinjutsu, he must be Sabaku Susumu, one of Raza's cousins. And probably the strongest Jinjutsu user from Suna. But how is he affecting my chakra? Susumu was very confident about trapping Fujin. However, his smile disappeared as he noticed that Fujin kept avoiding Gara's sand every time. Even though Fujin couldn't use any jutsu, he wasn't very concerned. His normal speed far exceeded the speed of Gara's sand. Not a single attack came close to hurting him. However, as Fujin was dodging the sand, Manabu finally caught up. Fujin looked back and frowned, at this rate, I'll be surrounded by hundreds of ninjas. His eyes began glowing as he focused chakra in them. Gara was becoming impatient. He sent all the sand out of his gourd. It formed into small pebble-sized balls and rained down at Fujin. Fujin got out of range of the attack with ease once again as he observed, I see. This guy is leaking his chakra into the wind. He is using the air I breathe to slowly affect my chakra network and make me fall into a Jinjutsu. This shouldn't be enough to make me fall under a Jinjutsu, but he probably increases the chakra right when I'm busy refining my chakra to use a Jutsu. A sparkle appeared in Fujin's eyes as he looked at Susumu. His look towards him had changed. He no longer viewed Susumu as an obstruction and instead viewed him as a delicacy. A shiver passed through Susumu's spine as he wondered, why is he looking at me like this? Don't tell me he swings that way. Still, shouldn't he be concerned about Gara? Wind release, air bullet jutsu. Manabu noticed that Fujin was focusing on Gara and Susumu. He had no intention of getting in Gara's way. So he maintained distance and fired 15 air bullets at Fujin. Fujin noticed the attack and dodged once again. However, Gara was annoyed. Normally, everyone would be terrified of him and his sand. However, not only was Fujin not afraid, he didn't even give Gara a second glance. It was as if Fujin didn't consider him a threat at all. Gara exerted more chakra. Hundreds of sandballs rained at Fujin, who nimbly dodged while emitting his own chakra into the air to neutralize Susumu's threat. Susumu immediately sensed Fujin's chakra and was shocked. However, before he could do anything, Gara shouted, Desert Coffin. While Fujin was dodging the sand shower, Gara led him towards where his sand was. Fujin was surrounded on all sides. For the second time, Fujin looked into Gara's eyes. A frown formed on Gara's face as he muttered, Why isn't he afraid of me, mother? In anger, the sand began moving much faster. However, Fujin, who was maintaining eye contact, suddenly disappeared. He reappeared far outside the little trap Gara had created. Susumu shouted, Impossible! How did you use a jutsu? He wondered, even if he has seen through my technique, he hasn't broken it yet. So how did he flicker? Manabu flickered behind Fujin with a grim expression and attacked Fujin with a kunai. Fujin grabbed his kunai and hit Manabu's kunai and jumped backwards immediately. Manabu did the same as Gara's sand appeared between the two of them. Manabu said, he didn't use a jutsu. That is his raw speed. Susumu was shocked. He looked at Fujin again and wondered, that's his normal speed? No wonder he has been so successful in his assassinations. We have to kill him here. Otherwise, he will become a huge headache for Suna. As they were wondering how to deal with Fujin, Odaka and Eagle arrived and joined Manabu. Yura too arrived but stayed back and began coordinating the ninjas and establishing new perimeters to ensure that Fujin couldn't escape. However, unlike the level-headed Jounins, one person had no patience. He was incredibly annoyed by how dismissive Fujin was of him. Gara shouted, San Tsunami! 
Immediately, the sand in the desert began moving. It formed into a wave of tsunami and headed towards Fujin. However, instead of terror, there was a smile on Fujin's face as he thought, finally, he messed up. I was worried after seeing the puppet master. The Suna Jounins noticed the tsunami and had grim expressions. The Jutsu covered a wide area. All of them were targeted as well. They immediately moved away. The remaining ten ninjas from the ambush squad were standing behind Gara and hence were safe from the tsunami. However, they began sweating in fear due to the scale of the attack. Fujin looked at Susumu and decided, I was planning to leave and never return here. But since you decided to keep me here, I might as well have some fun. Fujin disrupted his chakra once again and exerted a huge amount of chakra. Susumu noticed the chakra build up and immediately cursed, shit. He will run away. Even before he could complete his statement, Fujin disappeared. The Suna ninjas wanted to stop him, but the sand tsunami severely restricted their movement. The Suna ninjas who were still rushing towards Fujin stopped and dispersed out of the attack's way. Odaka expanded his chakra field and tried to sense Fujin. However, he could no longer sense him. Odaka frowned and said, he is gone. I can't sense him anymore. It was a mistake to include Gara in such an important mission. He doesn't have the tactical know-how yet to fight at this level. The others silently agreed. Eagle said, luckily Yura began establishing a new perimeter. We can still catch up with him if he gets stalled. However, Manabu, Odaka and Susumu didn't share the same opinion. They had all engaged with Fujin. His speed was too fast for anyone under the elite Jounin level to handle. Excluding them, there were only two more elite Jounins around the city. And neither were stationed in that direction. Though they were upset that Fujin had gotten away, they had another matter to take care of. The sand tsunami was approaching them rapidly. They immediately flickered out of the way. Gara, who created this mess, grinned and said, That's it. Run away from me. As soon as he said it, the sand around him moved quickly and formed a sand wall on his left side. Gara was shocked and turned his head to the left. His eyes widened as he saw six holes in the sand wall. Six air bullets pierced through the thin layer of sand and grazed Gara's arms and chest. Gara's eyes widened in horror as a red line appeared across his chest. His arms also began bleeding. He muttered, What is this? Is this blood? My. Immediately he shouted as loudly as he could, Blood my blood. The Suna Jounins who were still dodging the sand tsunami were shocked as they felt a thick bloodlust and heard Gara's screams. Susumu asked in terror, Gara is injured? How? The others were horrified too. The sand tsunami was just a minor inconvenience. If they didn't have to chase after Fujin, this jutsu wouldn't have any effect on them. However, they began sweating in fear at the thought of Gara losing control. The ones who had it worst were the ten Suna ninjas who were behind Gara. Their legs began shivering in terror. A few fell on the ground. The ones who could stand began running away. Chapter 278 Unlike what Odaka had thought, Fujin hadn't run away. Instead, he just hit his chakra signature. And thanks to the cover provided by the sand tsunami, no one could see, hear, or smell him. He immediately attacked Gara with the intention of making him bleed. However, he was surprised as he thought, the air bullets breaking through is reasonable. After all, the sand that defended him was too little. But why did he get injured so much? Doesn't he have the sand armor? Fujin observed him properly and realized, I see. I guess he hasn't created that technique yet. He turned his attention towards the Suna ninjas on the other side of the tsunami and muttered, Well, sucks to be you guys. Odaka activated his chakra field once again. His eyes widened as he shouted, That assassin is still here. Bastard hit his chakra signature. Fujin detected the chakra field and immediately used wind instantaneous body jutsu. Odaka sensed Fujin getting farther away and said, He escaped. Manabu asked, 
Are you sure that he didn't hide his chakra again? It'll be annoying if he interferes when we are stopping Dara. Odaka replied, Yes. Last time his chakra signature just disappeared. This time, I sensed him leaving. Besides, I doubt he would want to stay when Gara is losing control. They could still hear Gara's screams as his body began transforming. The sand tsunami had lost its power and was settling down. But other than Eagle and the three elite Jaunans, the rest stayed away in fear. Susumu moved towards Gara while leading hand signs, Manabu shouted, Don't let him fall asleep. Susumu already knew it. He reached as close to Gara as he could and completed his hand signs. Demise of the Rebirth Despite being partially transformed, the Jinjutsu hit Gara. As the Jinjutsu took hold, a serene sensation washed over him like a gentle breeze on summer's eve. In an instant, his tumultuous emotions were caressed and quelled. It was as if the weight of anger, hatred, pain, and panic were lifted. The world around him transformed into a dreamland adorned by Sakura blossoms. As Gara watched the Sakura petals floating with the wind, he felt a soothing sensation. The illusion cocooned him in a realm of tranquility, offering respite from the burdens of reality. For a fleeting moment, he found solace in the beauty of this ephemeral sanctuary. Unfortunately, he couldn't stay in this world forever. A wave of anger burned in his heart as Shikaku transferred his chakra into Gara's body to break the illusion and further transform the boy. Susumu and the rest knew that the Jinjutsu wouldn't hold a Jinchuriki down for long. When Gara opened his eyes, he saw four puppets surrounding him. His body was tied with metal strings held by the puppets, restricting his mobility. Gara roared in rage as he began struggling. Odaka gritted his teeth and increased his control on his puppets to ensure that they wouldn't be sent flying. Fortunately, he wasn't alone. Manabu jumped high in the sky and blew an intense wind on Gara. Gara's knees bent. He felt an intense pressure falling down on him continuously. The Suna ninjas sighed in relief on seeing Gara being pinned down. However, Gara opened his eyes and stared at Manabu. Manabu immediately had a bad feeling. The sand under Gara's feet began moving. It instantly reached Manabu. Fortunately, Manabu was prepared and flickered out of the way. Gara's eyes moved and landed on Odaka. Odaka immediately jumped as he felt the sand under his feet move. As soon as he jumped, multiple tentacles made of sand appeared and moved towards Odaka. Realizing the danger, Odaka opened a scroll and made a hand seal. Immediately, a huge turtle made of wood and metal appeared between him and the sand. The sand hit the belly of the turtle while Odaka landed on its back and immediately jumped towards Manabu. The sand tentacles were stopped. However, more sand moved and completely engulfed the turtle. Odaka's remaining four puppets were also engulfed and crushed by sand. He sighed and muttered, This is going to be a painful fight. Manabu nodded. The cost of building high-quality puppets was quite high. He said, Fortunately, we bought enough time. Odaka nodded as he saw that Susumu had returned with two ninjas behind him. Susumu looked at the situation and instructed, We will hold him down. As soon as we do, use your techniques to seal him temporarily. The two ninjas nodded nervously. They were sent along with Susumu and Gara in case such a scenario happened. However, despite being trained, they had very little experience in sealing a Jinchuriki. After all, if something went wrong in Suna, Raza would take care of it. They would have no reason to act. Odaka, Manabu, and Susumu began fighting Gara again. Meanwhile, Eagle stood next to the two sealing ninjas to ensure that Gara wouldn't harm them. After five minutes of intense battle, they finally managed to pin Gara down once again. Susumu shouted, Now! Immediately, the two sealing ninjas summoned and opened a giant roll of cloth. Cloth binding technique. The cloth moved towards Gara and began wrapping itself around it. Gara struggled, but he couldn't get out of it. In a few seconds, he was completely covered by the cloth. The Suna ninjas finally sighed in relief. Gara was stopped. They and the city close to them were safe. 
Susumu grabbed a ceiling tag and walked towards Gara in order to ensure that he couldn't break free. However, his eyes widened. He looked down at his chest in fear and disbelief. A kunai that was dyed in blood had pierced through his heart. The Suna ninjas were shocked as well. A second ago they were happy that Gara was sealed. Now, they watched in disbelief as the strongest Jinjutsu specialist in Suna closed his eyes and passed away. However, Fujin had no expression on his face. He didn't waste any time celebrating and instead looked at Manabu and Odaka. Wind release, infinite breakthrough jutsu. A massive windstorm was shot out towards them. Odaka hurriedly summoned a defensive puppet and the two hid behind it. However, both had grim expressions. Manabu asked, didn't you say that he ran away? Odaka answered, I definitely sensed him running away. Unless he kept hiding and sent a shadow clone away to fool me. Or maybe he ran away and returned while hiding his chakra. After all, we were busy stopping Gara. Manabu didn't question any further. After all, it was pointless. He said, this scum is very cunning. We were on guard while fighting Gara. If he had attacked then, Susumu would have dodged or blocked him. Instead, he waited until we had won and dropped our guard momentarily. Odaka nodded and said, he almost reminds me of Yellow Flash. In the third war, we lost most of our elite Jounins to his sneak attacks. Other than Tsunade, he was the main reason that we had to accept our defeat and form an alliance with Konoha. Manabu and Odaka's expressions became even uglier. They had speculated that the assassin was from Konoha. Both thought, if Kanoha has gained such a strong fighter who is willing to go to such an extreme during peacetime, then a war with them would prove extremely costly. While Manabu and Odaka were hiding from the storm, Eagle took the opportunity to flicker behind Fujin and attacked him with his kunai. However, Fujin withdrew the kunai from Susumu's heart and blocked the attack. Wind Release, Air Bullet Jutsu Eagle's eyes widened as he noticed the attack. He immediately jumped out of the way. Fujin let him go and instead spat out a fire on the cloth that had sealed Gara. The two sealing ninjas shouted in horror, No! Don't! Unfortunately, Fujin had no intention to listen to them. Eagle's eyes widened as well. He immediately began weeding hand signs and building up his chakra. However, before he could complete his hand signs, he was forced to jump backwards. A kunai grazed past his left forearm leaving a half-foot-long cut in it. He winced in pain but kept weaving hand signs. Water release, waterfall jutsu. Despite acting as fast as he could, the delay due to the pain meant that the cloth was already set on fire. A second later, a huge waterfall crashed down on the fire and doused it. At the same time, Manabu launched his own infinite breakthrough jutsu and neutralized Fujin's attack. He and Odaka appeared next to Eagle and asked, Where is the assassin? Eagle said, He is TH. His words were stuck in his mouth as he noticed that Fujin and Susumu's dead body had both disappeared. However, before they could investigate, a furious roar was heard through the desert. The Suna ninjas looked where Gara was sealed in grim expression as he broke out of the binding cloth. They began fighting him once again. Chapter 279, Manabu and Odaka led the fight to suppress Garo once again. However, without Susumu and with the added threat of an assassin, the fight became much more difficult. Manabu shouted, Yura, take command of others and encircle Gara. Have sensors monitor the battlefield and immediately report if anyone senses that assassin. Being struck once, Manabu didn't want to risk getting attacked again. Suna's losses were already terrible. In its entire history, Suna had experienced such losses during peacetime very few times. If he and Odaka were also to die then Suna would be in a terrible position. Not to mention, the assassin could also target their only Jinchuriki. As the Suna ninjas entered into a bitter struggle, the source of their suffering had already flickered tens of kilometers away. Fujin finally stopped and let out a sigh. He muttered, what a mess. First, 
They let me kill nobles without any obstruction and then they suddenly have over a hundred ninjas defending one remote city with their Jinchuriki standing right on my escape route. If I didn't know how impulsive Gara was, I could have been in a pinch. He looked at Susumu's dead body in his hand and muttered, though it's not all bad. My Jinjutsu level was stuck for a long time. Other than the bringer of darkness, I don't have a high-level Jinjutsu that could create a significant impact in battle. I was wondering if I could use the wind to somehow use Jinjutsu. Sadly, the Umbu duties didn't leave me with much time. But now it seems to be a good thing. With his Jutsus as the base, I would easily master high-level Jinjutsu in no time. Fujin carefully stored Susumu's body. He had no intention of trying to read his memories by himself. He looked back towards where the San Shinobi were fighting and analyzed, in this battle, I only used wind and fire jutsus. Apart from it, I also exposed my high speed, strength and expertise in chakra control, flickering and assassination. Sigh, it's a little more than what I planned to expose. But I did manage to keep my earth jutsus, vacuum jutsus, sword skills and chakra flow a secret. Even if they investigate, they wouldn't analyze that this was me any time soon. Though once I begin gaining fame, it won't be that difficult for their suspicions to fall on me. Fujin sighed. He could have never imagined that such a distant city would have an ambush made of one Jinchuriki, three elite Jounins, dozens of Jounins and hundreds of ninjas. He thought, I should have quit after burning the food storage. Fujin weaved a few hand signs and slammed his hand on the ground. Summoning Jutsu Smoke appeared in front of Fujin. It slowly dispersed, exposing a large saber-tooth holding the bloody leg of some wild animal in his mouth. He looked around and saw Fujin. Fujin said with a smile, Kaido, it's good to see you again. Kaido continued eating as he asked, Fujin, why did you call me? Fujin replied, I am deep in enemy territory and have no idea how many are hiding around in ambush. Give me a lift. Kaido continued eating the leg and said, Sure, give me a minute. He swallowed the entire leg and then spat out the bones and said, Get on. Fujin disappeared and appeared on his back. Kaido jumped high and spread his wings wide. He flapped it a few times and quickly rose above the clouds. He looked below towards where Gara was and said, Your enemy seems quite strong. I can feel his chakra and bloodlust all the way up here. Unlike Kaido, Fujin couldn't feel anything. He said, it's a Jinchuriki. A human who hosts a tailed beast. That said, he is a child and has lost control. If he didn't I'd be in deep trouble. Kaido nodded. Just based on the chakra fluctuations, he had no will to confront that being. He immediately began flying away toward the east. Fujin lay down on his back while enjoying the fresh air and gentle breeze. The last few weeks had been too tedious. He was on guard at all times due to being in enemy territory. Fujin closed his eyes and began meditating. Despite not having any seals, Fujin had noticed long back that meditating while flying above the clouds was much more effective than meditating in his meditation room. In addition, it had a soothing effect on his mind. In a world with ceaseless conflict and incessant schemes, he cherished this feeling. Unlike Fujin's calm mind, the deserts he flew over were in turmoil. After a long struggle, Manabu and Odaka managed to stop Gara's rampage and return him to his normal state. Unfortunately, the lives of four Chunins and one Jounin were lost in the process. Around them, hundreds of Suna ninjas were establishing a new perimeter. Dozens of sensors moved continuously in the desert to find where the assassin was hiding. Messenger birds were constantly being sent to keep everyone informed about the situation. A bit further from them, tens of thousands of people were migrating across the desert from Shunkudo to nearby towns and villages that had the protection of the Suna ninjas. Hiding among them was the family of the dead noble Toshio. However, Fujin would have nothing to do with it. He had already left the entire matter behind him. Raza and the Sunagakir Council would have to handle the aftermath of Fujin's actions. If they decide to retaliate, then Shikaku and Hiruzen would have to face the consequences of not properly defining Fujin's mission parameters.
Fujin flew on Kaido's back for half a day. They left the land of wind behind and entered the land of rivers undetected. Kaido found an abandoned hill and finally landed. He asked, don't you want to lift all the way back home? Fujin shook his head and thought, very few people know I have a summon. And even fewer know what my summon is or what their abilities are. Though I don't intend to hide them like my lightning jutsus, it's good to have another good trump card. Fujin replied, no need, I can make the remaining journey myself as there shouldn't be any enemies here. Kaido replied, all right. He disappeared in a cloud of smoke and returned to his home. Meanwhile, Fujin stretched for a bit and was about to move towards the land of fire when he heard a loud explosion. He turned his head to the left and squinted his eyes. Around three kilometers from his location, a forest fire had been started. He squinted his eyes and observed the location and analyzed, a fight? At this time of the night? I wonder what's going on. He suppressed his chakra signature and flickered towards the location. His chakra reserves had already recovered and he didn't sense any terrible chakra. So he wasn't very worried. In the forests, five masked people were chasing after a man. The man was injured. There were multiple cuts on his body. In addition, his left hand had a huge burn mark due to an explosion. One of the masked men shouted, Shigeki. Stop running and face consequences for your actions. Shigeki didn't say anything and continued running. His condition wasn't good. The masked men weren't angry. Instead, they looked at Shigeki with ridicule. They could have killed him long back. However, they were just having fun. Shigeki was aware of it. However, he continued running while praying, Please give me one chance. Please! As long as I survive, I'll return stronger than ever. I'll avenge my family and kill that bastard. Fortunately or unfortunately, the direction he was running in was where Fujin had landed. Fujin reached the location quickly and observed from a distance. None of the six ninjas since his arrival. Fujin analyzed, these five masked ninjas are from the special forces of Tanagakir. And is that Kasai Shigeki? Why are they chasing their own Jounin? Fujin had interacted with Shigeki a couple of times during his Umbu missions. He had a good impression of him. The man was decently strong for someone who wasn't from any major village and didn't have any strong bloodline. In addition, he was smart, loyal to his village and capable of leading large squads. Fujin followed them stealthily. Within a couple of minutes, he wondered, did he do something that irked the leaders of Tanagakir or the Land of River? The more he chased, the more sure Fujin became of his speculation. Especially after he observed Shigeki's facial expressions. A smile appeared on his face as he thought, this is a good opportunity. I was hoping to find someone who was capable and in a desperate situation. However, his smile faded away and was replaced with a frown as he thought, but this is too soon. I am not ready. I haven't finalized my plans or even have any concrete goals as of now. Chapter 280 the masked men continued chasing Shigeki while occasionally throwing shurikens and explosion tags at him. Fujin followed them patiently for 45 minutes. He had changed his attire and got himself a new mask. Finally, one of the masked men stopped laughing and said, he is reaching close to a cliff. He might try to jump off. Enough fun, let's kill him now. We still have to bring his dead body back. Otherwise, Kanji-sama might kill us as well. The other masked men got serious as well and said, Yes, Captain. Immediately their speed increased. Shigeki noticed the cliff as well. He immediately began running towards it while thinking, If they catch me, I'll die. I will try my luck by jumping off the cliff. If I survive, I will train and slaughter Kanji, his son, and his entire family. Unfortunately, one of the masked men appeared next to him. Shigeki's eyes widened. He immediately punched him. However, the masked man ducked and kicked his left leg which had a huge burn mark. Shigeki screamed in pain. He lost his balance and fell on his face and slid across the ground. 
The fall aggravated his existing injuries and inflicted fresh ones that began bleeding as well. Despite the pain, he gritted his teeth and got up. However, as soon as he did, he saw the five masked ninjas standing in front of him. The captain raised his kunai and said, Farewell Shigeki. He swung his kunai at Shigeki's neck. Tears rolled down Shigeki's cheeks as he shouted, Just give me one chance. The masked ninjas had a smirk on their faces. They had no mercy for Shigeki. Just when the kunai was about to cut his neck, the masked man's hand lost power. The kunai hit Shigeki's neck but caused no injury as it didn't have enough force to cut through. Meanwhile, Shigeki's eyes were wide open in shock. As if answering his prayers, the heads of all five masked ninjas were sent flying in an instant. In a second, their lifeless bodies collapsed to the ground. Suddenly, Shigeki felt a chill down his spine. He didn't dare move as he felt a sword resting on his neck. He felt that if he made any slight movement, his head would roll over just like others. He heard a cold voice asking, Give you a chance for what? He immediately said, One of the elders in Tanagakir killed my entire family. I want a chance to live so that I can get stronger and get justice for my wife and daughter. Fujin was puzzled. He asked, Why did he kill them? Shigeki was silent. Tears rolled down his cheeks. His voice lost all spirit as he said, His drunk son raped my daughter. He didn't know she was my daughter. In a rage, I beat him up and mutilated him to ensure that he can't do something so heinous to anyone else. I wanted to kill him as well, but I was stopped by my colleagues. That's when my tragedy began. Kanji couldn't retaliate at first as my colleagues backed me. Instead, he showed that he was upset with his son and scolded him. But in reality, he was plotting revenge. Slowly, Kanji made numerous allegations about me and spread ill rumors. When my reputation had fallen enough, his personal ninjas made a move against my family when I was out on a mission. They ambushed me as well due to which I couldn't fight back. He stopped talking and broke down. Fujin sighed secretly but kept his sword on his neck. He thought, no wonder he is in such bad shape. Though Fujin knew about Shigeki, he wasn't aware of his family. But he knew that Shigeki was just in his early thirties. He didn't need to think much to understand what his daughter might have gone through. He let Shigeki cry out for some time. Finally, Shigeki calmed down. He asked, Are you going to kill me? Fujin didn't answer. Shigeki begged, Could you please let me live for some time? I will get justice for my family and then kill myself. If not, could you please kill Kanji and his son after you kill me? Fujin didn't answer and asked, how will you kill your way into Tanagakir in your condition? Shigeki replied, I am not strong enough yet. I will train until I can get justice for my family. Fujin chuckled and said, Strong enough to kill your way into a hidden village? You are too old for having such silly dreams. But I have a proposition for you. I was looking for a capable man to recruit to help me run my organization. You might be suitable for that job. As long as you do a good job, I'll help you get your justice. Either by yourself if you get sufficiently strong enough or through my hands. What do you say? Shigeki was surprised. He was expecting to die like the masked ninjas. Instead, their killer was trying to recruit him. He asked, What organization do you want to create? Fujin asked, Does it matter as long as you get your justice? Shigeki went silent. However, after a couple of minutes, he shook his head and said, No. I won't join any organization that would make others suffer as I and my family did. Fujin withdrew his sword and replied, Oh, it won't be that sort of an organization. No need to be bothered about that. Shigeki thought for a bit more. Fujin didn't disturb him. Finally, he got up with much struggle and bowed to Fujin and said, Thank you for saving my life, Lord. I, Kasai Shigeki, am willing to work for your organization as long as you help me get justice for my family. Fujin nodded and extended his palm towards Shigeki. Chakra appeared on his palm and began healing Shigeki. Shigeki's eyes widened. He thought, I never thought that someone who could kill without a second thought would be a medical ninja. 
the wounds on Shigeki were all external wounds. Fujin healed all his wounds in a few minutes. He said, follow me. Fujin began running. Shigeki, who was now fully healed but low on chakra, followed Fujin. The two ran through forests for over a couple of hours and arrived at a cave. Shigeki was puzzled. The cave was quite small and there was no one there. Fujin entered the cave. This was the same cave where he had stopped while heading to the Land of Wind. He inscribed a few more seals and created a few hiding rooms in the cave. He said, Shigeki, I have inscribed numerous seals in this cave. Unless someone accidentally enters the cave, no one will detect you. Even if someone does, you can hide in the two rooms I created. You will stay safe there. Shigeki asked in a puzzled voice, Lord, are there any other members from the organization here? Fujin replied, You can call me Shirdin. No need for any honorifics. And no. Currently, only you will be stationed here. Though I have recruited a few others, they are in different locations in other countries. You don't need to concern yourself with them for now. Shigeki nodded and asked, All right, but what am I supposed to do? Fujin replied, Train of course. Don't you want to get justice? You are free to train however you want. My plans for you will need a few years to implement. So stay around this place. When I am ready, I will come here to look for you. Shigeki was surprised. He thought, a few years? He recalled his family and thought, it's fine. I am not strong enough yet. I don't know what Shiden's intentions are but he saved my life and gave me a safe environment to live in and train. Besides, he seems to be a leader of a huge organization. With such a big organization, getting revenge will be very easy. He bowed down and said, Thank you for saving my life and giving me a safe place, Shirdin. I will wait here for you. Fujin nodded and said, Good. I'll take my leave. Train hard and get stronger. Shigeki replied with determination, I will. Fujin nodded once again before turning and flickering away. Shigeki raised his head only to see that Fujin was nowhere to be seen. He thought, he is even faster than I imagined him to be. He left the cave and looked at the stars in the sky. His eyes became watery as he muttered, Wait a few years for me. I will fight for your justice and come to be with you. He wiped his tears and a determined expression appeared on his face. He wasted no time and began training. A few kilometers away, Fujin stopped moving. He quietly changed his clothes and for the first time in a couple of months changed back to his real appearance. However, he had a weird expression on his face and his cheeks had a hint of redness. He muttered, Since when did my ability to bullshit reach this level? Chapter 281 Fujin was shocked at how much he had lied to Shigeki. What other members of the organization? He was the only member. Heck! There wasn't any organization in the first place. The only place where it existed was Fujin's head. Fujin thought, I was so embarrassed by his questions and so embarrassed to say that he is the first member that I couldn't help but lie. This way, he will just think that I am opening a new branch and not that I am starting the organization. Luckily, Fujin was wearing a mask while talking with him. Otherwise, no transformation jutsu could have hidden how embarrassed he felt while answering those questions. Fortunately, he was shameless enough to maintain a straight voice. Fujin sighed and muttered, It doesn't feel good to fool a man who is in so much sorrow. Leave it, I'll help him get his revenge. That should be enough to clear whatever is still left of my conscience. Besides, the target is just an elder from a small village. I can assassinate him even now. Fujin began walking towards the land of fire while thinking, I haven't thought of any details when it comes to my organization. My original motivation for creating an organization was very simple. If something unexpected happens, especially if that something isn't aligned with what I remember from the original series, and I need a safe place to escape to, then the organization should be my second home. The situation after fighting Darui was a perfect example of where an organization could have helped me a lot. It would have provided me with a third alternative which would be much safer than the other two. 
In addition, the organization could help me collect information. It could also help in collecting rare materials like elemental crystals or perhaps even chakra metal. But this isn't enough. An organization needs to have a goal. If it is completely centered around me and my needs, then the organization wouldn't last long. It needs to have a goal to bind everyone together. And that goal also needs to complement my needs somehow. In addition, I also need to decide on the structure of the organization, the chain of command, how much authority people would have at each level of the organization, and so on. And most importantly, I need to have a method to control the people in my organization. A human's dream is never-ending. Even if I rescue someone and provide them with a good life, he or she would only be grateful for a certain period of time. After that, they will begin wanting more. It'll be fine if I am at the helm of the organization. I could consistently brainwash them to keep following me. Unfortunately, I can't monitor them actively as I will be in Kanoha. I'll need another method. Orochimaru controls his subordinates through the Cursed Seal. Danzo uses the Cursed Tongue Eradication Seal. As for Akatsuki, Pain is just too strong while Zetsu is the best scout. So no one will dare to oppose them. That said, despite their strength and skills, Orochimaru still betrayed them and Itachi stayed as an undercover agent. I doubt I could be a bigger deterrent than someone with Rinnegan so I will need to create a curse seal to put some restrictions on the members of my organization. Otherwise, I'm better off without an organization. And I can't copy a seal from the Kanoha library. There is no way Haruzen and Danzo wouldn't be able to negate every seal in there. Sigh, so much work. That is why I have been so reluctant to actually implement this idea. Fujin continued on his way as he muttered to himself, and this is just a basic problem. After all, I could resolve these issues by myself. The most critical issue is recruitment. Who should I recruit in the organization? I stay in Kanoha. So I can't just recruit little kids like Orochimaru did and train them personally. I need some Jounin level members to look after the organization while I am not there. It'd be best if that person is at elite Jounin level so that they can handle any unexpected events while I'm not there. Unfortunately, I don't know anyone like that who I could recruit. Almost all of them are loyal to their village or too volatile to be trusted. There might have been some suitable ones shown in Naruto. Unfortunately, I can't recall anyone. Apart from the important events and some resources, my memory from my previous life is just too vague. Sigh, I guess I will have to just wait for events like today. If Shigeki trains seriously, then perhaps he could reach the elite Jounin level. That'd probably be the best. Anyways, I'll leave this issue for the future. Regardless of whether I build a good organization or not, it won't be much use during the Fourth Great Ninja War. So I don't need to waste much time or effort on it until then. I can wait till I learn the Flying Thunder God and then begin considering this matter seriously. With teleportation, controlling an organization will become much easier. As he kept thinking deeply about this matter, Fujin entered the Land of Fire and reached Kanoha the next evening. He went directly to Hiruzen's office and knocked on the door. Hiruzen was about to wrap up his work and leave when he heard the knock. He said, Come in. Fujin entered. Hiruzen was surprised. He asked, You are back so early? Hiruzen thought, The news regarding the burning of the provision depot came just a few days ago. I expected him to create more chaos. Even if he didn't, the deserts would have been heavily monitored. How did he return so quickly? Fujin nodded and said, Yeah, the place got very messy. It'll probably be better to call Commander Shikaku here. I have a lot of critical information to report. Hiruzen got the hint and looked at the Umbu ninjas hidden in the room. They nodded and immediately left. Three stayed outside the room and kept watch while the last one went to call Shikaku. Hiruzen took a look at Fujin again and thought, now that I think about it, he had said that his summon could fly. I almost forgot about them. If he flew over, then it would make sense why he returned so quickly. Hiruzen asked, so, how was your trip? Fujin replied, not bad. 
I mostly stayed in Wind Capital. The city is much better looking than Fire Capital. Haruza nodded and said, Yeah. In terms of beauty, it ranks second after Lightning Capital. Do you want to visit it next? Fujin thought, This old fox. It hasn't even been five minutes since I entered the village and he already wants me out? Meanwhile, Haruzan also looked at Fujin meaningfully and thought, ever since he left, the consumption rate of the wind crystals dropped several times. Though there were quite a few umbu who left around that time, he is the most suspicious one. Fujin immediately shook his head and said, Such missions don't suit me, Grandpa. It's the first time since I joined the academy that I haven't trained for over two months. My body feels so out of tune and unresponsive. I'll stick to elimination missions. Hiruzen let out a chuckle and thought, if he is indeed the one who uses them so much, then it's no surprise that he has no will to leave the village. Hiruzen casually inquired about random stuff until Shikaku arrived and closed the door. Shikaku looked at Fujin and recalled the reports he received a few days ago. His expression became very peculiar. Hiruzen made a hand seal and activated the seals in the room. No one could eavesdrop on them anymore. He looked at Fujin and said, You can report now. Fujin nodded and became serious. He asked, Did Kakashi Senpai report the mission to eliminate the bounty hunters? Shikaku nodded and said, He did. Just report about your activities in the Land of Wind. Fujin nodded and began reporting, All right. I infiltrated the country and found a trading caravan. It was from the land of Bird and protected by four ninjas from a mercenary group called Kuragin no Sensen. I eliminated them and infiltrated the Wind Capital City using their disguises. Under that disguise, I eliminated ten nobles on the list of nobles that were very loyal to Sunagakir. All of them were eliminated using Wind Sword Jutsu. I also killed a few samurais and left a couple injured so that all suspicions will fall on Suna. I followed it up by killing family members of twelve other nobles who had good relations with Sunagakir a couple of weeks later. This was done while using the disguises of the Suna ninjas who came along with the elite Jown and Baki to investigate the previous killings. And I let the nobles see me and threaten them. Both these acts increased the resentment towards Suna among the nobles considerably though you'll have to check the degree of resentment with the use of other spies. Unfortunately, that forced the fourth Kazakage to come to the Wind Capital City. He had a long meeting with the Wind Daimyo. I am not sure what deal they reached. So I decided that it won't be a good idea to act once again as it might have destroyed the situation I created. Shikaku and Hiruza nodded. They were aware of these developments. Though they didn't know the exact information, they had guessed Fujin's actions quite accurately. Unfortunately, they didn't have much clue about other events apart from the incident about provision depots. Neither was prepared for what Fujin was about to report. That's the end of this tale for now. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in part 7.